Do I go? I think I go. All right, I'm gonna go. Hello, and welcome to the UT Library live stream. Um, it is reading day here at the University of Tennessee campus, and UTC librarians uh, from across the library are sharing some of our hobbies uh, in the hopes that students can engage in a little relaxation, maybe learn a little, eh, any sort of distraction to kill the worry of finals and to give yourself a mental break. So one of my hobbies is puzzling, um, particularly in time of COVID. Um, I was a puzzler as a kid. My mom was always a puzzler. Um, so we had a lot of puzzles slitting around the house. And then we kind of fell off puzzling for a long, long time where I can't remember if I bought a jigsaw puzzle for about 30 years, probably from like, I don't know, 20 to like 40. Um, and then we started going to the beach with friends and puzzling became the thing to do again. You can puzzle and eat, you can puzzle and drink, you can puzzle and talk. Puzzle is a great solo activity or a great combination activity. Um, so yeah, so I decided to spend my 30 minutes today puzzling. So the first thing I wanted to do is show you the puzzle that I'm doing. I'm just gonna move that little over there. That is a puzzle called, let me get that out of the way too. Um, it's a puzzle by Charlie Harper who was an artist who was born in, I just looked him up, 1922. Um, I love Charlie Harper's work. Uh, it's modern, very stylized. Um, and he can, his work has been converted into puzzles, uh, clothing, um, blankets. Uh, obviously he, he was, uh, as, as a part of his profession, he was an artist, he was a painter. He was also a stylist. Um, and he did a lot of his work around wildlife themes, stylized wildlife themes. So this particular puzzle um, is a real fun one because sometimes when you get a puzzle, you can actually um, find out a little history about it. So I jumped online today and the Charlie Harper Art Studio has this whole little piece on this puzzle. So I'm just gonna read it to you real quick. Um, Charlie Harper was born in 1922 and died in 2007. He lived a long time. So he'd almost be a hundred if he was still around. Um, designed with more than 50 posters for various natural areas, parks and conservation organization, each celebrating a special part of the natural world and unmistakably in a vibrant style Harper called minimal realism. Mont Verde is the name of this particular puzzle, um, promotes the beautiful Mount Verde cloud forest preserve in Costa Rica, home to an astonishing array of flora and fauna, including the sacred Quetzal depicted in the center of the puzzle, the big green bird there. Um, green and red bird, um, and the world's largest number of orchids, believe it or not, uh, out in Costa Rica. Some 90 migratory bird species stop there. Um, Harper developed his unique style while a student at the Art Academy of Cincinnati, and uh, his distinctive use of simple geometric patterns, shapes, and vibrant colors succinctly capture each of the characters he portrayed. Thoughtfully conceived and engagingly intricate, this thousand piece puzzle combines superb color, stunning unusual images and sturdy construction. Um, and then you can actually dive download, which is also super cool. And, and honestly for puzzles a little much, you rarely find this level of detail. Um, I found this key to this puzzle. Um, so literally if you're into it, you can match um, animals on the puzzle. So for example, there's a number 19, that is a Coty mammal. Um, there's bats in here, there's insects. So they identify 50 different features of this puzzle in terms of flora, fauna, and birds. So again, a fun one. If you're looking for a gift somebody, I highly recommend this puzzle. I've honestly done it before um, and I'm actually cheating a little bit with here today uh, because it's a thousand piece puzzle so I could never get through it, but it is one of my favorites. So just wanted to share all that goodness. Um, and then we're gonna start to some puzzling. So. When I puzzle, I think most people honestly start their puzzles with the edges of any puzzle. Um, so you got a thousand pieces, you know, here's all the pieces left in this box. There's thousands. So I've probably pulled out maybe a hundred pieces so far and I'm just gonna work on the edge of this puzzle today because um, I'm hoping I can accomplish that much. Uh, so first thing I do generally is you just sort through your box of puzzles. Um, Puzzles take up a lot of space. I will say that was one thing about puzzling. Um, it does require some space. Um, it also, um, in the age of COVID, honestly, puzzling has become like a land of accessories. You can buy puzzle sorters. As you see, I've sorted my puzzles into these little plastic cups. There's actually things you can buy like puzzle trays. 
um, puzzle mats that if you're working on a puzzle and it's your only dining space, you can roll up your puzzle and actually eat there. Um, I will say, embarrassingly enough, for Christmas this year, I did get a puzzle mat, which I have used twice um, when we had visitors and I needed more space. So something to think on. So generally, you start your sort with the outline. Um, and the way I do it is generally each puzzle um, usually has four sides. Um, and I looked up the Wikipedia definition. A jigsaw puzzle is a tiling puzzle that requires the assembly of often oddly shaped interlocking and mosaic pieces. Typically, each individual piece has a portion of the picture. When assembled, they produce the complete picture. So jigsaw puzzles um, do vary by company when you buy them. Some jigsaw puzzles only have um, maybe four different geometric shapes where you'll have your, um, this one, for example, has no pointy shapes. Um, as you can see, it's a flat puzzle piece. It's got three interlocking, but all the innards um, have to be locked into it. So I generally try and sort by that style. So I'll put pieces that have all ends together. Um, I'll put pieces that have one end together. Um, and that way, when you're putting your puzzle together, you can begin to um, easily do some trial and error by putting pieces like that. So again, a uh, simple technique, just try one piece after another in that square until you get the right fit. Um, and then you just kind of go from there. So what we've got here are the puzzle pieces set up. And as you can see, there's blue pieces, there's green pieces, um, some pieces have stripes. Um, and then each of these pieces have distinctive uh, shapes. So what I'm gonna do is just try and put together the border um, through trial and error. Um, and again, I've kind of pre-sorted. So I know that these pieces all do fit together in some capacity. And usually you wouldn't know that when you're puzzling, obviously. Um, but what I did was uh, do a little pre-sort here so we could get at least one side completed. And then um, once you get a few going, you just keep going. Um, so I'm gonna try and work in this direction. And, and again, this puzzle is particularly fun, I think, because it's got so much variety. Um, puzzles can be sorted by color. Puzzles can be sorted by shape, design. So as you can see in this puzzle, um, there's not a lot of white space in there. This bird's got a white tail there. This bird's got white, white, white. So um, once I do the edges, I then go into color sorting. Um, but first we must work on the edges. So we are gonna continue to just ramble at you and try and put our puzzle pieces together um, until we can actually get a side. So we are just moving along here, puzzle, puzzle, puzzle. Um, I thought I'd read you a little bit about puzzle in terms of the history of puzzling while I'm actually doing the puzzling. Uh, just to try and figure out when did puzzling start? Why did puzzling start? Who was the founder of puzzling? So beginning in the 18th century, that's when puzzles started. So 18th century, 1700s, which always really confused me as a kid too. I'm like, why do they call it the 18th century when it's really talking about the 1700s? I don't know, that's just history, um, but it is the way the world works. So I have eventually learned as history major that um, when you're talking 18th century, the numbers are actually in the 17th century. Um, so puzzles were created uh, by painting a picture on a flat rectangular piece of wood and then cutting that piece of wood into small pieces, if you can imagine. Um, so somebody really wanted to do some puzzling, I would think, um, or was kind of bored. So let's see, despite the name, a jigsaw was never used, which is also kind of interesting. Um, John Silsbury, a London cartographer and engraver is credited with commercializing puzzles around 1760. So first puzzles around 1760. Um, and kind of makes sense that a cartographer would be the one to create a puzzle since they were already dealing with large, um, large pictures of the world and geography. Uh, so John Silsbury. So typically, and again, something else to think about, puzzles are uh, great for hobbies. Um, they can include images of just about anything under the sun, buildings, nature. I mean, I must have five puzzles at home that are dealing with dogs right now um, and cats. Um, for Christmas, I gave away 10 puzzles to varying friends and family members. Perhaps I'm a little too obsessed with puzzling, um, but they were all very fun like this one. Um, so this is kind of an arty puzzle where basically it was a piece of art and it was converted into a puzzle. 
others. Um, I found this great company in Brooklyn, New York, that's a bunch of women artists. Um, and then they give some of the money to charity um, and they do really vibrant modern puzzles. So those were the puzzles I got everybody for Christmas. Um, but the nice thing about puzzling is you literally can find a puzzle in just about any, any what is the right word, subject matter that you'd be interested in. So again, um, I kind of like art, I like, uh, Ooh, now I'm trying to figure out these pieces, put them together in terms of um, we got a few to see if we can connect this into a side or a top. But any kind of pictures can be used. So historically, this dude who was the cartographer basically um, created a map, as I understand it, of the world. And when he was called upon to give a lecture and or teach and see, I'm missing some pieces here, which is why this is not working. But let's see if we can get a few more together. Nope, there's one. So we've got almost almost a side together. I'm um, clearly missing a piece here because I don't have anything green with an edge coming out. Um, that doesn't belong there. So clearly here's the piece I'm missing, should go right there. Let's see if this one does not go there. Does this one go there? Yep, that one does go there. And then we just gotta figure out where this goes. And I don't really see a good spot for it. Maybe down here. Oh, there it is. All right, so we have put together our first side of the puzzle. Um, and if you're looking at the side of the puzzle, you're gonna see that what we have just put together is da, 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 this top bar. Um, so again, we're missing a few pieces here, one here, some green in the middle, and we're missing our two primary edges, but we're gonna jump into our next side, which is the left side of the puzzle. Um, and as you can see, this left side of the puzzle is literally just green. Um, so actually, maybe I wanna do the bottom side of the puzzle first, since this is the top of the puzzle, I'm gonna twist it this way. Um, and now I'm gonna try and put together the bottom piece of the puzzle. So I'm gonna dump them out, do my usual, turn them over so all the colors are first visible to me. And again, this is a puzzle with a lot of different colors, which actually makes it hard and easy at the same time. So first thing I'm gonna do is put my purples together. Um, and then I'm gonna put my purples together by shape. So purples with no pointy edges, purples with two. And then you'll see here, for example, pointy edge going to the left, two pointy edges going left, oop, wrong camera going left and right. Um, so purple all together over here on the left side, more purple, more purple, and then really distinctive little brown piece here. I keep putting them away from the camera. Um, and that's what that is right down there, that little beige piece. I wish it was a little bigger. Um, put that there. And then I've got another little brown edge here to match. Uh, I'm gonna put my red pieces together because primarily we got red and purple here and a couple of uh, dark browns. So we will quickly put these together. <sighs> so hard to believe we made it to final exams um, and survived the whole semester. Those two don't go together either. Interesting, I seem to be missing green today across the board, um, but we're just gonna keep moving. Um, we'll read some more about the history of jigsaw puzzles while we put this together. So London engraver and cartographer John Silsbury, uh, believed to have produced the first jigsaw puzzle in 1760 when using a marquetry straw, not a jigsaw. Um, early puzzles known as dissections, interesting, were produced commonly by maps, um, by mounting maps on sheets of hardwood, cutting along boundaries, and used to teach geography. So isn't that fascinating? Puzzles served an actual practical purpose when they were created. And I am reading from Wikipedia, not the best source um, as a librarian, but hey, it's always a good place to start. Um, and had I more time, I was going to run to the reference collections and see to see if I could find um, if we had any history of games or anything. So I don't know, the history of things always is kind of fun to study in my mind. Um, so we'll just keep reading. The name jigsaw came to be associated with puzzles around 1880 when fret saws became the tool of choice for cutting puzzle shapes. Uh, fret saws are distinctive from jigsaws. Um, so again, we're not really sure. Um, at least I've never read anything very specifically. And now I'm putting together the purple pieces here on the edge, which you can't quite see. Maybe if I tilt my camera a little bit more. Oop, there we go. A little afraid to knock my camera off too. Um, then it says here around the 1800s, they started replacing hardwood with cardboard. So modern puzzles, primarily cardwood, um, cardboard, um, 
they can fray a little. Um, so I could see why hardwood would be interesting. And I have done actual wooden puzzles, um, maybe two or three in my lifetime, uh, where it's truly an old school puzzle made of wood. They're actually quite beautiful. My sister-in-law has a couple. She really likes wood puzzles. Um, but primarily when you're buying a jigsaw puzzle, I would say you could pay anywhere from, eh, I think, and it's fine make a lot of mistakes in terms of paying more than you'd expect for a puzzle. So always shop around in terms of, like I said, I found this great puzzle making company in Brooklyn, New York, where um, it's a group of women. They do really fun themes. Um, it's a not for profit. Um, and then they donate some of the proceeds for each puzzle. So I wound up buying a puzzle on Amazon and then I found it on their site for like $10 less. So keep that in mind, uh, shop for your puzzles. I mean, if you find one and you just got to have it and you love it, completely understandable. Um, but I have found that puzzle prices are quite variable. Uh, so, so always good to shop around and again, to shop for different themes if you like them. Um, I was reading that puzzles have really, again, exploded in the age of COVID. I think with all of us staying at home so much um, and, and trying to just think of different things to do and entertain ourselves while at home, um, puzzles are a really kind of interesting way. Um, I find puzzling kind of when I'm not talking, um, definitely helps kind of sort my head in terms of I can puzzle for like 30 minutes and walk away and whatever will I have been thinking about before is just completely gone. Um, I obviously am capable of immersing myself in puzzles. I don't know if everyone has that ability, um, but I have found it to be a lovely distraction during the time of COVID. So I'm currently working on, we see our top piece up here. This is the bottom border of the puzzle. And again, I think I might be missing a piece or two. I was sorting my puzzle today during the chancellor with the coffee meeting. Um, and I might've missed a piece or two, but most of them seem to be working actually. Um, this green one doesn't wanna go there. And this one, oh, this one does go there. Okay, so we're pretty close. Um, it looks like we've got most of the bottom, um, unlike the top here where we're missing that one critical piece. We do have uh, puzzles. And as you can see, we've got green on the edges and that's gonna be the green on the side. Ooh, let me tilt that up a little bit. There we go. That's gonna be the green on the side of this border here that we're gonna work on next. So that's where in particular, um, with puzzling, the, the whole like sorting concept really is important where, um, if you weren't sorting by style of piece and color of piece, I can't imagine how long it would take you, like forever to put a jigsaw puzzle if you were literally just kind of randomly picking up pieces and putting them there. So puzzles take a lot of strategy. Um, they take some forethought and, and honestly, every puzzle is a little bit different. So you wanna kind of think about them differently. Um, oh, see, there's a random piece that I accidentally sorted into my ends that wasn't really an end at all. Um, so at this point, you know, again, did a little pre-sorting for everybody. So I know these are all green border pieces. And next thing I'm going to do is line them up by shape so that all the pieces that don't have any edges pointing out are together. And then all the pieces that do have edges pointing out are together and they're together with their buddies. So all the pieces that are, um, you know, this piece has no pointy edges. It's just a flat puzzle piece. Um, oh, there it is. You can see it. Um, I'm going to put that dude with all the other flat puzzle pieces. This dude has one piece that points to the left. So he is my first person in my left pointing column. And then this piece of puzzle, oh, this puzzle piece has a piece pointing to the right. Oop, why do I keep going the wrong direction? It's like the opposite of cameras. Um, so that's going to be my first puzzle piece in that line. So that is the first sort I do right now is you missed me do the pre-sort, which was by color. Now I'm doing sort by piece style. This guy here, um, I don't know why I've heard of this guy's dudes, they, she, I should refer to anything really. Um, this one's got three pointy edges. So that'll be a new column there. Um, this one's got no edges. So again, we are now sorting by like pieces of color and style. This particular puzzle brand um, makes about eight distinct different puzzle sheets, uh, sizes. I mean, with you can have a puzzle with uh, no edges. You can have a puzzle with one edge to the left. You can have a puzzle with one edge to the right. You can have a puzzle with one edge coming out the top. Then you can have a puzzle with two. So this piece here is by first, which is two going to the left. So we put the two going to the left next to the one going to the left um, and then just keep sorting. So somebody told me after my last webcast that I'm a very analytical puzzler, which I could believe. Um, 
like I said, to me, it just seems natural. This one's got two pointy edges coming out. So that's a brand new column again. As you can see, I'm kind of sorting into columns here. No edges here. Top edge here, which isn't really relevant to the border, but will come in handy elsewhere when we're doing our puzzling. Um, and then one piece to the left, two piece to the left, one piece to the right, and two piece to the right two piece coming out of the middle. And then the last one is the three piece puzzle guy. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different style of puzzle pieces. Some puzzles only give you four, um, which can be a little limiting. I will say after, um, you don't always know that when you're buying your puzzle. I will say when you're shopping online, most of your puzzles will show you a close up, a really big picture of, of the pieces. So you can kind of get a sense of whether it's a small piece puzzle, a big piece puzzle. Um, your average thousand piece puzzle usually takes, I've read anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, depending on how committed um, and your kind of puzzling style. Um, but they make puzzles for, as we know, little ones that literally have 10 pieces. And then they make puzzles that have um, like these thousands of pieces. I actually was reading, let me find the number, it's something absurd. The largest, biggest puzzle in the world was made in China. Um, let's see, this one says, for adults, three, five, and 750 are very common. Um, they're kind of considered small. And then for Adults that want a little bit more challenge, they go from 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,000, all the way up to 40,000 pieces, um, which is honestly mind boggling. And you'd probably need your own room to do a 40,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. Um, I have only ever done the biggest jigsaw puzzle I have done is 1,000 pieces. Um, I've been gifted a jigsaw puzzle with 2,000 pieces, but I haven't done it yet. It is sitting at home. Uh, in my puzzle cabinets because uh, it scares the heck out of me. It is a picture of a taxi cab. Um, so it's all yellow and then it's in the middle of New York with a bunch of buildings. So it's literally like, oh my gosh, I can't do this puzzle yet. It's going to take me days. I figure maybe next time I take a week off work and try that puzzle. Um, largest jigsaw puzzle. The world's largest jigsaw puzzle, puzzle measured 58,000 square feet with 21,600 pieces. Um, that is a Guinness Book of World Records. It was assembled in November 2002 by 770 people at an airport in Hong Kong. So how was that for fascinating? Um, but I guess people do a lot of interesting things for the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, the, the, that was the largest. The jigsaw with the most number of pieces uh, is 551,232 pieces. Again, craziness. It was assembled in 2011 in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam by students at the University of Economics in Ho Chi Minh City. It is according to Guinness, the largest jigsaw puzzle per pieces versus size. So the first one, which was the 58,000 square feet. Okay, just for folks who know the UTC library, the entirety of the UTC library is about 180,000 square feet by floor. So think about 55, 58,000 square feet for a jigsaw puzzle. And literally it would take up probably more than one entire floor of our building, which is just kind of nuts. And then we've got this one, which is the number of pieces, which again is just mind boggling. 551,000 pieces. I mean, I can't even imagine the sort and how long it would take to do that. Puzzle references. Uh, this is a fun one. Uh, the central antagonist in the movie Saw uh, was named Jigsaw. Um, one of the Rolling Stones most popular song was Jigsaw. Um, Laurel and Hardy in 1933 made a movie where they attempt to complete a large jigsaw. That one's kind of dull. Um, and then Lost in Translation is not only a poem about a child putting together a jigsaw, um, it's also a movie and an interpretive puzzle. So how's that for interesting? Uh, and I'm going to stop reading now for a minute. I'll go back to actually putting my pieces together. I think I'm running out of time and I was hoping to get the sides done, but now I'm talking too much. So back to sorting. So middle sort, left sort one. Oh, here's a special piece. It's the end. We all love our end pieces. So we're going to try and see if we can slip that in somewhere. And that one goes right there. Very exciting. Um, one to the left three up and down. It's almost like playing poker, I think. You could really do a lot with puzzle pieces if you got in a pinch. 
um, and you lost your deck of cards, I think you could probably figure out a way to play cards with puzzles. That one is two to the left. So we're going to put that one there. This one's got one up just the center. This is two to the left, three up the middle, two to the left, three up the center, two to the left, two to the right over here, and then two more to the right. So now what I like to do is literally take one end piece and I'm just gonna to start to fit all the pieces that have a left end into this piece and see if I can put them together. So this is where, depending on your personality, rubber hits the road with puzzling. Look at how quickly that, just put that one right together, second try, always a happy event, a rare event, but a happy event. And then we do it again. So now we take the next piece. And again, we are still looking for a piece that has a pointy piece to the right. So we sort through these pieces and over to these um, because puzzles can only be made in a certain direction, though I will say, you can buy puzzles that can be put together in multiple ways, which to me is kind of frightening. Um, the whole point of the puzzle in my mind is it's kind of like, there's only one way to work a puzzle, but now they make puzzles, as I noted, that you can literally put together in numerous different ways. Um, Heinz 57, the ketchup company, just came out with this really mean puzzle that is entirely red. The entire puzzle is red. Like, all you've got to work with is the shapes of the pieces when you're dealing with a puzzle that is just one color. Um, I can't imagine how hard that would be. I looked at it and I thought, you know, I'm not sure I'd enjoy that. So, I mean, I think that's also something we need to keep in mind is usually um, these are hobbies, these are relaxation. So it is something that you want to enjoy. Um, I like to sit and watch, put a puzzle together kind of while I'm watching hash slash listening to soccer games on Saturday morning. Um, we watch a lot of Premier League in the house um, and frequently, you know, soccer games start at 7.30 or 8 and boom, you just, the TV's not too far from there. So I'll generally just hunker down at the dining room table, start my sort, or I'll bring my sort box over to the TV room where, again, if you've got puzzle trays or even bowls, cups, buckets, whatever you need to do your sorting, um, sorting I find to be a somewhat mindless activity in the sense that, uh, yeah, you're just sorting. Not a lot to do while you're sorting. Um, you're mostly just doing these pre-sorts to get the colors together, to get the shapes together. So there's not a lot of ta tactical stuff involved. I think that's the right word. Um, so I've now put these five pieces together and I've got a pointy piece to the left. So I need an empty piece to the right. So I'm back to my columns over here. Trial and error is much of the way of puzzling. So um, if you're someone who likes to play with trial and error, puzzles could be your thing. Um, you can get puzzles and images you like. Um, I like to, words, to have puzzles with words sometimes. This puzzle doesn't have a lot of words. Um, actually, it has no words. So words can be another good starting place for a puzzle. Um, I will frequently find myself, first I'll do the border of a puzzle, and then if it's got words, I instantly just go for the letters because they're generally making words and words we know what they spell so therefore they're kind of easier to put together at times um this puzzle is is got its own strengths and weaknesses um i think the fact that it has these borders makes the borders tough because their left and right border are identical um but it also means it's an easy sort and it's a it's a fun, uh, quick way to get started. Um, when you can get the borders together, you get this great sense of satisfaction. And then the rest of the puzzle pieces, you've got starting clues as to where um, they might belong. And I'm feeling like I might have missed another piece because no, I am about to try. Oh, nope, there it is. All right, so we've got another edge here, which is exciting. You can't quite see that. Oh, move it this way. There we go. So this is another edge. So now I'm going to start working this one, which means I need puzzle pieces with pointiness to the left. So puzzle to the left, to the left. I think there's a song that starts that way, to the left, some sort of dance song that I'm not very good at. So I'll just stop singing that because we don't know the other words. Um, what else can I tell you about puzzling? Uh, da, 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 da. Puzzles, interesting. Um, again, during COVID, puzzles have been very popular. Uh, while we're all hanging at home, I don't know if you got a little space or you got um, a floor even. I've done lots of puzzles on the floor. Uh, for folks, and that's always been fun. Um, do, do, do. I'm missing a piece here. Let's keep trying. Um, the next thing I'll do is try and connect this border to the top or bottom over there, um, but I can't do that till I get a little further along, and I am running out of time. Oh, and I am done. Yay! Thanks for tuning in. 
That was awesome, Teresa. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know why I do these things, but it was fun. I was going to say, I do love to puzzle. <laughs> you know, if it's working for you, then hey, that's the point of this. Puzzle. It's like, this is pretty cool. So, yeah. no. Yay. First one done. Hooray. Thanks. Absolutely. Are you next? I am next. So I'm going to bring in my sock knitting because as, as Teresa mentioned, we've all kind of gotten into our weird ho hobbies over, over um, the COVID situation. And I have been a knitter for a while because, um, you know, like Teresa mentioned with jigsaw puzzles, it's kind of meditative. And it's also repetitive, which is nice and kind of relaxes your brain. And it's nice to do something while watching TV. And then for, during, for Christmas, not as a Christmas gift, as a, I need stuff out of my house, things are going in the box. My mother sent me this book because she has decided she's not actually going to ever knit things. And so I was just like, well, yeah, I'll knit some socks. So, um, so it's kind of a new thing for me. This is the sock we're going to look at is actually my second sock ever. Um, and it's better than the first one. So at least there's that. Um, and I should note that I did not match the first sock. I decided I didn't want to do that sock anymore. So I have one purple sock on my floor that the cat is bothered by. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the document camera here. And you can see um, what I have here is most of a sock. Um, it's reds because on a whim, I went to um, one of my online yarn stores and it gives, you can buy these sets of knitting where you've got this gradiated um, gradient versions of this. So I got a red and a gray and there's about enough yarn to do two socks if you do, um, not two pairs, two socks. Um, so if you put it together, then you end up with a pair of socks. And so my other one is gray. Um, and you can see that I started off with what's called a ribbing. And um, this is where you do, um, so knitting, you've got two basic stitches, a knit and a purl. And so to do a ribbing, in this case, I did knit two, purl two. Um, and that gets kind of this stretchy situation. And the rest of it has been done in what's called stockinette, which means that you only knit, um, which is nice and easy and means that you don't have to remember a pattern, which my wonderful friend Aisha suggested that that's the best way to start knitting, even though I want to do complicated lace patterns that's not a good place to start. Um, and I've already gotten through the heel. Um, my favorite thing about learning how to knit the heel was like um, anybody who's read American Girl novels, the Molly story, she talks about how they all were knitting, knitting and they all had trouble turning the heel. And so I was all nervous about learning how to turn a heel. And it's literally, you just turn the fabric you're knitting over. Um, so to where I am right now, um, I'm about halfway through a stripe and there's two ways that you can do knitting, um, knitting in the round. You can either get what's called a circular needle, which has like an end and then like a, a plastic piece that kind of connects two together so that they're connected. Um, but I am, uh, my particular kind of nerd is I actually like um, what are called double pointed needles, which, you know, it's double pointed. It's pointed on both sides. Most knitting needles have a ball at one end so that when you're knitting, your knitting can't come off the end. But um, with double pointed needles, they're specifically trying to let you take it off at the end. Um, I could have, this, these are a size two, which is why they're so small because you want your stitches to be very small when you're doing socks. Um, Cause really big knitted socks are not comfortable on your feet. Um, Cause you can feel the bumps when you're walking around. Um, and I started using double pointed needles because I picked up a vintage glove pattern book and that's, and they were using double pointed needles because the circular needles are somewhat recent ish. I don't know. I don't know exactly when, but like back in the forties, when that book was, came from, um, it was all about double pointed needles. So I'm, I just like them. I like the sense of completion because it, instead of having one big row, you have four little rows. Um, so, but you know, your moves may vary. Um, the book that I mentioned totally talks about everything's on two circular needles. Um, so um, when you get started, you usually start with 64 stitches. Um, so what you can see is that I've, um, there's a lot of counting and knitting. Um, 64 divided by four is 16. So we've got three, four, eight, 12, 16 stitches on each needle. And that creates my little square. So, um, and you just go along and knit each one. 
Um, I like to kind of pull it tight because otherwise you get a little bit of laddering, but I think most of the laddering will go away when, when I do what's called blocking, which is when your piece is finished and you get it wet and you kind of stretch it out to make it the size that you want it to be. Um, so I'm just knitting, this is a knit. Uh, the difference between a knit and a purl is a purl, I would um, have my thread in front of the needle and be going this way, um, but I don't want to do that right now. Um, because knitting is really all about, you have these different stitches and you put them together and you get a pattern. Um, and I'm one of those people that like, I like to have variety in things, which is why I was grumpy about, I don't wanna do a sock with a stockinette stitch. And my first stock, sock was actually, it was knit four, purl four, and that ended up with kind of, it looked a little bit like a bumpy stripe or, or similar, a larger rib as to what's up here. Um, but I think I just didn't like the yarn. The yarn was a little bit rough, whereas this is a really soft yarn. I think it's part alpaca. Um, alpacas are very soft. Um, I don't, or no, it's, it might be a merino and a silk. I don't remember. That's the fun thing about yarn is you can get all kinds of different combinations. Um, and uh, they're on all different weights. So you can see that this is a very thin thread that I'm knitting along. And um, because you don't, you don't wanna, because I want this to be a tight knit because it's going on my feet and I want it to keep my toes warm. I don't want it to be, I don't want to have big holes. Whereas if I was doing this on larger needles, you would actually see, um, it would have to, it would um, have like holes in between each one because this, the stitch, which is created by the needle is so much bigger than the weight of the yarn. Um, so that, that's what I like about knitting is that it's really easy to get variety by just changing your tools or changing your materials, um, but you're still doing the same, um, movement, which is you put your needle through, loop it around the back and pull it through and that creates a stitch. So you just knit along. And um, The other reason that I'm doing a stripe, because like I said, I like to have things change, um, which is why I like patterns, um, is because after I get through about an inch, um, oops, Make sure you go through all of the threads. Um, I'm having a little trouble with this because the thread is so small and the needles are so small and my eyes are old. And I keep thinking I need to hold it up very close to my face and take off my nearsighted glasses. When in reality, um, as my eye doctor has pointed out, I need to hold it further away because I can actually see it better where I am right now. So, yeah. And I know where the beginning of a round is because I've got this little knot in here, um, but you can also use what are called stitch markers. Um, and if I were on a circular needle, I would need to use a stitch marker so that you know where the beginning is because um, that's where you change things. So we're gonna keep going for a little bit. Um, I did not bring my ruler because I'm doing lazy measuring, which is just like, how big is this compared to the stripe before it? Which is, and you can see that like, they've gotten a little bit bigger as we've gone along because this is um, not an inch, um, but I was measuring it to the part where I did the heel, which is a little bit bigger to get through the heel situation. Um, but I've measured it so that it's roughly seven inches um, on the top part, and then it needs to be another five inches um, along the foot. Um, and then I would start the toe which I may or may not get to today. I'm probably not going to because I don't knit that fast, but I'm hoping that I can get to the point where I change colors. Um, so you can see how I do that. Um, I'm, I'm particularly excited about these socks because I feel like I will be very fashionable when I get to wear them, even though nobody um, necessarily looks at your socks. Um, but one of my favorite things, I used to live in uh, South Korea and Taiwan for a while doing the English teacher thing. And I really grew to have a higher appreciation of socks in a country where you have to take off your shoes at the door, which also, oh no, 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 is um, the thing that I support. What did I do? So what I'm doing right now is trying to um, drop stitches. And so, 
So I was trying to add a stitch and drop a stitch and um, that's not a thing that you want to do. So drop a, dropping a stitch is where when you're um, going through knitting and instead of um, actually catching it, you miss it. So like I've, I've done a couple of things where I do like this and then I keep going to the next stitch and I have actually missed the stitch that I want to. And then you have to go and pick it up, which is um, can be easy, but it can also be difficult depending on if you've got enough slack in your string and um, how small your stitches are. So I, these are so small that whenever I drop a stitch, it just, it takes me like 20 minutes to fix it. And that's really worrying. Um, and um, when I started picking up knitting, my grandmother um, who used to knit when she was a teenager to the point where she, she and her friends knitted themselves a suit to wear to their high school graduation. Um, you know, if you're wondering what wild things got up to in the 20s um, or 30s. I'm bad at dates and I have trouble remembering when World War II started. She was born in the 20s. She got married during World War II um, to my grandfather. Um, but yeah, so the late 30s, early 40s, um, on their way to college, they decided to knit themselves graduation suits. Um, but she had a trick for picking up stitches, which was to use a dental tool, the thing that they um, scrape your teeth at the dentist, that little, that little picky thing. Um, and it's really works well because you can both kind of get in there to a narrow place, but it also has a hook. So once you've got a hold of it, it's not gonna just fall off again, um, which is the trick. Like you'll get it almost ready and almost in there and then um, you'll drop it again, or I will drop it again because I'm bad at picking up stitches. And so because I had that little moment there, I'm going to double check something right now because there should be 16 stitches on this. I'm just going to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven, twelve, 15, 16 stitches. I did not drop one because the other thing that I do that irritates me about myself is I will um, drop a stitch, but I won't notice for like three rows. And then I'm like, why are there only... 15 stitches here, that's not right, oh darn it. And then, um, cause it's it's not too hard to pick one up from the row below, but if you have to go down like three rows and pick it up, that can be difficult. And you do wanna pick it up as soon as you can because it'll just sit there unraveling all the way through your knitting if you're not careful. And that's, that can be heartbreaking cause then you have to take it out. And it's pretty easy to take out stitches. You just pull, you just pull the thread, but, um, it's sad. Um, uh, yeah, Sarah, Sarah just mentioned that she uses a teeny tiny crochet hook for tricky drop stitches. Crochet hooks also work. Basically, you need something that is a very small hook to grab the thread and help you push it through the loops. Because that's all knitting is, is it's, you're just putting loops through loops through loops um, in order to make the fabric. And you are actually making a fabric, which is something that I didn't really think about until lately, that you are making a fabric out of um, thread. So in, um, there's two kinds of fabrics. There's knitted and there's woven. Um, and woven is where you get it on the loom. And then knitting is where you put it through the loops. And um, the nice thing about knitted fabric is it has a little bit of stretch like your t-shirts do. Um, so it's really good for things that you want to fit close to the body, but still be able to move. Um, so like socks um, and um, t-shirts and sweaters. Um, it also has a little bit of um, breathability um, and you can still have things that are like tight fitted um, that are close to your body, but they don't necessarily need to move. Like, for example, um, I've been on corset Twitter a lot lately because I'm fascinated by it. Um, um, big fan of Hillary Davidson and her um, Bill and Ted test where she goes through Regency fashion, but like, if you're wearing a corset, the point of a corset is to shape your body. So you don't actually want it to bend as much. So those are usually made out of a woven fabric um, and, uh, because it's supposed to restrict your movement rather than encourage it. What did I do here? I didn't do anything. I thought I did something, but I didn't. 
I just put something on backwards. Um, there's a lot of stuff with knitting about like the direction that the loop is facing. Um, Cause that if you're narrowing things down, depending on what direction the loop is facing, you can, you shape it in weird, in better ways. So when you start to get into stuff like sleeves and collars or um, toes, which I'm hoping to get to in the next week or so, um, then you'll, you need to start doing stuff like, um, there's all these abbreviations that you find in the book. And the nice thing is one of my favorite things about um, knitting and the internet is that if you come across a really weird abbreviation, the abbreviations haven't changed and people don't make up their own abbreviations. So if you see that it says SSK, you can actually just Google SSK knitting and you'll be able to come up with a nice little YouTube video that will show you exactly what that means and um, that it's a kind of a decrease, which means that so right now I have 16 stitches on each row. And when I'm de decreasing, you'll have like one row where it's 16 and the next row it's 15 and the row after that it's 14, um, unless you're decreasing from both sides. Um, but YouTube, YouTube and um, Twitter, knitting Twitter or knitting, knitting internet just in general is really useful, which is how, like I said, I was really worried about needing to learn how to turn a heel. And that's how I got on the internet. And it was just literally like, so if I was working on the heel right now, you've knitted this far and then you turn it and you go the other direction. You literally just turn it. Um, I will have to say that when we got, when I got to the turning part, that was where the double pointed needles came in particularly handy um, because they, they just kind of, um, it gave me my own like separate little pair of needles for working on that one little part so that the other needles could just hold the other sides. Um, but it always amazes me the way that these, um, that just by manipulating stitches, you can get something completely different um, and shape it in a new way. That's, um, that's what I like about knitting is that it's like, ooh, let's try that. Then. So now I've completed one row. I'm working on the second row um, of this particular live stream. It might be the third row. I'm not really sure. But at the end of this row, I'm going to change colors. Um, and you can see here I've got as a tool um, a knitting bowl that my sister gave me for Christmas. And what this does is it helps the balls of yarn not go running around the um, floor which adds a um, level of difficulty because one, you have to go chase things down, but you can't just pull on the thread to bring it to you because that just unwinds your ball. Um, also, and I know Sarah empathizes with this, um, if you have a cat, um, balls of yarn going skittering across the floor, um, they don't wanna give that back. And if you're my cat, you want to eat it. Um, she likes to eat thread. And no matter how many times I explain to her that that is a very expensive surgery, she doesn't want to stop. Um, the previous cat, um, whose name was Mercedes, um, had been, she was a cat that I adopted after her owner became too old to take care of her. So when I got her, she was probably about seven or eight ish. No idea actually, because um, no one was doing math on the cat. Um, but there had been apparently some intensive training with water bottles um, when the cat was a kitten because her previous owner was also a knit knitter. And it was really funny because um, she would sit next to me on the couch or on the, um, or on the floor or she'd sit on my lap while I was knitting and she would watch me really intently. Um, I'm sorry, Clementine is lazy. Um, but she would watch me really intently, but she wouldn't chase it or try and take it away from me. She would um, literally just like, you'd have the ball of yarn and the cat would just be like, yarn. And that's all she would do. She would just hold it because the rule was, if it's on the couch, you can touch it, but you can't have it. But if it's on the floor, all bets are off. And so I could leave knitting on the couch with just out and the cat wouldn't touch it, um, nothing would happen. Although every now and again, I would come home and like the ball of yarn would be wound around the couch legs and just all over everywhere. And the cat would be like, I don't know. I just walked by and bumped the couch a little bit and it fell to the floor. Oops. Um, 
so I'm going to change, I'm going to cut this off so that I can change colors. And so I need, this is the color I was using. So I need to figure out which one is next in the gradient, um, which is this one. So I'm going to put these other balls back in the ball. Everything. And um, it's got like a little loop so I can pull it through the loop and it helps it not get tangled. And um, fancy knitters don't tie knots, but I am not good at this. So I'm going to tie a small knot to kind of hold it. And it'll be a little loose at first, but then it'll tighten up um, when I uh, weave in my ends later. Um, and weaving in ends is exactly what it sounds like where you go in and you weave in the ends. And so you can see in here, like I've got a little bit of focus a little bit better. Um, I've got kind of where there's an overlay and that's where I've woven in the ends. Um, but then I got lazy and decided I'd finish them all at the end because this end is definitely not woven in. Um, so, but then once you kind of started with your other yarn, you just need to pick it up and you just start knitting with that instead. And I like to kind of hide my ends in here so that I don't accidentally start knitting with those because that would be, that would defeat the purpose and I would run out of yarn before I ran out of stripe. Um, and that's always sad when you pick up the wrong color yarn and um, have to take out a bunch of stitches because I am more likely to drop stitches when I have to take them out. But you just pick it up and go, and go, and go. There we go. And now we are knitting. Um, and it kind of takes a full round or so to really kind of see the effect. But I am knitting with another color and you're just putting it in. And so that's how, like you can get yarn, that's what they call self-striping, which the way that it's been dyed, ah, it said the ball is to make things not tangled, but yet it is tangled. Um, um, and self-striping yarn is really cool because um, you don't have to change threads as you go. And it's, it's a process of the dyeing and it'll, make, it'll just make stripes as you go um, without you having to think about it. But, um, for this particular project, I got enamored by the ombre yarn that was on sale at Webs, um, also known as yarn.com, which is an independently owned yarn store in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, but they ended up with the best URL because they grabbed one really early. And they're super nice because I, ha I have a friend that's from Northampton and I went to visit her a couple years ago and she um, said, we should go to yarn.com because I see that you're, or we, you should go to Webs with me. And it's, it's not like you go to their website and you think, wow, this is a huge reseller. And then you go to their actual store and it's not. Um, we unfortunately do not have a yarn store in Chattanooga anymore. Um, Genuine Pearl was one of the um, victims of the pandemic. Um, Business-wise, to my knowledge, nobody got sick. Um, but there are some really nice yarn stores in Atlanta or Nashville. Um, and so if you just Google yarn store near me, you end up with these independent yarn stores. And those can be really fun to visit because they're very colorful. Um, so you can, there's all these yarns all over everywhere and they will let you touch them. Um, and yarn, as you know, is often very soft, um, especially if you get something like a Merino or um, my favorite yarn I think I ever did was like a silk and a alpaca. Um, but it wasn't very tightly woven like this. So it's kind of a pain to knit because it was really easy to get, um, instead of like going through the loop, you go through part of the loop and that's um, that's not what we're going for here. Um, but I made a really cute hat, um, which is unfortunately Syracuse colors, which is um, not a school I have ever attended. But I was working in upstate New York about an hour away from Syracuse. So everybody was just like, wow, it's Syracuse colors. Mm -hmm. Down here, nobody would ever say that. Please don't tell me if this red is a particular series of colors for a particular school because I don't really sports. So um, if it's not blue and gold, I'm not terribly picky about it. Something really happened. So as I go along, we're just knitting. Um, but I find it very relaxing. And the nice thing about a stockinette stitch is you don't have to think too hard. You have to think just hard enough to make sure that you're not dropping stitches. Um, so when you're watching TV, this is a really good relaxing thing. I also like that it goes in a circle. 
Um, so there's no ends and no flipping. And um, that's, that's a different sort of relaxation. Um, it's also really nice to do on an airplane because you can easily do it while listening to podcasts. Um, so we're back at the beginning. So you're gonna actually see how the color changes. Real quick. Um, there we go. But I shall promise to um, find some way to let you know if you're if you're interested in how it turns out with the toes. Drop me an email and I will send you a picture because I will finish it. I promise. Whether I will finish the pair is a different thing because, as I said, I was talking to my friend who's an avid sock knitter, and I was just like, "So the problem with socks is." you finish it and then you have to do another one. And she was just like, no, you don't. You don't have to do another one if you don't like it, do something else. Which is why I have one purple sock in my house that the cat thinks is a toy. Um, she thinks it's both a toy and an abomination. She will occasionally walk over to it and look at it and look at me and look at the sock and look at me and look at the sock and look at me and be like, do something about this sock. And I, won't because if you give in to cat's judgments where does that end before you know it they're you know kicking you out of chairs with one look and they will you should at least make them try to manipulate that When I pick up this, it's my goal to try and do about an inch a day, and it depends on my attention span. Um, and sometimes my hands hurt. But now you can kind of see how it's starting to have a little bit of a stripe because we've got two rows in there. Um, but it really starts to show up after three. And it's like, yes, we are now on this color. And then I get excited about the next color. I know that Sarah's going to do some cross stitching later. And, that's my favorite thing about cross stitching is because I like to do one color at a time and do all of that color and then see how it plays with the next color. Um, and yes, I have, I always um, end up adding rules and games to weird um, meticulous tasks. I used to have rules about um, or makeup games while trying to fill in like the bubble blots on standardized tests, which is dangerous because then you have to fight with what you want your game to do and what the answer actually is. So much better that I stick to knitting where if I mess it up, nobody knows but me. Um, and last row before I finish this round. It's always good when you're knitting with double pointed needles to make sure that you finish the round. Um, um, because if you leave it in like this, um, one of them can get knocked out. And that's, um, that's sad, especially with stuff this fall, this tiny, because you have to go in and pick them all up. So it looks like I'm gonna finish this round right at about 30 minutes in. And that's an accident, but you know, hey, we'll take it. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six stitches. And there we go. And, so, and then when you finish and you're gonna put it away, you can tap them in so it's a little bit more difficult to take them out. And the other reason that I like double pointed needles and I'll leave you with that is because while you're making it, you end up with this fun sock monster. Um, with weird teeth, and I think it looks like something out of a Tim Burton movie. But there you go. There's our sock. And it's starting to look like something I could actually get on my feet. And there's definitely a hole, which is nice. So the next step is I'm going to do two more colors after this. And then whatever the next color is, I will do the toe. And then I will be able to wear them. And there we are at the end of my time. And I believe that Sarah's next. Yes. Cool. Am I there? 
Am I on? I think there's a slight delay. Okay. Because, okay. Yeah. I think, you know what? I think it might be the view. We're, we are on Zoom for the live screen and it might be my, the way I have my Zoom view set up. Yeah. But if Emily can see me. I can see you. Then I trust that it's working. Sometimes yeah. you just And now you're on the YouTube. I see it now. Yes. Yes, YouTube does have a little bit of a, of a delay. So just an FYI for folks watching on YouTube, it has a delay. But yeah, I'm going to come on now. And I so enjoyed watching uh, Emily knitting. I also knit. Um, and boy, do I hate making socks. <laughs> I've tried it and it takes a long time. Um, and... Yeah, I'm always impressed when people can do that, but I'm going to do something completely different. So, um, let's see, I just want to make sure I'm trying to figure out, let's see, is it frozen? I hope not. Um, frozen, you're not frozen. Okay. All right, cool. Let me see. All right, so I am going to do some cool unboxing stuff today. Um, oh gosh, it's so weird because I can see myself on multiple screens. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to power through and I'm going to do some unboxing. So I have recently uh, joined the world of fidget toys. Um, I only recently have started to get into fidget toys. I did have some fidget spinners, uh, in a previous life. I had a cat that liked to play with them. So it was always a very fun, um, you know, game where I would spin it. I'd spin the fidget spinner and then she would try to stop it and catch it. And that was really fun, but that was the only fidget toy I really ever had. I am though a fidgeter and I love pop sockets and I play with them all the time. Uh, and I noticed that lately I've been fidgeting with them so hard that I kept breaking them. So like the top of the fidget or the top of the pop socket would come off and I would like destroy the glue on it so that it just it didn't work. It didn't work. Um, and so I had to come up with some options because first of all, I was going through them. They're not cheap. They're like 10 to $15 a piece. Uh, and I'm very particular. It has to be the pop socket brand because of the way it pops in and out. Um, I find it particularly satisfying. Uh, so luckily I found a way to avoid breaking them, but I needed to figure out something else to pitch it with. So I've been playing around and I do have a favorite. It's this right here. It is, I think it's called a snowball. Um, I'm gonna see if the microphone will pick it up. Can you hear that? Oh, I love it. Uh, the stuff inside it, it's a little bit looser. It's not your average, like it's not a stress ball really. Um, it has what I'm assuming is cornstarch, but I really have no idea. And when you squeeze it, it sounds like you're walking on snow and it crunches. Ooh, I love it. It's so satisfying. Uh, but I want to find some other things. I especially do want something that helps me uh, get that same satisfying feeling of, you know, the, um, the pop socket and playing with that. And so I've gone to some local stores. I've gone out looking to see what I can find. And you know what? I really haven't found anything I like. So I have a haul today. We're going to do, I don't know what just fell. That's okay. We'll figure it out later. I have a haul that I got from the online shopping diet that will not be named, um, but you can tell from the packaging. And I got a lot of, I can't remember how many it is. Let's see if the package is in here. I haven't peeked. There's no uh, packing slip. 
which is weird, right? Don't don't things from this shopping uh, giant, this massive online retailer usually come with a packing slip? I don't know, but that's okay. So I have a plastic bag and it has, let's see, does it tell us? It does not say how many things are in here, but it's about 30, I think. And we're gonna play with them. So as I said, the world of fidget toys is pretty new to me. I'm still figuring out what I like. But let's take a look. Some of the other things I have, like I said, I have this snowball. Ooh, I love it. I have one of these things that you pop the little bubbles through because I thought that it would be sort of a satisfying popping thing. And it's okay. It's not my favorite. I have, let me think, what else do I have? Um, oh, I have a Rubik's Cube that I do enjoy. Um, I do not try to solve it. I literally just play around with it. And the one that I have, I did realize, um, I think maybe last week that the end, you can twist the corner pieces individually. Um, so that's my new fidget thing where I just spin the corner pieces around. And now I'm worried that if I do decide to solve this Rubik's cube, I will not be able to because I ruined the, the pieces. Um, anyways, all right, so the first thing we have in here, oh, there are some fidget spinners. These are a little bit small, but I am gonna maybe see if my uh, cat, who is a different cat than the one that liked to play with the fidget spinners, um, if she might be interested. There's two of them so far. I have a red and a green one. Let's see. Ooh, some little mochi toys. I do love these. I have had these before. Um, they're fun to poke. <laughs> they get dirty though. I've heard that you can, I think, just wash them with soap and water, but then to get the sort of mochi feeling back, you're supposed to put um, cornstarch on it. So this one's really cute. It's a little cloud. Oh, look at me doing the, the beauty guru thing um, with my hand behind it, but it's cute. It's already getting a little bit dirty. That's one of the things that I don't love about these little mochi um, things, uh, I can't remember what they're called, um, but like if they're painted the way this one is, and the paint is what makes it so cute, but the paint starts to chip off. So I wonder if maybe using like a fabric paint, I don't know what kind of paint is used during the manufacturing process, but I also do a lot of crafts. And so one thing, if you ever are painting fabric or something else that moves the way fabric moves, um, using some fabric paint rather than just regular acrylic paint can be helpful. And then there are also uh, like mm, sort of, uh, I don't wanna say additives cause it's not really an additive, but there's these other products that you can mix into your paint that will make it work better for different, um, different types of materials. So I might look into that if I really wanted to keep this, but you can see even just in the, what minute or two I've been playing with it, uh, when I stretch it, the smile is already cracking. No, little cloud. Don't ever let anybody crack your smile. Um, it is really cute. Ooh, there is a teeny weeny Rubik's Cube in it. Like I said, the Rubik's Cube I've ha I have, I just like to spin it. This one uh, is a tight, a tight twist. But there you go. I'm gonna twist it back just the way it was. <laughs> And then I'm going to tell everybody that I solved the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> is that cheating? I did just solve it again. See, look, it's all solved. Um, I don't know if this is something that's going to particularly satisfy me. Oh, it is getting a little bit looser as I play with it. Um, but, you know, I love the, the, I love just the other one I have, you just sort of spin it. Um, and I like that a lot. It's just kind of a, I lay on my couch and I watch trashy reality TV and I spin the the rows on my Rubik's Cube. This one's fun. I do like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, we have some, I, I'm going to call these snakes. I don't know, but they're actually called just stretchy snakes. Um, if you've ever, I know that the Writing and Communication Center here at the library, uh, they have things like this. They're a little bit, I think, thicker. They don't really 
stretch quite as much as, as this if you've ever been there in person. I know they've been online only um, for the last year or so, you know, since COVID times, but they do have some sort of similar to this. This is okay. It's it's kind of fun. It's a good, I also have some like, uh, I think it's called thinking putty that I've, I've played with. Um, and, <laughs> and Rachel <laughs> will solve my cube. I might ask you to actually, Rachel, don't, don't tempt me. And then I'm going to tell everybody that I solved it. They'll know it's a lie. They'll know. Um, anyways, these are, these are kind of fun. It's a little bit less sticky than like slime or putty, which I like. Uh, I enjoy the feeling of playing with slime or thinking putty, but I don't like it when my hands feel sticky um, or anything like that. So that is, that's always the thing I have to sort of figure out. Let's see. Ooh, okay. So this is why I actually bought this whole pack of fidget toys um, online. I had been trying to just buy my toys locally, but I really wanted one of these little popping key things. Oh, here, this way you can see the little face. So you pop it out and there's a little P. There's a couple of them in there, some little peas in the pod. It's only the big one has a face. And I could not find any of these locally at any kind of store in the Chattanooga area. And it's what I really wanted. So first of all, I did want to try out some other things, uh, but I really wanted one of these. They are just very cute. And I thought that they would maybe help with my sort of needing a, a more satisfying kind of pop that I, that I cause, I guess. And I am liking it. It's a little bit, it's not as um, squishy as I thought it would be, but it is, it is kind of satisfying. This one's a win for me. All right, let's see what else. I have no clue what this is. It is like a birdie from badminton, but with a face on it and hands. And I don't know what you're supposed to do. I wonder if you, let's see. All right, I'm gonna see if I can move my camera. Bear with me here. I'm gonna actually, I'm not gonna turn off the camera, but that way you don't see it move in case you're someone who gets like motion sick. All right, so now we're at a different angle and I am going to tilt the camera down. Ooh, here, let's do it right here. Here's some space. I wonder if this is supposed to like pop up. Nope, maybe not. Let's see. I don't know. I have no idea what it's supposed to do. I guess maybe you just like play with it like this, like it's bouncing. I don't know. I thought when I was a kid, I don't know if everybody had these, but we used to get these little um, like saucer toys that uh, you would like, flip sort of inside out and put it on like a table or the ground and it would pop up and I thought oh it's one of those but it's not I don't know what it's supposed to do I mean I'm flinging it around my office right now so you know that's fun uh, I don't really I don't think this this one might be a cat toy I don't know we'll see if my cat will like it all right let's get back and there's two of them in here so we have that. All right, we have ooh, some tiny slinkies. There are two of them. And oh, another little pea pod. Hello. And another snake. I have not played with a slinky since I was a little kid. There it goes. All right. We have two slinkies and they come with smiley faces. This reminds me of stuff that you'd get at like the school fair. All right, there we go. Pull it apart. This is sort of fun. I don't know if it's big enough to go down the stairs, but let's see. Yeah, it's not, it, I'm trying to make it walk off my desk. I don't think I'll be able to get it to walk downstairs, but it is you know, nice, fun little, little toy. I can see this being pretty satisfying. Um, yeah, I don't know. This one could be a winner, something nice to just sort of 
bring around. All right, we have some more mochi toys there. It looks like, you know, I had the cloud. It looks like, it's like there's also a cat. And, oh, a koala bear. You can't, I don't know how well you can see it through the packaging. Um, this one is like sticky looking though. That one might need some cornstarch right away. I might have to go out and get some cornstarch, I guess, huh? But there we go. It's very cute. It's not showing up well on camera. Not everybody is photogenic like this little mochi cat, which is very cute. All right. Ooh, we have a puzzle. Now, this is the kind of stuff that I thought growing up as a kid seeing movies and stuff where there would be like people in business that everybody would just always have these kinds of puzzle toys on their desk. That was the impression I got from movies as a kid. Um, so now maybe I'm one of those high powered uh, CEOs that's going to have it. And I don't know how well you can see it, but let's see, you tilt this a little bit. There is a little ball bearing in there and the idea is you just tilt it and try to get the, I guess that ball bearing through the holes. There's, it's a maze. There's no real like puzzle to solve. It's not like you're trying to get, I don't think like you're trying to get the ball bearing out of the cube or anything. Um, you know, you just kind of sit there and play with it and have it, let's see, you have it go through the maze. Ah, oops. Nope, dead end. All right. And then, yeah. Let's see. We'll get there. We'll get there. Oh, maybe there is a, a solution. You want to get it into maybe one of these things where it sort of stays still? I don't know. Hmm, tricky, tricky. See, I'm trying to get it through this hole in the, in the orange. You've got to be pretty careful. Oh, I got it through the blue. Now I'm on the blue side. So, you know, there's something to it. It's kind of fun. All right, let's look at some more. All right, there's one of these. Now I have a thing of, that um, I think is sort of a fidget that uh, you can actually wear as a bracelet, which is kind of cool. It's a zipper, it's a plastic zipper. It's sort of like this, but a zipper and you can attach it around your wrist if you want to. So this is sort of like that. It reminds me for, you know, my uh, older millennials and Gen Xers maybe out there, uh, the game Snake on the Nokia brick phones. <laughs> this reminds me of that as you're trying to get it around places. So it's very clicky. It's sort of fun. I don't really see myself playing with this, but you know, it's there. I think you can sort of make shapes with it. Let's see, I have seen ones where it's a little bit like a Rubik's cube, but instead of twisting it to solve a puzzle, you actually like pull the sections apart um, it's a little bit like a mix between a Rubik's cube and what is it called? Uh, tangrams, I think. Um, is that right? Tangrams or it's the shapes and you want to make a square. Um, so I've seen things that are sort of like this, but they do that. I don't know. It's hard to explain. If I, if you saw it, you'd be like, oh, Sarah did not do a great job at explaining that, but I know what I'm talking about. That's the important thing. Um, but yeah, this is maybe not the big thing that I want for a fidget toy. My, you know, maybe on my, on my YouTube channel, maybe I'll do a giveaway. Just kidding. I don't have a YouTube channel. <laughs> that would be fun though. Um, all right. So then we have, ooh, a dinosaur Orbeez, uh, what? I just call, I just use the word, what is it? Um, stress ball, I guess. Now I am not a big fan of stress balls. Um, I always want to know what's inside them. I want to open them up and, and I've done that before. And sometimes I'll do it. I'll be like, no, you're supposed to squeeze it. So I'll literally just like sit there and squeeze it until it breaks, um, which I don't think is the point. It's always something gross. I don't recommend it. 
don't do it. Uh, but so I usually avoid sort of more, you know, traditional stress balls, but I love this one because it's a dinosaur. I love dinosaurs. I don't think I have anything in my office right now that has a dinosaur in it, but I love dinosaurs. I always have. So this is very cute. Um, I have seen these sorts of things uh, that have, you know, the more traditional like stress ball with like a goo inside them. But this is sort of fun. I really am enjoying the like texture of the Orbeez inside. And then you look at it and it's all like pops out through the holes in the dinosaur and you can see all the, the fun little Orbeez. This is fun. I do like it. This is going to definitely stay on my desk, partly just because it's a dinosaur and I need to incorporate more dinosaurs into my office. Um, but also because it is sort of fun. Although I worry that, you know, this, this, this would be the kind of thing that I want to like break open and see what's inside. Um, but you know, maybe that's one of the reasons that I, you know, became a librarian to see, you know, sort of the metaphorical what's inside. All right. So I have one last toy in here. I have no clue what this is. Um, this is another one that you know there were a lot of different options for fidget toy lots with lots of options in them um, on that mega online retailer and again i was looking for something that would sort of help me get that feeling of going like this for 45 minutes at a time while i watch you know an episode of a 90s teen drama or something um, and so I thought this might be one of them. I don't really know what it is. I've never seen one of these before. So it looks like, oh, there's something inside. Uh, I thought it was a sponge, but it is not. It's much harder than a sponge, but I think you just sort of poke these in. I don't really know what it's supposed to do. For me, you know, having the, the knowing what it's supposed to do is part of what makes it satisfying. It is kind of fun. You just can squeeze these in or not, but hmm, wasn't quite what I was expecting. Huh. I really want to know, as you can see, this is me playing with something that's supposed to like calm you down. And I'm like, I want to know what's in here. I want to know what that is. I think it's, it reminds me of uh, if you have a cat, which I have a cat, uh, as I've already mentioned, um, Sometimes you can buy these like bags of multiple cat toys and there will usually be a couple of like weird foam balls in them. And those are actually the ones that my cat likes with like tinsel coming out of them. So I end up having, and that's like, so sometimes that's the only way that you can get these. It has to be this like specific kind of foam with tinsel out of it. She is very picky about toys. Um, and it feels kind of like that, but a, a little bit denser. No tinsel coming off of it either, if you look inside. The light is not great, but it's like, it's sort of like a tennis ball, but a little bit squishy. I don't know. I just want to break this open now. <laughs> this is why, you know, I need to have fidget toys because otherwise I just want to break things open and see what's inside, um, which is not always good. Again, no clue what this is, but it looks like a soccer ball. So, you know, if you're into soccer, this kind of toy might be good for you. But that was quite the haul. I think so far my favorites are clearly as I just grabbed this other little stri uh, stretchy snake, I'm liking the stretchy snakes. I love the peas in the pod. You can see myself definitely maybe putting this on my keychain uh, just so I have it with me always. For one thing, it's so cute. Why wouldn't I want it to be with me always? And I do love the little mochis. These are the mochi squishies. They are very fun. I've had them before just because, you know, not even like thinking of them as a fidget toy, but just something to play with. But yeah, I do love a fidget, something that you can play with and keep your hands busy. Um, if you were watching while Emily was on, you know, uh, she was talking about 
how uh, knitting and especially sock knitting is good, you know, for when you're traveling, you can do it in your, you know, watching TV, listening to podcasts, same thing for me. You know, when I, when I'm watching TV, I like to keep my hands busy. So I also knit, uh, I'll do, I'll do some knitting when I watch TV. I like to do embroidery and cross stitch. I'll be on again later, um, around six o'clock today doing some cross stitching. And those are some other things that um, I like to do to keep my hands busy, whether I'm watching TV or I'm, you know, on a, a plane ride or listening to an audiobook, whatever it is. Um, but I like to play with stuff too, to, you know, just have something to do with my hands while I'm just watching TV. If I don't really want to, you know, have a thing that I have to pay attention to. Again, that's where I get into the trouble, like with that Rubik's cube I have at home that I was talking about, where I just, you know, I was just twisting it around for fun. And then I realized, oh, I can twist the corner pieces. And now I've, you know, ruined my chances of ever solving it. Possibly. I don't know. Rachel might know better. Uh, but I do have a friend that said, I, don't, I think it'll still work. And I don't know if it will. But, you know, having something to just mindlessly play with, you know, there's also our fidget spinners, which can be fun. Um, I, I gotta tell you these, I, this one, I think might be a little bit too small to really play with my cat with, but I've known many cats that do love a fidget spinner for a, uh, a toy. And if you are also like a fidget person, um, one thing that I have not done yet, uh, but I have looked at doing it. Did you know you can also 3D print um, fidget toys? So we do have some, uh, I think in the studio where it's things that you can sort of rotate. You can even do, there's the ones where, I think it's probably similar to this, um, where you put keys from a keyboard on it. You can 3D print the, the sort of frame and put your mechanical keyboard keys on there and click them in and out. Um, so that's pretty cool. And you can do 3D printing in the studio, which is where I work. Um, just a little plug for the studio when I'm talking about my 3D printing. But yeah, all kinds of things in there. Oh, and of course, I do love this. I've never had an Orbeez ball before. Ooh, it is a weird, interesting texture. Uh, I don't think I've ever, I've seen Orbeez before, but I don't think I've ever um, you know, had anything with Orbeez in it. So it's kind of cool. I, again, I want to rip this open or cut it open and see what they feel like, but I don't have to do that. Cause I think you can just buy them and play with them. If anybody, oh, this has a different face. So there's two of these. One is happy. One is sad. Um, although I think I always think of this sort of face as more like cringe face. Um, but if anybody knows what these are supposed to do, let me know. Cause I cannot figure it out. Oh. Stack them. I don't know. Play Nerf badminton with them. I guess that's probably what they actually are designed for, but I don't, I don't know how they work as a fidget toy. I'm trying. I'm trying. Oops, <laughs> um, that just went behind the desk. I don't know where that's or when that's gonna come out of there, but yeah, that was pretty fun. I uh, am very much enjoying these little snake toys. Wow, that surprised me. I saw those when I opened up the bag and I said, mm -mm, not for me. What's the point of that? The point is you just get to stretch them. That's it. It's kind of cool. I mean, what's the point of any fidget toy? Just to keep your hands busy, give you something to fidget with, you know, instead of whatever you would do instead of fidgeting with a toy. But it's pretty fun. And we are just about at 1130. So I think we do have someone else coming in. I don't know if they're here yet. Keep playing with my stretchy snakes. I gotta come up with something else to call them. I don't, 
I don't want to start thinking about having snakes in, in my office or, you know, on my couch or something. Ooh, yuck. <laughs> but yeah, so we do have another person who will be coming in shortly. Um, but, oh, uh, maybe they are here. So yeah, I'm happy to switch it over as soon as, as soon as they're ready. I believe it's Sarah Copeland doing some fabric folding. That's right. Thank you, Sarah. I am here. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Cause I don't yes. have a mic. Yes. Okay. I All right. Hear cool. you and see you. Sweet. All right. Well, um, I guess I can take off my dorky name tag here. Um, and yeah, I volunteered to fold fabric today. Um, I'm a bit of a fabric junkie and, um, I do all sorts of things with fabric, uh, whatever, but, um, I have a bunch of fabrics today that are fat quarter size and I bought them as a little gift to myself this past Christmas. And um, they need to be folded because you want all your, all your fabrics to be lined up so that you can see them all. And so like, this looks like it's one, one giant piece, but it's actually not. It is many, many different pieces of fabric. Um, and they're all uh, fat quarter sized. And so for uh, those who are not fabric junkies, um, that just means that it's 18 inches by 20 inches. It's a quarter of a yard, but it's cut a little funny um, so that you can have a usable piece for different types of projects without having to buy like yards and yards of fabric. Um, so at any rate, I've got a document camera here uh, well, actually, let's just, so these are kind of organized by, by rainbow colors. And I did not do this. Um, they came this way from the designer. Um, and so we've got the blues. We've got the, the pinks and reds. We've got the greens. Um, I think it's hard, a little hard to tell, but I think this is going to be purples. Um, if you actually like look inside here, there are all sorts of purple fabrics. Um, we've got our yellow tones, black, and then if there's time, um, we might fold the whites, but I think that's probably going to be the la least interesting. So I've put that last, um, in my little, little bin here. Who, who even knows how far we're going to get? Because this isn't about how much fabric I fold. It's just about doing something that I find calm and soothing and just kind of, talking through it here on the live stream today so that you can have this as your background as you study hang out um you know just get ready for the the last push to the end of the semester um so just a little bit about these fabrics um they are all from my favorite designer who is allison glass um and she does a lot with modern fabrics um, and modern designs, and they tend to be really bold colors, really bold um, uh, designs across the fabrics. And that's part of the thing that I find so appealing about her fabric. So I thought it would partic be particularly fun to fold these Allison Glass fabrics today, because in addition to just having a soothing activity, there are really beautiful things to look at. Um, so I'm going to get the document camera started here and let's hope that this doesn't turn into a tutorial on how to use a document camera. And I wasn't sure how the lighting would turn up. So let's try this without the light. Okay, um, hold on here. Um, hmm. All right, so we want to be able to actually see this. Let's see if we can focus it. Hmm. Oh, here we go, focus. Well. Oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, so the document camera just had to adjust itself there. So um, in the interest of uh, keeping this um, soothing and relaxing, I'm not going to actually um, manhandle all these fabrics um, while I'm getting, getting this oriented here, because um, that'll just make folks dizzy, I think. Um, so at any rate, 
Um, I'm using a technique for folding fabric that is specifically for um, fat quarters. And um, you start with the selvage edge, which is this edge right here. You start with that on the, on the downside, and then you fold the fabric in half so that on both sides facing out um, is your uh, right side. So essentially we've got wrong sides together and then we'll fold it in half again. And we wanna make sure that we come down just a little bit past that raw edge that we had where the selvage uh, met the, the other piece. Um, and the reason for that is so that when we turn it over um, and actually fold our two ends in, and then one last fold, then we end up with nothing but nice folded edges all the way around. And then this will make a really pretty little stack of fabrics once we are, are done. So I'm just gonna set this aside um, and I'm going to try to adjust this document camera a little bit so you can see, I didn't realize that we wouldn't, um, all right, hopefully we can see a, a little bit more now. Um, oh, uh-oh, hmm, which side is the right side? This almost looks like a chambray. Chambray, I don't know, how do you say that? I really need to learn more about like how to say the types of fabric because I, as a fabric junkie, I read a lot about them, but I don't actually like know how to, how to pronounce them. Um, but this, this definitely looks like a, a, a chambray to me. So we're just gonna get our double fold, making sure that we cover up that selvage and then I'm trying to make sure that I can actually like on the camera here. And fold it in. Fold it in. Make sure our corners are nice and neat. And our last fold right here. That would actually make a really pretty background for a project. I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly what, but I think that would, that would just be super cute. Um, so full disclosure, my nerdy hobby among many, but my, one of my nerdiest hobbies is um, I like to quilt. And um, I know that's just such like, it's, probably, it's, it's one of the many old lady hobbies that I have. Um, but but this, this pretty um, chambray right here, I think that would be such a cool um, fabric to have as like background against some like really, really bright um, modern fabrics. Um, oh, and this one, this has got some sort of like amoeba or sea creature on it. I love it. Um, Alison Glass has so many like natural uh, motifs that she uses in her fabrics. Um, I just, I just really love um, all the different, um, all the different types of motifs that she, she uses and, and she's been designing a long time and somehow she always manages to come up with new things. Um, I don't know, it was, I'm probably the only Alison Glass devotee on this um, live stream, but I'll, I'll tell you all a little bit about her latest collection that I'm just super in love with. It is um, full of all sorts of insects and it's this beautiful rainbow collection with moths and butterflies and grasshoppers. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's just fantastic. I love it so much. And um, I, if I had fat quarters, I would have brought some today, um, but I didn't have any fat quarters from that newest collection. Um, oh, and this looks like it's a batik. I'm not sure I realized she designed batiks. Um, batiks are a, a, a special way of dyeing the fabric. And I guess I don't really know, but this has kind of that signature batik look to it. And also the weave is a little different. So um, yeah, that's, that's a fun one. That's really pretty. I have no idea what I'm going to do with that, but it's going to be gorgeous whenever I do it. Um, to be honest, um, 
I really just like to have fabric. I mean, I use it. I definitely use it. But um, I, like the, these these fabrics right here, I have I had no idea what I was going to use them for when I splurged on them um, as my little gift to myself. Um, and that's okay. Um, it, I um, try really hard to avoid buying fabrics unless I have a plan for them uh, because um, I would spend all of my time shopping for um, and buy, and then all of my money buying fabrics and then I would need a new place to live because my, my house is definitely not that big. Um, you can see this is from Allison's Gla Allison Glass's um, holiday collection. And I don't know if you can quite tell with the lighting in here, it's a little, it's a little weird under the fluorescent lights, but um, she's used an interesting color palette uh, for her holiday um, fabrics. She's got this fuchsia and berry, and then the, the background, it, it looks teal on, on at least my screen, but um, in real life, it's it's almost a um, turquoise color, and then um, some mustards or chartreuses. Anyway, it's just a it's kind of an interesting look. Um, I don't, I'm not much into holiday projects, so um, I have no idea what I'll use this for. But um, I don't know, fun little um, you know girl jumping rope here, if nothing else. And uh, I don't know like, what uh, hobbies you all have that you could just do all day long and, and mindlessly just, you know, just do, but uh, I could fold fabric all day long. In fact, I should probably set a timer so that I don't do something silly and fold fabric into um, the next person's live stream section. Um, Oh wow, that is gorgeous. Now I could totally see myself using this. This this and it's kind of a um uh it's an interesting mix of colors, but they aren't none of them are it, there's not too much contrast within the fabric, so that's kind of nice. Um and then I love this kind of um almost blue violet color. And then I don't know, teal is one of my favorite colors. People often think that um pink is one of my favorite colors. Um and it's really not teal. Teal is it. That is, that is it. Um, but as I'm fond of telling people, uh, except when it comes to fabric, I'm incredibly cheap. And so frequently it's the pink things that are like on sale. So um, anyway, we don't, we don't need to get into my other buying habits. This is, this is the live stream about folding fabric. So we're going to stick to fabric. All right. So um, I folded, let's see here. Um, Oh, well, and I've, hold on, let me arrange these correctly here. All right, it looks like I've folded one, two, three, four, five, six fat quarters, and you can see how they make a super yummy and neat bundle of fabric here. Um, and in fact, once we uh, get through this and actually, um, and have like a rainbow effect, I like, I just, I can't wait to, put that all in my little bin and show you what it looks like. Um, and we probably won't get um, all of them done considering it's already 11.43, but we'll, we'll get pretty far. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer just so that I'm respectful of the next person's time slot. All right, here we are. Oh, this is gorgeous, okay. And of course you can't even tell because of what you see right now is the wrong side, but here's the right side. This looks like it might also have been from the holiday collection, but you almost it like, you know, unless you look closely, you can't even really tell. Like the only thing that kind of is the giveaway is this kind of berry look right here. Um, it's the only thing that makes me think that maybe this was from her holiday collection. <clears throat> that and it kind of, kind of goes with, with this right here, um, which was the, the holiday, um, the holiday fabric that we know for sure because it's got like angels and nutcrackers and other holiday themed things on it.
creating order out of chaos here. I feel like that's that's what we're doing. And I feel like, I don't know, is there a metaphor in there for reading day? I don't know. Are you, while you slept this evening, did you create order out of chaos with all the things you've been studying? Um, I don't know. There's probably there's probably a better metaphor in there. This one, um, I don't know if y'all remember. This was the the fabric that was on top when I was first showing you the blues, and you can see the kind of signature Allison glass motifs in here. We've got our moths and a bunny, a thimble, um, some strawberries, and in fact, the next fabric after this, because we're going to be moving on to the pinks, um, has strawberries, and it might be my absolute favorite fabric of this whole. Um, batch of fat quarters that came from Alice and Glass. By the way, I should note that this was a um, a grab bag. Like all, all I did, like um, she just advertised, um, you know, a random assortment of fat quarters um, with all colors of the color spectrum um, represented. And, and then you just got random stuff from all these different designs. Look, see those, those strawberries, aren't those gorgeous? Um, or at least fun, maybe gorgeous isn't the right word, but fun. Oh, and look, a little apple mixed in across the mix of the strawberries. That is the first time I've noticed that, too fun. Um, at any rate, so these fabrics literally have come from all different lines that Alison Glass has designed, um, which I, I think is kind of fun. All right, so let's do these, these strawberries. Too cute. <clears throat> I have like 10 different plans for the strawberry fabric and there's not that much of it. So I need to figure out if I'm gonna buy more or if I'm just going to hoard this one little piece um, and then, you know, one day make something out of it. Uh, but keep in mind, this is um, just 18 by uh, 20 inches. Oops, and I need to make sure that that selvage edge gets covered up here. Um, so it's really good to um, buy fat quarters if you've got a lot of different um, fabrics that you want to incorporate into a single project. Um, or if you have just a project that just maybe isn't all that big, like a little wallet or something that you want to make, um, this would actually make the cutest little wallet. Um, uh, by the way, I do not make um, wallets or bags. Now, there's something about having to put in zippers and other hardware that I'm just, just not interested in. Um, Interfacing, I don't know, not my thing. So if, it, if anyone out here wants out there wants to make a wallet out of that strawberry fabric, maybe we could talk. Um, or it would I'd probably make a really fun mask, as would this one. Actually, I think all most of the Allison glass fabrics would just be make super cute masks. Um, so as you would think that as a um, fabric uh, hoarder. Um, that I, I probably made a lot of my own masks, but I didn't. Um, I, I'm not even sure that I have a good excuse for why, except that it just didn't seem like fun, so I didn't. <laughs> um, which, uh, I don't know, I need to up my mask game probably. Uh, but look, that, that would be so much fun for a mask. And then I don't know if the colors are really coming through on the camera, but um, the yellows in here are just a really bright chartreuse. It's just um, the, the colors in, that Allison Glass uses are just so bold. Um, I love them. So here's more of that uh, berry, or not berry, excuse me, uh, holiday line. I should probably look to see if there are any, um, any comments. Looks like this hasn't been a very active commenting stream, but that is okay because it's more about being soothing than anything else. Whoops. Okay. 
hope I didn't send, I have no idea what I did. Oh, well, okay. We're gonna assume that everything's fine. Um, and look, here is another view of our um, fabric bundle, loving it, loving it. Boy, I didn't, you know, until I took a close look at these fabrics, I'm not sure I realized how many might have been from that holiday line because this with the with the stripe um, also appears to be from the, the holiday line here. Love that. That's just gonna make such a pretty little folded fat quarter when we're done. And for those keeping score at home, because this is an 18 inch piece of fabric, um, I'm folding to the nine inch on my, um, uh, my cutting mat here. And obviously I don't have my cutting mat because I'm cutting any fabric. That, that's, that's, that's a little too much for today. Um, but it, I don't know, it just makes it so nice for, for folding. Um, but look at that. I mean, how, how, what a pretty little fat quarter. This is almost brown. It's sort of a tweed. So well, some sort of foliage here, some sort of foliage motif. Uh, I've seen really cool projects where um, this the selvage is used, um, like instead of just cutting it off and throwing it away, the the person. Um, the artisan, the crafter, however you want to say it, um, actually uses the selvage in the project. And uh, those are always fun. I've never, I don't know, it's not high up on my list of things to, to do, but um, I do enjoy the creativity of others. I think that maybe once we're done with these pinks and reds, um, I might move on to that batch of purple because that was just, I don't know, that looked just really appealing to me. So we've got, just as a reminder, we, we, we start with the selvage edge at the bottom. We've got, it, and we start with the wrong side up, right side down. When we fold it in half, then wrong sides are together. And then we're gonna fold again. And we wanna fold it um, down enough that we cover up that, that raw selvage edge. And then we're going to fold into the nine inch mark, which I know you all can't see that there's a little nine on my cutting mat here, but, but I can see it. Um, and that's what this line is on either side. And then we have one last time. Boy, I don't know if this is really gonna come through but this, these last two are super pink. Oh my goodness, so pink, like almost bubblegum pink. I don't know how I feel about that. But I do love the design on this one. I mean, look at that, with that fun um, like amoeba shape or amoeba is not even the right word, um, but I don't know, some sort of really cool, um, very small flora or fauna probably tell that I didn't do great in biology. Um, in fact, I did not take biology in college because I, I, was, I was kind of over it by that point. I took other sciences for my required science. All right, one last bright pink one. This one kind of reminds me of like Alice in Wonderland or something. I wonder if Alice in Glass has an Alice in Wonderland um, line. You can see there's a, a spade and, oh yeah, it must, 
and there's the club. Yeah, where are the hearts? I don't even know. <laughs> I'll probably find them once we're done. Oh, and there's there's a clock. This is totally Alice in Wonderland theme. Interesting. Huh. You learn something new every day. I'll look into that. All right, so we've completed our blues and our reds and pinks. Allison Glass isn't too much into straight up red, but she does do quite a lot with that fuchsia, fuchsia color. Um, okay, looks like we've got about five minutes left. We'll do some of these purples next. This is a bold, a bold piece. I have no idea what I'll do with, with such a small piece of this, but you can see the really cool moth right here. Love that. Maybe, maybe I'll end up fussy cutting that moth and doing something with that. Um, I wonder, is there one on the other side? Oh, there it is. Mm, yeah, I'll have to think about what to do with that. That could be really cool. Yeah, these types of really bold, large format designs are really, um, in my opinion, best for, um, you know, like putting on the on the back of a project or featuring like in the center, like if you're doing like a, a medallion type project. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do with just 18 by 20 inches. It's, it's not very much. This is just a really soothing way to spend half an hour. And I appreciate that the studio is sponsoring this live stream. Something kind of kind of fun we could all look forward to and participate in. More purple. I'm sure you all are starting to see that there are some some repeats just in different colors or colorways. It's I guess pretty typical. Got some. Um, gosh, I should know what this type of fabric is called, and I don't remember. Where it's just the the white line on the color. Oh, it has a name. Oh well. I guess I'll look it up when the when I get off the live stream. Maybe one more of these. Ooh, okay, never mind. I'm gonna do this one with the birds. This is gorgeous. And then I'm gonna see if I can't figure out how to how to see if the next person is on. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? With like the star pattern in the background, and then we've got birds, and it looks like a bee and uh, stars. Just Kind of super fun. I love how with some of these you can, um, like, you take a step back and it just looks, you know, blue or purple or whatever. Um, but then uh, you take, you take, you, you you start looking a little more closely and you're like, oh, that is like, there's a lot more to that. I love, I love that. Let's, let's just look at our. Look at our batch of fabrics here, all together. And you, well, I didn't stack them very neatly, but they are all the same size. And um, you know, at some point when I'm I'm bored, I'll probably put them in actual rainbow order because I love that sort of thing. Let me see if my colleague is here. Looks like, oops, looks like she is. Um. I just need to figure out, um, I did something funny with the Zoom. And so now, <laughs> um, now I need to figure that out. All right. Oh, here we go. Uh, by the way, this is, that is my, my elbow. I will um, switch the camera 
and thank you all for um, in, indulging me and my and my fabrics. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and sign it over to to my my colleague Chapel. Thanks, Sarah. And Chantel, is there anything I need to do to make myself larger? How's that coming through? There's a slight delay, so we haven't seen you on the full screen yet. I'll, I'll keep you posted. And okay. hi to your cat. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I'm Chapel. I am the health and science librarian. Um, this is my cat, Hank, who apparently will be joining us for this session, at least for some of it. <laughs> and I have one more cat who may join us as well. So I am, and he's just going to stay here the whole time, isn't he? I am an avid gardener and houseplant enthusiast. So I am going to talk a little bit about houseplants and then probably transition over and talk about um, gardening. And we'll actually do some repotting of some of my houseplants and we will also do uh, some planting of some seedlings for the garden. So I wanna start out by talking about this really cool plant called a palea. So Palea is also known as the Chinese money plant and they're wildly popular with houseplant enthusiasts. And I would say they're fairly easy to grow and propagate. This one was actually given to me by one of my colleagues, shout out to Brian Rogers out there who gave me my first teeny tiny little Palea. And Palaeas really enjoy well-draining soil. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we do some repotting here. Um, they also enjoy uh, filtered light. So you don't wanna put them in your sunniest windowsill, but they don't wanna stay in a dark corner either. Um, I've got two Palaeas here. So let's look at this second one. So this one was actually part of this larger one. This was one of the babies, we'll call them. Um, and you might be able to tell, it may be a little hard to see on the screen there, but this one is growing in one direction. So most of the leaves are facing out this way. So the reason for that is that I have not turned this fella enough. So this other one you can see has some pretty fairly even growth. It's because you need to turn them at least once a week or else they'll grow towards the sun uh, and you will end up with a plant that looks a little bit more lopsided like this. Now, the good news is that all I have to do is turn him today and he will even back out in a couple of days. So that's really nice. All right, so let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit closer for you. So you may be able to see, although I'm on my laptop and my camera isn't great, there are some teeny tiny mini Palaeas right here in my pot. So those little guys have grown off of the mother plant, so the main stalk here, and they've started growing up on the side of the pot, mostly because I've got some rocks on the top of the soil. So that suppresses them growing too close to the mother plant. So instead they're growing by the side. So what we're gonna do, and this is, let me move my camera just a touch so we can see this part a little bit better. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this handy dandy little tool and I'll be 100% honest with you, I do not know what this is called. This is actually a teeny tiny little spade-like tool that you would use in bonsai. Uh, so if you're familiar with bonsai, those are the little trees that you see in pots that folks will, um, will trim into miniature trees and keep small. Um, so this little guy is actually used in bonsais, but I find that he is also very handy when you are trying to dig out little baby palaeas to repot. Okay, 
So what I'm going to do here is I am going to scrape the rocks aside so I can get to the baby Pelea. And then I'm going to start to loosen the soil a little bit. And this can be kind of tricky. You don't want to damage the mother plant and you want to keep as much of the baby plant and the root together as you can. And I should also note, I've got three babies in this pot. I think I'm only going to transplant one, but if any of my colleagues out there are looking for a baby Pelea, um, you are welcome to this little one. All right, so I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit here. Probably going to be difficult, but I've started to separate him from the side of the pot. And what you will have to do, because he's growing to the mother plant with part of the stalk, is you are going to have to chop that a little bit. So I'm going to pull as much as I can. And then I'm going to cut him away from the mother. And this is what we have. So we've got some nice roots down here. You can see them hanging down. So we've got some good root growth and that's really critical to having a successful house plant transplant. Um, those little roots are what will help him really get going. So he looks fairly good. I'm gonna just lay him down on my tabletop. And I am certain that I will be covered in dirt by the time we are done with this, which is, in my opinion, one of the best parts of gardening. I love getting dirty. All right, so what do we pot this guy in? So typically you don't want a pot that's going to, I'm gonna alter my screen a little bit. You don't want a pot that's gonna overwhelm the seedling or the transplant. So you don't want something that's huge. Um, if I had a smaller pot, I might use it, but this is the size that I have. And this is probably, this is a three inch pot, I'd say. Um, any house plant you have must be in a container with a drainage hole. Drainage hole is a must. There are virtually no house plants that want to sit in super soggy soil. Now there are some ways around this. If you have a pot that doesn't have a hole, you can create your own hole. You can use a drill usually and just drill a hole in or a couple of holes. You can also plant your plant on top of rocks. So you can have a really thick layer of rocks in the bottom of your pot and then add your soil and then add your plant. And those rocks will help kind of create that appearance of drainage to the plant. Um, I have found that that is really not ideal though. So again, plants really want a pot with a drainage hole. So when you're buying your pots, be super considerate of that. So if you do indeed get yourself a pot that has a drainage hole in it, like this one, you're also going to need a little tray underneath it to catch any of the, like this one has soil in it, to catch the soil and definitely to catch the water after you water the plants. Because generally when you're watering a plant, um, you want to soak the plant so that water comes out the base. And after you've soaked the plant, then you're gonna let it thoroughly dry before you water it again. Paleas do not like soggy soil. So you can water your Pelea really well till water comes out the bottom of your pot. And then you don't wanna water it again until it's dry. And to determine if it's dry, you can just sink your finger down in the soil just a little bit, you know, maybe kind of up to the um, base of your fingernail. And if that's dry, it's gonna be time to water your Pelea. Okay. All right, so first thing we're gonna do now that we've got our little seedling ready and we've got our pot ready to go, is we're gonna add some soil. So I think I picked this up at Target. I typically end up buying my soil at a gardening center or at a Lowe's. Um, there are lots of different types of soil. So for house plants, you don't want a miracle grow gardening soil. That's too much. It's too rich for your house plants. Get something plainer that's designed for house plants. I typically like to add a little bit of what we call grit, um, 
which could be lots of different types of products. Usually for me, it's sand. I'll add that into the mix and that really helps with drainage as well and keeps your plants from being soggy. Certain plants like more sand than others. Um, these guys, I can do a little bit of sand, but uh, my mix is not primarily sand. Another important aspect of buying soil is that I try to buy soil that is peat free. Uh, so peat bogs are mostly found over in England um, and peat is heavily used in the soil mixtures over there. It does show up in our soil mixtures as well, but peat collection for soil has really damaged the peat bogs, which are these naturally occurring areas that um, are home to wildlife and lots of flora as well. So we want to be mindful of that, that we're not taking things from the wild uh, and hurting those creatures and landscapes that we're, we're, we're doing a better job. So I like a peat free soil. All right, so I'm gonna get a little bit of soil into a cup I've already got in here. And I'm gonna add some to my pot. So got some soil in here, got it a little more than halfway full. And I'm just gonna kind of eyeball whether this looks like it's deep enough. I'm gonna add a little bit more soil. And what I'm checking for is that I want the base of the plant, I want soil up to the base of the plant, like not all the way up to the leaves, but you know, about midway up the stem or so. a little bit more soil and then I'm gonna tuck, I'm gonna press it down just a little bit and then I'm gonna start adding soil. Move my camera just a bit. I'm gonna start adding soil around, around this little guy. Okay, so I'm gently pressing the soil down and then I'm going to add another layer. Got some big clumps in here and make sure you don't have too many big clumps. You want to break those up a bit. And if you have clumps that are too big, you can just toss them back in your bag and use them when you're repotting a bigger plant. Okay. So I feel like I've got this where I want it now. Let's take a quick look. So there he is, teeny tiny little guy. He will swiftly grow into this though. It won't take very long at all to get much, much bigger. All right, so typically at this point we would water him in. I'm not gonna water this one just yet because, well, to be perfectly honest, I forgot to put water on my table and I don't wanna scurry away to get water. So I will water him in a little bit. One other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little bit of fertilizer on him. Not too much, you don't wanna over fertilize your house plants, but it's good to give them just a little bit to start with. I actually make my own fertilizer so it's gonna look really gross. So it's in a, an old peanut jar. Um, this is from vermicomposting. So my husband actually has a vermicompost bin and what that is, and you know what? I wish I'd thought of that and I would have brought it out here and showed you the vermicompost bin. So vermicomposting uh, is composting your kitchen scraps and other yard materials using worms. So we built this three-tiered system using Rubbermaid tubs with holes drilled in them uh, and layers of soil and leaves. And then you buy special worms that are used specifically for composting. And then they will compost your foodstuffs. So they love leafy greens, they love apples, they love eggshells. They'll break down, I mean, most anything except for meats, no meats, 
Um, no dairy products and no onions. Everything else they will break down into a fine compost um, called worm castings. The worm castings, which looks like a super rich soil, I actually use on my vegetable garden. Uh, but there's also, this is going to sound terrible, there's also this liquid called leachate um, that is the liquid that's produced during this process. And that's what I have here. I use that on my house plants, and it's this super, super rich additive that helps them grow really well. So I'm going to add just a little bit of the leachate into, not too much, into that pot. And because I know you're thinking it out there, it's not worm pee, just leachate, just a byproduct of the process. Now the worm castings technically is worm poop. So yeah. All right, so we've got our little Palea planted. We've got him fertilized. Now you could just leave your Palea like this and that would be fine, but I actually really like um, to put a little something on top. So in my big Palea, you're probably not gonna be able to see this well, I've got black, little black stones on top and I really like the look of that. Um, it's not always the most practical thing to put on top of your plants though. So what I use more often than not, Sorry, this is gonna be really crinkly. I use um, a different type of moss. So this one is a Spanish moss. Now, if you live further south than us and you have some native Spanish moss and you think I'm gonna get some Spanish moss and put it on top of my house plants, please don't. One, um, you're taking something from the environment that doesn't need to be taken, but two, um, Spanish moss that you gather from trees usually has mites in it, which you can get and then they itch really, really, really bad. So when you get mosses, try to buy them, uh, buy them pre-bagged. I also love reindeer moss. And again, I wish I had, I may, I may bring some over in a minute and show it to you. I love reindeer moss. It's a really bright green and it really helps to set off certain plants. Now, Spanish moss is really, really messy. So I've just pulled off a little bit of it. And just gonna kind of work it onto the top of the soil. This also helps keep your soil from washing away, which can happen, can keep the soil from being compacted. And I just tend to like the look of it on my plants. It gives this nice kind of, generally you have this really, you know, really nice house plant that grows in a specific way. And the Spanish moss adds this kind of wild element to that. So I've let a little bit of it hang over here. Now, as soon as this guy grows up a little bit and is taller, he'll be offset really nicely with the Spanish moss. All right, let me check my time here and see how we're doing. We've got about 12 minutes left, so I think that's enough time for us to do a little bit more planting. Let me cut away my moss. So a question you might have is where you go for information on plants and where you could go to buy plants if you don't have any um, of your own or you don't have friends who have plants that they will um, give you cuttings off of. So I do sometimes buy stuff at Lowe's and I also buy stuff at Ace Hardware. Um, there's a lovely little place down on the south side called Bees and Bicycles, I think that's what it's called. Anyway, they've got a wonderful selection of houseplants. They know about every houseplant they have, are super knowledgeable. So you can buy a houseplant from them. And then, you know, just using an internet browser is a great way to learn more about plants. Um, there are lots of different sites. I love the Farmer's Almanac, particularly for my outdoor plants. I don't use that one so much for houseplants, but 
Um, there's a wealth of houseplant information out there. I would encourage you to get your information from multiple sources. I find that sometimes there's conflicting information about uh, plants. So looking at a few different places until you can corroborate that information can be really helpful in raising a healthy and attractive houseplant. Um, I'm trying to think how many houseplants I have. Um, maybe 30 or so. Um, currently I have a, my biggest one is a banana tree that I have in the corner of my living room and it's about 14 feet tall. And my favorite one, um, I have this beautiful fern that is monstrous and it's a, um, oh, I'm gonna forget the name. It is a spectacular fern. Um, right behind that one, I've got a monstera plant that I love and monsteras are very, very popular. All right, so let me move our Peleas out of the way a little bit. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to plant a tray of flower seedlings for my vegetable garden. So I tend to start planting my vegetable garden really early in the year around January. And I've got the spring stuff out now, but it's time to start thinking about summer. I've had my summer seedlings growing for the last, I don't know, two months maybe, but flower seedlings, we don't do super early because they tend to grow really fast. And in fact, I normally don't actually plant these beforehand, but I don't wanna put them out for three weeks. So I wanna give them a little bit of a start. So this is my little seed box where I keep all of my seeds. And I think what I'd like to start us on today are cactus flower zinnias. They come in this little packet. It is so much cheaper for you to buy seeds and plant seeds than it is for you to buy plants. Um, if I were to buy zinnias at uh, Lowe's or somewhere, I would pay you know, anywhere from five to $12, depending on the size of the plant. And it would probably just be a couple of zinnias. This has probably a hundred seeds in it. So I can get a hundred zinnia plants for, what did I pay for this? $2 and 29 cents. So it's very much worth uh, buying seeds and planting those seeds yourself. All right, so I have a tray. It's just a big plastic tray and it's used specifically for this type of planting. And I'm gonna fill it up with some of this potting soil. Now this is a multi-purpose potting soil that I'm using. So um, I don't have any problem using it for flowers as well. I actually don't like to use the miracle Grow um, potting mixes at all. So definitely not using that. Now using a tray like this allows me to plant many, many, many seedlings in this one area. And then I can water them fairly evenly, which is nice. I don't have to worry about watering a bunch of individuals. So I've got a good layer of soil in here. That nice layer of soil. Now packets of seeds often come with all this great information. So this one tells me that I need to space these with three seeds every 12 inches. I'll be honest, I never do that. I'll put one seed every two or three inches when I'm starting indoors. And then it says I need to put them at a seed depth of one quarter of an inch. So one of the things I've learned from British gardening shows, shout out to Monty Don, who is my favorite British gardener. Um, I watch his shows on BritBox and Netflix. He is amazing. Um, I actually don't dig a hole for seeds. I'll just put the seeds on top of the soil and then I'll sprinkle more soil onto the tops of those. 
All right, so I'm gonna get some of these out. And this is what a zinnia seed looks like. Let's see if I can, if I can get in there with these. Very small, but not tiny. Um, it's very easy to collect zinnia seeds at the end of the season if you let some of the flowers go to seed. Um, and then you've got free seeds for the next year and you don't have to pay anything for them. So that's how I grow most of my zinnias, but I don't have this particular cactus flower blend, which is why um, we're planting that. Let me move this a little bit. So this part is not gonna be super interesting, but what I'm gonna do is put seedlings about every two inches or so. We're out here. And I'm probably, I'm gonna put three rows in my tray. Okay. All right. I'm gonna put the rest back in here. So that's probably, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So about 30 seedlings that we've got right here. So now that I have those, what I'm gonna do is just sprinkle the soil over the tops of my seedlings. It's at a quarter inch, so I'm gonna put, you know, not too much, but a decent amount. Now, if you wanna get really fancy, the British gardeners use these really great little, um, they make these wire boxes that you put your soil into and then they just shake it over the top. I don't have time to build one of those. So instead I'm just using my handy dandy little scoop, which works just fine. Okay. So get those covered over and then we're gonna give it a couple of whacks on the table make sure everything looks nice and even and then what i would do next is water it in so i'm not going to water them in because again i forgot my water so when i take them outside i'll just give them a good watering now you want to give these a little bit of shelter at first. So you should leave them in a sunny window. They do need light in order to germinate. They're not gonna germinate in your closet. Um, this particular tray has an extra piece to it. Let's take a look at that. So it's got a clear dome and the clear dome actually goes on top of the tray. like this. And what that does is that it helps to keep the seeds moist and warm, which is really great. Um, so if you keep the seeds moist and warm, they will germinate much more quickly than they normally would. So I'm probably going to put this out on my front porch because it's now warm enough to do that. And these guys will probably you know, they're supposed to emerge in about three to 10 days, but it's probably not going to take that long. I expect that we'll see seedlings pop up in the next day or two. It tends to be super quick, especially as it starts to warm up outside. All right, so my time is coming to an end, I think. So I'm super stoked that we were able to get through repotting the palea and doing an entire tray of seedlings during our time. So just to recap, we were repotting or we were getting babies off of the mother plant of my palea. And here is, here is the little baby that we planted up and added some Spanish moss to for decoration and to help keep the soil stable. And then we planted some cactus flower zinnia seeds that we hope to see emerge in the next couple of days. It was great hanging out with y'all today and enjoy the rest of our live stream. I think 
uh, up next. I'm not sure who's up next. I think um, someone will be reading to you next though. So happy reading day and great luck on your exams. All right, I got it, Chapel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Haber, and I am going to read to you for the next half an hour. Um, I selected Anne of Green Gables, which is a really great um, story. Oh, I see a chat. Okay, great job, Chapel. Yes, repotting plants. Um, so Anne of Green Gables is a story about an orphan girl um, up in Canada, and uh, she is accidentally uh, adopted by a brother and sister who live in Green Gables. And um, from there, they end up keeping her. They expected to get a little boy to help with chores around their farm. And instead they ended up with Anne. And um, it was originally published in 1908. And I thought I would just jump into chapter four. So um, again, we're reading Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery. And here's a little image. I don't have a fully illustrated version of the story this morning because um, the library didn't have it. We mostly just had the text of the initial book. Um, and I think there were several books. I can't remember exactly how many. Um, I could probably look it up, but uh, eight, at least eight books about Anne. So chapter four, Morning at Green Gables. It was broad daylight when Anne awoke and sat up in bed, staring confusedly at the window through which a flood of cheery sunshine was pouring and outside of which something white and feathery waved across the glimpses of blue sky. For a moment, she could not remember where she was. First came a delightful thrill, as if something very pleasant, then a horrible remembrance. This was Green Gables and they didn't want her because she wasn't a boy. But it was morning and yes, it was a cherry tree in full bloom outside of her window. With a bound, she was out of bed and across the floor. She pulled up the sash. It went up stiffly and creakily as if it hadn't been opened for a long time, which was the case. And it stuck so tight that nothing was needed to hold it up. Anne dropped to her knees and gazed out into the June morning, her eyes glistening with delight. Oh, wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it a lovely place? Suppose she wasn't really gonna stay here. She would imagine she was. There was a scope for imagination here. A huge cherry tree grew outside, so close that its boughs tapped against the house, and it was so thick set with blossoms that hardly a leaf was to be seen. On both sides of the house was a big orchard, one of the apple trees and one of the cherry trees also showered over with blossoms and their grass was all sprinkled with dandelions. In the garden below were lilac trees, purple with flowers and their dizzily sweet fragrance drifted up to the window on the morning wind. Below the garden, a green field lush with clover sloped down to the hollow where the brook ran and where scores of white birches grew upspringing airily out of the undergrowth, suggestive of delightful possibilities in ferns and mosses and woodsy things generally. But it was a hill, green and feathery with spruce and fir. There was a gap in it where the gray gable end of the little house she had seen from the other side of the lake of shining waters was visible. Off to the left were the big barns and beyond them, away down over green sloping, low sloping fields was a sparkling blue glimpse of sea. Off to the left, or excuse me, Anne's beauty loving eyes lingered on it all, taking everything in greedily. She had looked on so many unlovely places in her life, poor child, but this was as lovely as anything she had ever dreamed. She knelt there lost to everything but the loveliness around her until she was startled by a hand on her shoulder. Marilla had come in unheard by the small dreamer. It's time you were dressed, she said curtly. Marilla really did not know how to talk to the child and her uncomfortable ignorance made her crisp and curse and curt when she did not mean to be. Anne stood up and drew in a long breath. 
Oh, isn't it wonderful, she said, waving her hand comprehensively at the good world outside. It's a big tree, said Marilla, and its blooms great, but the fruit don't amount to much. Never, small and wormy. Oh, I didn't, don't just mean the tree. Of course, it's lovely. Yes, it's radiantly, radiantly lovely. It blooms as if it meant it. But I meant everything, the garden and the orchard and the brook and the woods and the whole big dear world. Don't you feel as if you just loved the morning world on, or if you, <laughs> don't you just feel as if you just loved the world on a morning like this? and I can hear the brook laughing all the way up here. Have you ever noticed what cheerful things brooks are? They're always laughing. In the winter time, I've heard them under the ice. I'm so glad there's a brook near Green Gables. Perhaps you think it doesn't make a difference to me when you're gonna not keep me, but it does. I shall always like to remember that there is a brook at Green Gables, even if I never see it again. If there wasn't a brook, I'd be haunted by the uncomfortable feeling that there ought to be one. I'm not in the depths of despair this morning. I never can be in the morning. Isn't it a splendid thing that there are mornings? But I feel very sad. I've just been imagining that it really, it was really me you wanted after all, and that I was to stay here forever and ever. It was a great comfort while it lasted. But the worst of imagining things is the time that comes when you have to stop and that hurts. You better get dressed and come downstairs and never mind your imaginings said Marilla, as soon as she could get a word edgewise. Breakfast is waiting. Wash your face and comb your hair. Leave the window up and turn your bedclothes back over the foot of the bed. Be as smart as you can. Anne could evidently be smart to some purpose, for she was downstairs in 10 minutes time. With her clothes neatly on, her hair brushed and braided, her face washed in a comfortable consciousness pervading her soul that she had fulfilled all of Marilla's requirements. As a matter of fact, however, she had forgotten to turn back her bedclothes. I'm pretty hungry this morning, she announced as she slipped into the chair that Marilla placed for her. The world doesn't seem such a howling wilderness as it did last night. I'm so glad it's a sunshiny morning, but I like rainy mornings real well too. All sorts of mornings are interesting, don't you think? You don't know what's gonna happen throughout the day. And there's so much scope for imagination. But I'm glad it's not rainy today because it's easier to be cheerful and bear up under affliction on a sunshiny day. I feel that I have a good deal to bear up under. It's very well to read about sorrows and imagine yourself living through them heroically, but it's not so nice when you really have to come through them, is it? For pity's sake, hold your tongue, said Marilla. You talk entirely too much for a little girl. Thereupon, Anne held her tongue so obediently and thoroughly that the continued silence made Marilla rather nervous. In, as if the presence of something not exactly natural. Ma Matthew also held his tongue, but this at least was natural, so that the meal was a very silent one. As it progressed, Anne became more and more abstracted, eating mechanically with her big eyes fixed unswervingly and unseeingly on the sky outside the window. This made Marilla even more nervous than ever. She had an uncomfortable feeling that while this odd child's body might be there at the table, her spirit was far away in some remote airy cloudland, borne aloft on the wings of imagination. Who would want such a child about the place? Yet Matthew wished to keep her, of all uncountable things. Marilla felt that he wanted just as much that he wanted it just as much this morning as he had the night before, and that he would just go on wanting it. That was Matthew's way, take a whim into his head and cling to it with the most amazing silent persistency, a persistency 10, more, ten times more potent and effectual in its very silence than if he had been talked out of it. When the meal was ended, Anne came out of her reverie and offered to wash the dishes. Can you wash dishes right? Asked Marilla distrustfully. Pretty well. I'm better at looking after children though. I've got so much experience at that. It's such a pity you haven't any hair for me to look after. Well, I don't, want, I don't feel as if I wanted any more children to look after than I've got at present. You're a problem enough in all conscience. What's to be done with you, I don't know. Matthew is the most ridiculous man. 
I think he's lovely, said Anne reproachfully. He is so very sympathetic. He didn't know, he didn't mind how much I talked. He seemed to like it. I felt that he was a kindred spirit as soon as I ever saw him. You're both queer enough, if that's what you mean by kindred spirit, said Marilla with a sniff. Yes, you may wash the dishes, take plenty of hot water, and be sure you dry them well. I've got enough to attend to this morning, for I'll have to drive over to White Sands in the afternoon and see Mrs. Spencer. You'll come with me and we'll settle what's to be done with you. After you've finished the dishes, go upstairs and make your bed. Anne washed the dishes deftly enough, as Marilla, who kept a sharp eye on the process, discerned. Later, she made her bed less successfully, for she had never learned the art of wrestling with a feather trick. But it was done somehow and smoothed down, and then Marilla, to get rid of her, told her she might go out of doors and amuse herself until dinner time. Anne flew to the door, face alight, eyes glowing. On the very threshold, she stopped short, wheeled about, and came back and sat down by the table, a light with a glow as effectually blotted out as if someone had clapped an extinguisher on her. What's the matter now? demanded Marilla. I don't dare go out said Anne in a tone of martyr relinquishing all earthly joys. If I can't stay here, it's no use in my loving Green Gables. And if I go out there and get acquainted with all those trees and flowers and the orchard and the brook, I'll not be able to help loving it. It's hard enough now, so I won't make it any harder. I want to go out so much. Everything seems to be calling me, Anne, Anne, come out to us. Anne, Anne, we want a playmate, but it's, I, it's better not. There's no use loving things if you have to be torn from them, is there? And so hard to keep from loving things, isn't it? That's That was why I was so glad when I thought I was going to live here. I thought I'd have so many things to love and nothing to hinder me. But that brief dream is over. I am resigned to my fate now, so I don't think I'll go out for fear I'll get unresigned again. What is the name of that geranium? Or that geranium on the windowsill, please. Well, that's the apple scented geranium. Oh, I don't mean that sort of name. I mean just a name you give it yourself. Didn't you give it a name? May I give it one then? May I call it, let's see, Bonnie would do. May I call it Bonnie while I'm here? Oh, do let me. Goodness, I don't care. But where on earth is a sense of name is where on earth is the sense of naming a geranium? Oh, I like things to have handles, even if they're only geraniums. It makes them seem more like people. How do you know if, but that it hurts a geranium's feelings just to be called a geranium and nothing else? If you wouldn't like to be called nothing but a woman all the time. Yes, I shall call it Bonnie. I named the cherry tree outside my bedroom window this morning. I called it Snow Queen because it was so white. Of course, it won't always be in blossom, but one can imagine that it is, can't one? I never in all my life saw or heard anything to equal her, muttered Marilla, beating a retreat down the cellar after potatoes. She is kind of interesting, as Matthew says. I can feel already that I'm wondering what on earth she'll say next. She'll be casting a spell over me, too. She's cast it over Matthew. That look he gave me when he went outside said everything he said or hinted last night all over again. I wish he was like other men and would just talk things out. A body could answer back, then argue with him into reason. But what's done is done with a man who just looks. Anne had relapsed into reverie with her chin on her hands and her eyes on the sky when Marilla returned from her cellar pilgrimage. There Marilla left her until early dinner was on the table. I suppose I can have the mare and buggy this afternoon, Matthew, said Marilla. Matthew nodded and looked wistfully at Anne. Marilla intercepted the look and said grimly, I'm going to drive over to White Sands and settle this thing. I'll take Anne with me and Mrs. Spencer will probably make arrangements to send her back to Nova Scotia at once. I'll set your tea out for you and I'll be home in time for the, to milk the cows. Still, Matthew said nothing and Marilla having sense of wasted words and breath. There is nothing more aggravating than a man who wouldn't talk back unless it is a woman who won't. Matthew hitched the sorrel onto the buggy in due time, and Marilla and Anne set off. Matthew opened the yard gate for them, and as they drove slowly through, he said to nobody in particular, as it seemed, 
little Jerry Boat from the creek was here this morning, and I told him I'd guess I'd have I'd hire him for the summer. Marilla made no reply, but she hit the unlucky sorrel with such a vicious clip that the whip of with the whip that the fat mare, unused to such treatment, whizzed indignantly down the lane at an alarming pace. Marilla looked back once as the buggy bounced along and saw that aggravating Matthew that aggravating Matthew leaning over the gate, looking wistfully after them. Chapter five, Anne's history. Do you know, said Anne confidentially, I've made up my mind to enjoy this drive. It's been my experience that you can never uh, um, always enjoy things if you make up your mind firmly that you will. Of course, you must take make it up very firmly. I'm not going to think about going back to this asylum while we're having our drive. I'm just going to think about the drive. Oh, look, there is one little early wild rose out. Isn't it lovely? Don't you think it must be glad to be a rose? Wouldn't it be nice if roses could talk? I'm sure they could tell us such lovely things. And isn't pink the most bewitching color in the world? I love it, but I can't wear it. Redheaded people can't wear pink, not even in imagination. Did you know of anybody whose hair was as red when she was young, but got to be another color when she grew up? No, I don't know that I ever did, said Marilla mercilessly, and I shouldn't think it likely to happen in your case either. Anne sighed. <sighs> well, there's another hope gone. My life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. That's a sentence I read in a book once, and I say it over to comfort myself whenever I'm disappointed in anything. I don't see where the comforting comes from it myself, said Marilla. Why, because it sounds so nice and romantic, just as if I were a heroine in a book, you know? I am so fond of romantic things, and a graveyard full of buried hopes is about as romantic a thing as one can imagine, isn't it? I'm rather glad I have one. Are we going across the Lake of Shining Waters today? We are not going over Barry's Pond, if that's what you mean, with your Lake of Shining Waters. We're going by the shore road. Well, a shore road sounds nice, says Anne dreamily. Is it nice, is it nice as it sounds? Just when you said shore road, I saw a picture in my mind as quick as that. And White Sands is a pretty name too, but I don't like it as well as Avonlea. Avonlea is a lovely name. It sounds just like music. How far is it to White Sands? It's five miles and you're evidently bent on talking. You might as well talk to some purpose by telling me what you know about yourself. Oh, what I know about myself isn't really worth telling, said Anne eagerly. If you'll only tell, let me tell you what I imagine about myself, and you'll think it ever so much more interesting. No, I don't want any of your imaginings. Just stick to the bald facts. Begin at the beginning. Where were you born, and how old are you? I was 11 last March, said Anne, resigning herself to bald facts with a little sigh. And I was born in Bolingbroke, Nova Scotia. My father's name was Walter Shirley, and he was a teacher in Bolingbroke High School. My mother's name was Bertha Shirley. Aren't Walter and Bertha lovely names? I'm so glad my aunt and my parents had such nice names. It would be real disgrace to have a father named, well, say, Jedediah, wouldn't it? Oh, I guess it doesn't matter what a person's name is as long as he behaves himself, says Marilla, feeling herself called upon to in inoculate a good and useful moral. Well, I don't know. Anne looked thoughtful. I read in a book once that a rose by any other name would sell, smell just as sweet, but I've never been able to believe it. I don't believe a rose would be as nice as if it was called a thistle or a skunk cabbage. I suppose my, falter, my father could have been a good man even if he had been called Jedediah, but I'm sure it would have been a cross. Well, my mother was a teacher in the high school too, but when she married my father, she gave up teaching, of course. A husband was enough responsibility. Mrs. Thomas said that, the, that they were a pair of babies and as poor as church mice. They went to live in a wincy, teeny little yellow house in Bolingbroke. I've never seen that house, but I imagined it thousands of times. I think it must have had honeysuckle over the parlor window and lilacs in the front yard and lilies of the valley just inside the gate. Yes, and muslin curtains and all the front windows. Muslin curtains give a house such air. I was born in that house. 
Mrs. Thomas says I was the homeliest baby she ever saw, so scrawny and tiny and nothing but eyes, but that my mother thought I was perfectly beautiful. I should think a mother would be a better judge than a poor woman who came in to scrub, wouldn't you? I'm glad she was satisfied with me anyhow. I would feel so sad if I thought I was a disappointment to her because she didn't live very long after that, you see. She died of a fever when I was just three months old. I do wish that she lived long enough for me to remember calling her mother. I think it would have been so sweet to say mother, don't you? And father died four days afterwards from the fever too. And that left me an orphan and folks were at their wits end. So Mrs. Thomas said what, she, what, what to do with me. You see, nobody wanted me even then. It seems to be my fate. Father and mother had both come from places far away and it was well known that they didn't have any relatives living. Finally, Mrs. Thomas said she'd take me, though she was poor and had a drunken husband. She brought me up by hand. Do you know if there's anything in being brought up by hand that ought to make people who are brought up that way better than other people? Because whenever I was naughty, Mrs. Thomas would ask me how I could be such a bad girl when she had brought me up by hand, reproachful like. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas moved away from Bowling Book to Marysville, when, and I lived with them until I was eight years old. I helped look after the Thomas children. There were four of them younger than me, and I can tell you they took a lot of looking after. And then Mr. Thomas was killed falling under a train, and his mother offered to take Mrs. Thomas and the children, but she didn't want me. Mrs. Thomas' aunt was at her wit's end, so she said, what to do with me. And then Mrs. Hammond from up the river came down, said she'd take me seeing as I was handy with children. So I went up the river to live with her in a little clearing among the stumps. It was a very lonesome place. I'm sure I could never have lived there if I hadn't had an imagination. Mr. Hammond worked a little sawmill up there and Mrs. Hammond had eight children. She had twins three times. I like babies in moderation, but twins three times in succession is too much. I told Mrs. Hammond so firmly that when the last pair came, I used to get so dreadfully tired carrying them about. I lived up the river with Mrs. Hammond over two years, and then Mr. Hammond died, and Mrs. Hammond broke up housekeeping. She divided her children among her relatives and went to the States. I had to go to the asylum in Hopetown because nobody would take me, and they didn't want me at the asylum either. They said they were overcrowded as it was. But they had to take me, and I was there four months until Mrs. Spencer came. Anne finished with another sigh of relief this time. Evidently, she did not like talking about her experiences in a world that had not wanted her. Did you ever go to school? demanded Marilla, turning the sorrel mail down the shore road. Not a great deal. I went a little the last year I stayed with Mrs. Thomas. When I went up river, we were so far from a school, I couldn't walk in, in in the winter, and there was vacation in the summer, so I could only go in the spring and fall. But of course I went while I was at the asylum. I can read pretty well, and I know ever so many pieces of poetry by heart. The Battle of Hohenlinden, in Edinburgh after Flutter, in Bingen on the Rhine, and lots of the Lady of the Lake and most of the seasons by James Thompson. Don't you just love poetry that gives you crinkly feeling all up and down your back? There's a piece in the fifth reader, The Downfall of Poland, that's just full of thrills. Of course, I wasn't in the fifth reader, I was only in the fourth, but the big girls used to lend me theirs to read. Were those women, Mrs. Thompson and Mrs. Hammond, good to you? Asked Marilla, looking at Anne out of the corner of her eye. Ooh, faltered Anne, her sensitive little face suddenly flushed scarlet embarrassment sat on her brow. Well, they meant to be. I know they just meant to be just as good and kind as possible. And when people mean to be good to you, you don't mind very much when they're not quite always. They had a good deal to worry them, you know? It's very tr trying having a drunken husband, you see. It must be very trying having twins three times in succession, don't you think? but I feel sure that they meant to be good to me. Marilla asked no more questions. Anne gave herself up to silent rapture over the shore road and Marilla guided the sorrel abstractedly while she pondered deeply. Pity was suddenly stirring in her heart for the child. What a starved, unloved life she had had. 
a life of drudgery and poverty and neglect. And for Marilla was shrewd enough to read between the lines of Anne's history and divine the truth. No wonder she had been so delighted at the prospect of a real home. It was a pity that she had been sent back, that she had to be sent back. What if she, Marilla, should indulge Matthew's unaccountable whim and let her stay? He was set on it and the child seemed to be nice and a teachable little thing. Well, she's got too much to say, thought Marilla, but she might be trained out of that. And there's nothing rude or slangy in what she does. She is ladylike. It's likely her people were nice folks. The shore road was woodsy and wild and lonesome. On the right hand, scrubbed firs and spirits quite unbroken by long years of tussle with the gulf winds grew thickly. And on the left, there was a steep red sandstone uh, cliff so near the track in places that the mare, a mare of less steadiness than a sorrel, might have tried the nerves of the people behind her. But down at the base of the cliffs were heaps of surf-worn rocks or little sandy coves inlaid with pebbles as with the ocean jewels. Lay, beyond lay the sea shimmering in blue and over it soared the gulls, their pinions flashing silvery in the sunlight. Isn't the sea wonderful, said Anne, rousing from a long wide-eyed silence. Once when I lived in Marysville, Mr. Thomas hired an express wagon and took us all to spend the day at the shore 10 miles away. I enjoyed every moment of that day, even if I had to look after the children all the time. I lived it over in happy dreams for years. But this shore is nicer than the Marysville shore. Aren't those gulfs, those gulls splendid? Would you like to be a gull? I think I would. That is, if I couldn't be a human girl. Don't you think it would be nice to wake up at sunrise and swoop down over the water and away out of that lovely blue all day? And then at night, fly back to one's nest? Oh, I can just imagine myself doing it. What big house is that? Just ahead, please. Well, that's White Sands Hotel. Mr. Kirk runs it, but the season hasn't begun yet. There are heaps of Americans come there for the summer. They think the shore is just about right. I was afraid it might be Mrs. Spencer's place, said Anne mournfully. I don't want to get there. Somehow it will seem like an end to everything. Chapter six, Marilla makes up her mind. Get there they did. However, in due season, Mrs. Spencer lived in a big yellow house at White Sands Cove, and she came to the door with a surprise and welcome mingled with her benevolent face. Dear, dear, she exclaimed, you're the last folks I was looking for today, but I'm real glad to see you. You'll put your horse in, and how are you, Anne? I'm as well as can be expected, thank you, said Anne, smilelessly. A blight seemed to have descended upon her. I suppose we'll stay a little while just to rest the mare, says Marilla, but I promised Matthew I'd be home early. The fact is, Mrs. Spencer, there's been a queer mistake somehow, and I've come to over to see where it is. We sent word, Matthew and I, for you to bring us a boy from the asylum. We told your brother Robert to tell we, you we wanted a boy of 10 or 11 years old. Well, Marilla Cuthbert, you don't say so, said Mrs. Spencer in distress. Why, Robert sent word down by his daughter, Nancy, and she said you wanted a girl, didn't she, Flora Jane? Appealing to her daughter who had come down the steps. She certainly did, Miss Cuthbert, corroborated Flora Jane earnestly. I'm dreadful sorry, says Mrs. Spencer, and it's too bad, but it certainly wasn't my fault, you see, Miss Cuthbert. I did the best I could, and I thought I was following your instructions. Nancy is a terribly flighty thing. I've often had to scold her well for her heedlessness. Uh, it was our fault, said Marilla resignedly. We should have come to you ourselves and not left an important message to be passed along by word of mouth in that fashion. Anyhow, the mistake has been made and the only thing now is to, is to set it right. Can we send the child back to the asylum? I suppose they'll take her back, won't they? I suppose so, said Mrs. Spencer thoughtfully, but I don't think it will be necessary to send her back. Mrs. Peter Blewett was up here yesterday and she was saying how much she wished to be sent, she'd sent by me for a little girl to help her. Mrs. Peter has a large family, you know, and she finds it hard to get help. Anne will be the very girl for her. I call it positively providential. Marilla did not look as though she thought providence had much to do with the matter. 
Fear was an unexpectedly good chance to get rid of this unwelcome orphan, but she did not feel grateful for it. She knew Mrs. Peter blew it only by sight of a small shrewdish face, face woman without an ounce of su uh, superfluous flesh on her bones. But she had heard of her, a terrible worker and driver, Mrs. Peter was said to be, and discharged servant girls told fearsome tales of her temper and stinginess and her family of pert, quarrelsome children. Morella felt a qualm of conscience at the thought of handing Anne over to her tender mercies. Well, I'll go in and we'll talk the matter over, she said. Well, and if there isn't Mrs. Peter coming up the lane this blessed minute, exclaimed Mrs. Spencer, bustling her guests through the hall into the parlor, where a deadly chill struck them as if the air had been strained so long through the green, dark green closed blinds that it had lost every particle of warmth that it had ever possessed. This is real lucky, for we can settle this matter right away. Take the armchair, Miss Cuthbert, and Anne, you sit here on the ottoman and don't wiggle. Let me take your hats. Flora Jane, go out and put the kettle on. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blewett. We were just saying how fortunate it was you happened along. Let me introduce you to ladies. Mrs. Blewett, Miss Cuthbert, please excuse me for just a moment. I forgot to tell Flora Jean to take the buns out of the oven. Mrs. Spencer whisked away after pulling up the blinds. Anne, seated, sitting mutely on the ottoman with her hands clasped tightly in her lap, stared, Mrs. Blewett as one, stared at Mrs. Blewett as one fascinated. And I think that's the end of my half an hour of reading. If you haven't read it before, go ahead and take it out of the library. We have several copies of Anne of Green Gables. And again, that was from Lucy Maud Montgomery or L.M. Montgomery, as she's more often known as. So, Bo, are you ready to take over? Bo's going to be doing some musical stylings, I think. Uh, sure. Let's see if this all works. Yeah. Because <laughs> I totally haven't been just putting this together, um, trying to mix audio in the last 20 minutes or so. <laughs> so I'll flip over if I can grab the video. Sure. Well, it looks good. I can see it. <laughs> OK, um, cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining the uh, UTC Library live stream for Reading Day. Um, hoping that um, everything's um, been going super copacetic for you um, with all the programming and just in general getting through the semester for folks who are graduating. Congratulations for finishing the degree. Um, I'm Bo, and um, like I said, we're going to see if this uh, actually sounds good. Um, had some kind of audio trouble this morning. So this might be a really short session. Um, what I brought with me today, uh, a couple of um, devices from the Moog company. So um, what we have here is um, a couple of devices on a little stand here. Um, starting at the bottom, I've got the uh, drummer from another mother or DFAM. Um, which is um, kind of a percussive synthesizer, uh, does a lot of percussive sounds really well. And then uh, partnering that with another Moog device, the Mother 32. So, um, and this will do kind of basses and leads. It's kind of just a single synth voice. So um, otherwise in the case, we've got some other modular bits and bobs. We probably won't um, mess with them much today. And like I said, this may just be a short, <laughs> A short demo and we'll put up the technical difficulty sign. Um, we'll see, but um, I'll uh, try to keep my uh, comments or eyes on the comments if there's any issues here. So uh, I guess without further ado, we'll try and uh, get some music going. So I'm going to pop the mic down and uh, hopefully you're hearing something.
And as I'm seeing in the comments, uh, we're getting no synthesizer noise. Apparently my mic is coming through just fine, but uh, that's the part that uh, I don't think we want to hear. I think uh, our friends in the studio are going to help me out here and just put up a card that says uh, we're going to uh, move on. Uh, we're probably just, uh, yeah, maybe today wasn't the day. All right. Hey, there we go. We're going to uh, carry on with the live stream. <laughs> um, thanks for tuning in. Sorry. Couldn't deliver. Technical issues, as always, right? Good luck wrapping up with your finals. And uh, thanks for tuning in. We've got uh, programming that uh, will hopefully come through all afternoon. And I think we're going into the evening. So we've got all kinds of stuff happening. More crafts, more cooking, more fun. I'm gonna put myself down. Uh, I will say, um, in addition to showing off our hobbies, um, we are available this week. If you need help wrapping up, last minute consultations, having trouble accessing something you need access to. Is this online? UTC.edu slash library and find all of our uh, consultation services available. Chat with us anytime we're open. Call us. Email us. All that stuff's still working, as far as I can tell. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks to the studio for uh, putting this uh, putting this together. Uh, hanging with us. I'll pop myself down and uh, let everyone move on with their days. So uh, stay with us. Uh, live stream will continue here around uh, 1.30. And if you uh, have any questions, you know where to find us. UTC.edu slash library. And I'm paying attention to the YouTube chat. So feel free to drop us a line there.
Can you hear me now? Hopefully you can. Yes, 100%. Thanks, Yuri. All right, yeah, no problem. All right, so I might have started a little earlier, but I just want to make sure everything was set up correctly. And uh, this is going to be going over how to craft with thread, or at least crafting with thread. And what I'll be doing is adding tassels, got two different colors, to the bottom of uh, each of these pens. I probably will not complete all of these. Uh, within that amount of time, because with the tassels, I have to make sure I have so many um, strands hanging off at the bottom for it to look full. And that actually takes some time. All right, so let me see if this looks okay without the light. Hopefully it does. And what I'll first do is, oh, well, I'll also go over what I have here. So these are, Enamel pins, they're hard enamel, meaning that when they're created, they are filled with that uh, enamel or ink or whatever, and then are heated to um, a high temperature so that once they're done, the surface is fairly flat and smooth. If it was soft enamel, then you could kind of see the infill and the metal piece would be uh, sticking out a bit more. But yeah, this is what I'm working with. And I also have a, I believe this is a crochet needle or um, either way, uh, or knitting needle, something like that. Either way, it's got a tiny hook right here. Maybe you can see it. And with this, I will be uh, pulling out certain strands from the top when I'm close to done with a piece. I also have some scissors. And then the thread right here, I believe this is a size 10 thread. And then this is just a flat piece of plastic. And what this will be doing is uh, include the spacing for that thread that I'll be wrapping around. Now, there's actually different ways that you can create tassels, but for my specific situation, I also have to loop it through this tiny hole at the bottom of the uh, pin. You might not necessarily have the same type of situation as I do, but with this, um, it does add a little more difficulty to it because normally you could just wrap thread around any flat piece of cardboard or plastic or anything like that and then you would be able to tie it off quickly but because there is a small area that you do have to work with uh, that does take a little more time than usual so i'll go ahead and start with this part and what i'm doing is i am pulling out some of the thread about two arms lengths I'm a fairly shorter person. So um, if you're tall or have a wide arm span, then you might not need that much thread. But in my case, I do. And let me also move some of these to clear the space so you can focus on this one. And maybe I have it lined up correctly. And then what I'll do next is, oh, hold on. All right, so what I'll do next is take the one end of that strand and loop it through this hole uh, from the back. And now that I have that out like that, I'm going to situate it so that I can hold onto it with one hand, pull this kind of tight, and then place, I guess I'll call it a divider or something, right underneath. And this is the fun part because I'm working with a long piece of string or thread, it is very easy to um, get this knotted up. So you kind of have to be careful until you reach closer to the end or halfway point uh, to make sure that it won't. So now I'm going to thread this through and I grabbed it uh, on the other side. Sometimes it might be a little difficult to grab. And now I'm just going to loop it through and you can see where it's easily trying to bunch up. 
So what I'm going to do is also hold the back of it with the finger and then gently try to untangle it as I continue pulling. So with this, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, some people might not enjoy this process because again, it's super easy to get it tangled. And then after it gets tangled, it does take another moment to try to undo the knots. If it's too tight, you might actually have to cut that piece off and then tie on another piece to continue where you left off. So that was the whole process to do one strand. Now we get to do this all over again. So with this process, it's a little time consuming. So one good way to continue doing this while passing the time would be watching a series or just have YouTube playing in the background, possibly what you're currently doing right now. And that's fine. And then, oh, you can see <laughs> all of that just comes sliding through with that. So I'm just going to go ahead and untangle that. Luckily, these are all loose strands, so it's not going to take too long to untangle. And where did that thread go? Oh, okay, now I see. All right. Oh, and uh, the pins that I have with me today are based off of Japanese folklore. The last time we did a stream, I was actually illustrating one of the designs. This one is based off of a vengeful spirit called uh, Onryo. And then the other one, which is that green with antlers, this is based off of a Kirin. Uh, it's both fairly common in um, Eastern Asian folklore. So in China and Japan, um, that one's fairly common. And when I originally made these, I sketched them out on a piece of paper. Oh, let me put this down for a second. And then I went into Illustrator and created vector art for it so that it will be easy to scale and um, get ready for production. And also got to do some color matching with Pantone colors. So all of that is a very fun process. I'm sure you can't really tell uh, based off of the size of this, but there's actually screen printing on this as well. And that's a whole other process. And that's because some of the sections on the actual pen, um, to add that extra detail, there's like little scuff marks on this fella. Um, the black scuff marks like on the horn of his helmet, as well as the fill color right there and a few other spaces actually have that screen printing because if I tried to use metal or infill color, uh, that would actually cause it to lose that quality and kind of be uh, a bit larger or wouldn't be able to retain that detail work. All right, so now going on to the next strand. Again, this is a very, very lengthy process. Also, if you feel like you can't grab it on the first go, just make sure that you have enough space and the other strands are pulled tightly. And loop through and you can push a little extra thread through there like so. And I realize that I'm going much slower and that's because I wanna make sure that I'm able to talk while going through this process. And I'm actually just going to pull that piece all the way through instead of untangle in the middle. All right, so if you ever lose count, especially for my case, because I'm talking in between all of this, what you can do is actually just use a thumbnail or something to go through and count the strands. So this is just three right now. Four, if you're including the one I'm still holding on to. And let me move these scissors because it really likes to catch on that piece of thread. All right, now the next piece. I actually have a few other designs for this, but I wanted to go through and do these for today. And each of them 
have a different color associated with them as well as their own colored thread. I think my favorite right now is the red one, which was the main one I wanted to create a concept for. Just untangling. Hopefully this will not catch. If it does, I can show you how you can untangle. This is a loose tangle. Hopefully you can see that. So instead of trying to pull it through because that can actually make a knot and worsen uh, the situation, just gently twist and undo and now it's gone. A lot of these knots, if you ever get them while doing this, occur just because it's um, not necessarily already tied in a knot, but it's just that there's so many loops that when you pull, it could easily uh, situate itself uh, to create a knot. So just remember, when in doubt, don't keep pulling the way that you were. Just take some time and uh, gently undo any of those strands. All right. So going on to the next one. Ooh. 10 minutes have already passed and I'm not even halfway through this. I feel like talking really slows me down, but let's see how far we can get with just this one. I was hoping to get two done so that you could see what they both look like once they're complete. I usually try to do 25 rounds or more just so that uh, the tassel will actually be a bit thicker and look nice rather than it being too thin. Um, originally, when I was trying to get these done, I had uh, talked to a manufacturer that was wanting to work with me with creating the tassels. And uh, after they confirmed, they ended up just taking a thick piece of string and wrapping it twice onto the loop and tying it off. That was not a tassel, so that's why I decided to learn how to hand make tassels for myself. And that kind of taught me how to be a bit more resourceful and that if you have to, you can also just pick up and learn something new. All right. And also with these, since they're blanks, you could also do other things with them as well, such as if you liked two different designs, you could actually include a thin chain in between them. And I've noticed some people wear enamel pins on um, collars or lapels or things like that. I really hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> um, and then that chain kind of brings that together I personally might not use uh, these specifically. And also I didn't realize my arm was like way up there um, because these are a bit larger. They might look fine on like a jacket or something if they're connected with another one, but on a collar, it might weigh it down a bit too much. So maybe a half inch size for a pin or something would look much better and a little more lightweight on that type of fabric. There goes that one. So let's see if I can slowly, there we go. Oh. And then if it ever tries to loop up, you can just quickly and gently pull it down like that. So let's see how many we have now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, including the one I'm holding. All right, and then this will make 10. Oh, maybe I'll just hold on to that a little tighter. There we go. I also feel kind of partial to this one because purple is one of my favorite colors. And I really like the look of uh, purple and gold with black as well on there. Also, because uh, Pantone colors might not always match whenever you're um, looking at it on a monitor, if you're having to create something using Pantone colors, be sure to get swatches 
so that you can have a physical version on you so you'll know what to anticipate because you could be expecting a certain color uh, based off of what you see on your computer screen. But when you get it in person, the colors might be a little off because every monitor is different and it could have had more warm or cool colors associated with your particular screen. And then also with that is the color of the thread that you'd be working with because they are much more limited in color compared to Pantones. I believe with this, it was a solid Pantone swatch. swatch. And if you're ever working with creating pins like these, it's easier to go back and correct a color uh, compared to correcting the overall design that's intended to be metal. And that's because these pins are based off of a stamp, I believe, or a mold, that's it. And because of that, it's made out of metal. So the process is a bit longer and more difficult to go back and correct. If you do have to correct something, you'll have to create a whole new mold for that design. There are some workarounds um, depending on the color that you choose. So if you did a uh, black enamel or something, you'd be able to actually go through and do a screen print over your uh, pen so that it could kind of emulate that type of metal color. So that could actually save some time. I feel like I have all of this enamel pen creation knowledge just inside of my brain that I'm just spewing out. So if this is unrelated to anything you do, I am so sorry. <laughs> oh, another thing to be aware of is the posts on the back of enamel pins. Usually um, people are used to just seeing one perhaps, but you do have the option to get two. So after I loop this through, I'll turn this around and show you. So this actually has a back stamp. I don't know if you can see it very well or not. And it also has two posts. I also like rubber clutches, though they're not necessarily everyone's favorite. And sometimes it doesn't look like these are. It's usually more important if you're using um, post, only one post on the back of a pen. There's sometimes a really small um, claw or tooth or something right there. And that's supposed to help prevent a pen from shifting around on clothes. But when you have two posts like this, it might not necessarily be necessary because that's kind of the whole purpose of the two is to make sure that it'll be situated correctly wherever you decide to place one. All right. Now let me get back to holding this and let's see how far we've gotten now. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 with the one I'm holding. All right, and this will make 15. So for the next little bit, I'll see if I can just speed up this process. Because again, while talking and trying to make sure none of this um, it's tangled, that makes me go a little slower. And I just wanna make sure that I can at least complete one of these. So that was 15 and then here's 16. If you ever have the issue of it not threading through completely, you can also check the edge of that or the end piece of the thread. And if it's a little frayed, you can just go ahead and Clip that off and that should freshen that one up. I try not to cut off too much because I'd rather have more than less in case I would have to thread this through a few more times or if I accidentally uh, made this short to begin with. So this is 16. And now here's 17. If 
this would stay through there. All right, and this one might have a little bit of, oh, okay, this one's actually good. So as you continue working on these, um, you're less likely to have knots uh, appear in the thread. So this is good. Okay, that was 17, yeah. And here's 18. Ah, come on, buddy. All right, there we go. And I like to feel the metal piece like kind of click into place on top of that. It kind of balances on top and it's a little easier to hold. And when it gets to this point, you can actually hold on to the thread down here instead of the actual uh, hard enamel. Is this 18 or 19? When I talk, I lose count. Okay, let's see. I'll just keep going for a bit. Because again, if I get more than less, that's completely fine. All right, so now I can go a little faster. So apparently Chattanooga will be having a convention for pop culture, uh, like a pop culture con this weekend. And my spouse reminded me of that. So I don't know if anyone was aware of it or will be going, but either way, I thought that was fun. All right, and this. Now I'm able to go a little faster. Also, if you're ever having trouble grabbing the thread when it goes through the hole from the back, it might be because of the, um, the clutch right there. So feel free to remove one if you ever have to go through with this and it does get in the way. All right, so let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Ooh, that was a lot. 15, 16, I believe that's either 22 or 23, but I'm just gonna go ahead and assume 22 so that I can move this more rather than less. Right. 23. Twenty-four, and 25. All right, so when you get to this point or when you think that you have enough thread on there, what I'm going to do is actually push this plastic piece out like so. And this is where you have to be careful because if you pull on any of these loose ones, it could easily um, mess up how this is supposed to be situated. So I'm actually going to take the long one and start going around while holding onto that piece tight. So after I've done that a few times, and it looks okay at the front, I'll take the smaller loose strand, make sure that I can flip it going in the opposite direction of where I just wound that up and go from underneath and over that first piece. I a little tight and I also wanna check one more time if this looks okay. All right, and then do that one more time underneath and over. Cool. All right, so now I'm actually going to clip this off. 
still give it a little extra just in case. And one thing that you can also do, um, there's a couple of ways that you can kind of trim the rest off. And it's either by going this way and cutting or going into the loops and cutting this way. But before I even do that, I want to go ahead and hide these longer strands because if you look at it from the side, you can see that it kind of pokes out that way. And it'll be easy to tell uh, where that was tied off at. So what I'm going to do is take this, push it through to where it pops up through the other end, loop this through, and pull. And then I'll do the same for the other. All right, so now we have that hidden. And I'll go ahead and start cutting. Uh-oh, the lights went off because I'm not moving enough. Hold on one second. All right. And then if you ever feel like you might have missed a few strands, that's completely OK, because we'll be able to check in a moment. And we'll also cut, oh, I could feel that one. OK, we'll also cut going this way to make sure everything's kind of even. I also kind of pull back because whenever you cut lots of strands like that, they'll kind of try to push going that way. I'll also turn it the other way. Let's see another one that needs to be cut. There we go. And then just another time, just to be safe. All right. And now we have the tassel. And this one has about 50 or so strands. If you get uh, thinner pieces, hopefully you can see that. If you get Thinner strands, you can loop it uh, definitely over 100 times or 50 times, cut it, and then it's 100 or so strands. But for this size, I thought doing about 25 or more would be best uh, for this. So I have only three minutes left, so I'll go ahead and end it here. Thanks again for checking out this part of the stream, and hopefully you'll have fun watching. I believe tie dyeing is next. All right, so Bailey, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. Hey, Bailey, I don't think we can hear you. Yes, I, can you see me? Yes. You can? Am and I now I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hi. So I got a tie-dyeing kit today from Art Creation. Well, not today, but I have this tie-dyeing kit from Art Creations that is very, very fun and the first step was to just, can you see me now on the YouTube? Okay. So the first step was just to um, soak the shirts that I'll be dyeing in a ash mixture, which I, which I did beforehand just because it takes about 20 minutes to sit. 
And then I, I went ahead and showed what have one just like clumped up. And this is what it looks like when you um, put it, <laughs> twist it together. And so the way to get it scrunched is just to take take the center of the shirt and you just twist it. And as you do it, kind of feather your shirt along so that it goes nice and in a circle. Make sure that when you're doing this, you're doing it on a surface such as plastic or like for me, I'm doing it on a towel because um, the kit I'm using has a lot of chemicals and that's what most kits will use are just strong chemicals that you don't want ruining anything except for like a towel. <laughs> um, so then you take your rubber bands and just secure the shirt. I like to do this for shirts that have stains on them that can't really come out easily. And um, it just makes it, it's a fun way to just correct those errors that happen in life. So once you have, as the fun thing about it too is you can do as many or as little sections as you want. But once you have um, your rubber bands on, you take your dies and I have four. I have a yellow one, a bluish with a slight tur purple tint, a purple and a red. Um, the kit comes with blue, red and yellow, but it also comes with an extra to mix it with. And you take your dies and for this shirt, I'm going to use blue and purple with a little red and you just put it in your sections and you don't need a crazy amount just because you will be doing you're going to do each side so that's fully covered and I'm going to do it over here as well to get just a nice variation. Um, and then I'm going to take the blue. And just take it along kind of how you feel. Uh, I am a big fan of cool toned color schemes, which is why I tend to stick with blues and purples. Um, and then once you get it all in on one side, then just flip it over and repeat on the other side. And for this shirt, it looks like I didn't do a very good job with the rubber bands on both sides, but since it is the back, you can kind of make, make my own, make the own your own sections based off of where the front sections ended. Get an extra blue and I like to just add in a little extra on top 
make sure it just has a nice little pattern. So once the piece is dyed, take it into a plastic bag and it wraps up for about a day in which you wash it and you, um, once the piece is, sorry, once it finishes drying out for about a day in the plastic bag, you let it, you wash it out with cool water and then wash it in a washer or dryer with your um, just normal clothes. Um, and when you rinse it with cool water before washing it out, just make sure that the, all the dye comes out so that it doesn't, um, so that you don't bleed dye onto the, all of your other clothes. For this shirt, I have a, I don't know where this came from, but I have stains right here. So instead of doing it in the middle, like I did with the other shirt, I am going to just twist it at the top. And then twist it again on the other side. And I'm gonna redo that one just because it didn't work the way I wanted. So once I have both sides twisted up, I'll take my rubber bands again. And just doing this is just to give it a new type of pattern, um, just as a way to like, you know, kind of skip that traditional feathering and focus the dye in certain spots um, because the dye is gonna really concentrate in the middle area of where you scrunch up your shirt. And especially on those outer edges. So I just wanna make sure that it really covers um, the stains. So for this shirt, uh, it's been kind of getting messy in my last shirt's dye. So what I think I'm gonna do is use the yellow and the red and take the red on more the outer edges. Um, of where I tied it. And then put the yellow kind of in, oh, that's leaking. That's kind of sad, but put the yellow on the inside. And the fun thing is I'm not, um, the pattern will be kind of like, more of a surprise because you're taking a bit of a risk, but it's also going to it'll be fun. Come out interesting.
Let's put it over here. Just in between. And so that is how I did the front and just tried to put more of the yellow more towards the center and the red on the outside. So the red will be hopefully closer to the sleeves. I'm putting the darker color in the area of where I had those stains so that it's more likely to cover it. And then the yellow everywhere else. So I can still see the designs, the slight design that was on there previously. And so, once you have both sides again, once again, take it and just, I personally like to add spots just to add to that pattern and kind of see what it will do to the design. another one of those plastic bags make sure your piece your shirt is wrapped up and let it sit. Um, the kit says to let them sit for 12 to 24 hours. And I personally will probably do it on the longer end because um, it's always better to be safe rather than sorry with these things and to let them just um, really soak in the color if if it's it'll definitely come out brighter if you just let it sit longer and really absorb it um for actually putting the colors together they really only require um warm water and each bottle has instructions with how to mix them so for you fill them to the line with warm water um, and they're already filled with the chemicals that they require, which is super helpful. Um, eat, the kit that I'm using is called, I will find, this tie-dye kit and it, it is for multiple shirts because I like to do this quite often with, for if I need to sell an old shirt and wanna do something new to it. And so it's really handy just to have already the chemicals in there um, for, for you to just go ahead and mix um, the, and so this is the ash. Before I took these out, I had them soaking in this buckets with this ash mixture. And that is really just to get the chemicals working um, activated. I believe it like mix, it's what is used to like make sure they really mix into the clothes and actually like dye the piece of clothing. Um, it's also very fun to tie dye masks. We have found that it's 
it, it makes them much more fun. And it's a good little business project. If you ever need to make extra money, just go buy you one of these tie dye kits, get you some, get some masks and This one I did with less of a process and more just kind of combining the colors. And the thing is, it's also nice to check if when you're doing it, if it really is soaking in, going into the shirt because see like I missed many of the patches. And then once you have it covered, just it up. make sure that when doing this, you have gloves on. Luckily, this kit does. And I believe most, if you're gonna get a kit, um, most will come with gloves because uh, these, it's just, you're working with chemicals and they will dye your hands, which is not ideal. Um, so this one, rather than being one for stain, this is one I actually, white shirt I actually want to do a nice pattern with so going to be a little more precise with how I twist it um, start probably between rather than Closer to the bottom, probably start closer to the top. Make sure I got those. Have the sleeves wrapped in there. This time I will check where I'm putting it on each side. So make sure it's really getting secured in the spots I want it. And I'm going to move my towel over so not to get 
all of that dye on the shirt. And once again, I will go by section. And I am going take my blue again. And it's just going to be blue and purple this time. Um, and these two colors in this spiral would create that classic, um, if I were to use a rainbow pattern, that classic tie-dye um, spiral that you often see. And there's the front, and then I'll take it back over to the back. And what I'll probably do for the back is rather than, is kind of do opposite what I did on the front so that the colors meet with the, so the purple meets with the blue rather than the purple meeting with the purple. Except for that side. Might have made one mistake. And then take the blue. Mix, try to get that blue more closer to the purple. And I'm actually out of blue, so that's kind of unfortunate. And so I'll just finish off this shirt with my purple dye. And the good thing about for these bottles is that this particular bottle tells you how much of each color you need to mix. Um, into other colors. So told me how much red and how much blue I needed to make this purple, as well as green and orange. Um, and that way, um, you don't have to just stick with your classic primary colors. So um, that is my last shirt for today. Um, I'm excited to see how they all turn out. Um, and I am going to turn this over to whoever is next. Hi, Bailey. Thank you. Hey, Bailey, maybe um, you could take some pictures and we'll post them to our IT Instagram takeover so that we can see what they look like tomorrow or the next day. Sound good? Yes, I will for sure do that. Good, because we would love to see them when they're done. All right. So hello, everybody. It's Emily. I'm back um, and I'm having kind of a sock themed day as you've probably noticed as we go through what we're doing. Um, so this morning I showed you how to knit socks. Um, and today we're going to talk, or now we're going to talk about how to fix your socks. Um, so I I know there's a lot of conversations out there about sustainability and how um, what to do with fashion because 
there's a lot of plastic in our clothes and there's a lot of fast fashion and it's really difficult to kind of know how to keep things going, right? So um, I was inspired by another librarian that I know on Twitter. Her name's Nancy. I cannot remember her last name, but she's at Copyright Librarian. Um, very cool person. Um, but uh, she likes to mend things and I like to mend things. So um, we're gonna show you how to fix some socks. Um, so I'm gonna switch cameras real quick. Um, so I do um, have a sock that I've already fixed. Um, and you can see that like, and these are these are not expensive socks. They're cheap socks from Target, but I like them. And so therefore, because I have a thing for grays and navies. Um, so they're socks that I like. Um, so I'm trying to keep them going as long as I can. And that's one of the ways to be sustainable, sustainable is to try and fix the things that you've got um, rather than buying new. So um, you can see where there's a hole right here. Um, I have a pair of boots that this is where it wears out my socks. I love those boots, but this is their, this is their problem, these boots. Um, but you can see that I've um, made a patch and I've deliberately tried to make it visible because visible mending is a thing so that you can kind of see um, where it's been fixed and see the life of that particular garment. So um, that's what it looks like what we're going on. So you do need some specific tools. Um, what we're doing is called darning, um, which you have to make new fabric um, because the hole is where the fabric has been worn away. If you try and just sew it up, that um, will stretch and pull, make pressure on it. And if you just sew it up, you end up with a hole rather than a repair. Um, so tools, things that you need. First of all, you need scissors. Um, and whenever I do these live streams, I'm like, this is my grandmother's tool. These were my grandmother's scissors. Um, the needle was not hers, but it was from her stash of embroidery floss. Um, I like embroidery floss as a, as a darning tool because it comes in lots of colors um, and it works pretty well. It works better than regular sewing thread because you want it to be thicker. So um, embroidery floss comes in six strands. Um, so if you just kind of tap the end, they'll come apart and then you can pull them out. Um, I like to use three when I'm doing mending um, for no particular reason. Um, and that was always my grandmother's trick was to pull them out separately because then they get a little bit fuller. Um, so I'm going to put them together and thread my needle. Put all three threads through there and notice that I'm not going to double loop them. That's a great way to get tangles in your threads. So I'm just going to leave a tail there. Wrap it around three times to make a knot. Um, you don't always want knots in darning, just so you know, but um, I like them you know, do your thing. Um, so now I'm ready to go. And then this is possibly the most important tool. This is, um, again, from my grandmother's stash, this is called a darning egg. Um, and what this does is it stretches the fabric over it so that it'll kind of pull back together. So it'll be a little bit loose. And then when you're done, it gets um, tighter. Um, these are things, if you Google darning eggs, they're things that you can buy. They come, sometimes they look a little bit more like a mushroom than like an egg, but it's nice if they have this handle. Um, it's not really necessary. If you have any sort of tool or thing in your house that's kind of round and hard um, that you could pull the fabric over, it'll work. Um, when I look up m mending on the internet, it suggests a light bulb. That sounds fragile to me, um, but you could do it with an orange. Um, you could do it with a real egg, but I would recommend hard boiled. Um, but yeah, it just needs to be hard and a little bit round. Um, so here's my sock. You can see it has a hole in the same place as the other one, which is that pair of boots. Um, the first thing you do is you want to turn it inside out um, because you think that like you want it to look nicer on the outside, but you actually want it to look nicer on the inside because then it's smoother against your foot. Um, so we've got this little piece right here. Um, so it's actually two holes. I'm going to cut that out to make it one hole because that's a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so you just, you want it to be kind of nice and neat. And you can see how I'm stretching it over the darning egg. And then you get your thread out and I'm going to put the knot on the outside because um, I'm okay with it poking, not me um, on the outside. And then you just kind of start to weave things in and out of the fabric that you have. Um, and you want to start on 
um, make sure that I'm centered correctly. That's good. Um, and then go into the fabric that's there. So you're kind of anchored. Um, and you just kind of weave it in and out. Um, it's not as important right now for it to be perfect. But, um, but you see how I've left like a long thing there? That's the goal. You need that because what we're doing is we're making new fabric. And there's lots of ways you can do this. Like you can, once you've got your base stitches, you can do stitches that look a little bit more like knitting and I'm not as skilled at those, um, but you do want them to be very close together. So that's too far. So I'm gonna put another one here in the middle. Now that I think about it, I should not have done a gold on the brown darning egg, but you know, it'll work out in the end. My tail is going too far. And we're just gonna go. So I like to fix things um, because it's just, you give things a new life and they look different than other things, but they get a bit of a story with them. Um, and you can, you can fix holes over and over again. So like I've got a couple pairs of socks that actually have multiple darns in them. Um, but it makes it so that they are still usable because we throw away too many things. And um, like I've been seeing a lot of really interesting stuff about how you know polyester is plastic. So if you've got polyester in your clothes, um, they don't actually um, decompose in the landfill very well. And I should have had a longer piece of that. Um, so, this is just a way to make things last longer. And, um, and I get attached to socks, right? Like I'm, I'm actually pretty hard on my clothes because I'm in a hurry and silly. Um, so this is, this is a way for me to keep things going. Um, so we're just gonna keep going. And what we're doing is um, earlier today, I talked about knitted things and woven things. So these socks are knitted. Um, because they're stretchy and that's what we like for socks. But what we're kind of doing is we're putting a piece of woven fabric as a part of the, the sock. So it won't stretch as much, but it'll still um, hold together. And again, notice that I'm anchoring it in, in the part that doesn't have a hole because we're we're kind of, if you think, to be disgusting, if you think about the way that like your blood clots to form a scab, um, we're kind of doing the thread version of that to kind of close it up um, using very pretty thread. And, and now we're getting kind of into the part where it's not as damaged, but you can see, maybe you can see that there's a starting of a hole there. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit further if I can re-thread my, my needle. Um, this is the problem with the tails is sometimes, sometimes they want to come unthreaded um, to kind of help try to avoid that hole happening so that the hole won't get worse. Um, I'm gonna keep going over there. I was joking the other day that like, um, cause I've been growing a lot of fruit in my yard and during the zombie apocalypse, I'm gonna be the fruit and mending lady. I will fix your clothes and give you figs. Um, so I'm running out of thread. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of do some small knots here, nothing too fancy, um, just to kind of hold it down. Um, because, and I'm going into the fabric to kind of hold it down cause I don't want it to be too pokey on my heel. Um, but the way this works, it kind of melds itself a little bit. And if you have enough, then it'll be fine. Um, so, yeah. All right, so here we go. New piece of thread, new knot. And here we go. Um, all right, so as you can see here, 
we've got um, these little lines here. So we've, if you think of it in terms of like weaving, you've got the warp and the weft, and I cannot remember if it's the warp or the weft, but we've got the base lines there. So now we're gonna start weaving it back in. And so again, um, I'm gonna kind of start over here, um, kind of putting my needle through here so that knot will be on the outside and not touching my heel. Um, probably started too far back, but we're gonna just kind of start to do the same thing where we're bringing it through. And kind of just caught starting, starting the stitches so that they're well anchor, anchored in the sock. I started too far over, but you know, nobody's perfect. Um, and you know, it's a little bit decorative. So once I start to get here, I'm gonna to start to kind of weave things in and out so that we can um, make the new fabric. So I'm paying attention to where those other threads are and I'm weaving over and under them. And you don't have to be perfect. Um, it's, it's really impossible to be perfect, but you do want to try and alternate. Um, it'll, because that's what you're doing is you're making the fabric. Um, and again, you do want to push it into the part that's not broken, that's not a hole yet. Um, document camera's reversed so that you can, cause that's, um, that part isn't broken. So it's a good solid place to be. Um, so over, under, over, under, kind of weaving in here. And then we come back so that we can go under, oh, so we need to come back over, under this one, over, under, over, under, over, under. This is another one that's really good to do while you're watching TV, although this takes a little bit more brain for me than like knitting a stocking at, stocking at st stitch because you have to pay attention to where the threads are. No, no knots, no loops. Up. And then this time I want to come down and go under, over, under, over, under, over. Um, I get in loop at, let go of self. Um, I get in loops where I don't want to throw anything away. And so this, but it's better than having a bunch of holy socks, which are useless in your drawer to give them a new life. Um, so. You just kind of have to pay attention to it to see where it goes. And if you get off, you get off and you just kind of try and get it back the next time. And because I mean, who's really looking at your heel that hard, right? Because if people are looking that closely at your socks for something to criticize, well, then I think you're doing okay. Um, and so here, now that we're getting into more of the more of the hole, it's a little bit easier to see where my weaving threads are. Under. And like I said, it is important to kind of keep going and anchoring it down, even though it gets a little bit weirder and harder to see at these parts, um, because that's what holds it together. caught in other threads, but if you do, it's no big deal because nobody's looking at the heels of your socks. Um, 
So these socks originally came from Target. And I do want to be clear, they do still sell them. Um, so I'm going to kind of poke it down a little bit. But, you know, nobody's going to have socks quite like these socks once I get done with them. But I went in and fixed them and I was all excited because I could wear them again. And then the other one got a hole in it. So I had to like stop. Because if you wear socks with holes in it, your sock, your holes just get bigger. And then, you know, body parts poke out and it's weird. Um, I mean, if that's your aesthetic and you like it, go for it. But so you can see now that it's starting to kind of look a little bit more woven. And, and this egg is useful for this, um, for the stretching over of it, but also to help me catch the threads as I go. And I just, I, I in general have to be less perfect once I get into the part that's not the whole. Um, so it's making sure that we're in the camera. And I'm gonna kind of weave in and out. And I know that I need to start with an over, over, under. But is, at this point, it's starting to look a little bit like fabric. So I wish I'd done a few more rows of threads that would be a little bit tighter. But again, that's why we have the darning egg is to stretch it out so that it'll be more whole, more whole, W-H-O-L-E, not whole, H-O-L-E. Um, Again, going into the woven part or the knitted part to make sure that it stays um, and it's good and anchored. Got off my rhythm. So I'm just going to fix it and make sure that I'm correct going forward. There we go. And you can see that it's starting to look a little bit like a basket weave. Yeah, it's starting to look a little bit like a basket weave there. I don't know if you can see it, but it is. Um, and, you know, it depends on the socks. It depends on the shoes, how much more wear you're going to get from this. But if you're feeling like, I think we've all had those things where like, I really need new socks. I just don't feel like I can afford to pay for them. Um, this will keep your socks going for a little bit longer which is good in my opinion. Over, under. Oh. So this is the kind of skill that kind of, that came about because for the longest time, clothing was incredibly expensive. Um, so you would see, I mean, if you follow some of the fashion historians on Twitter, like clothes got used until they were literally into pieces. And then, and then the pieces got used as rags until they were completely gone because fabric was incredibly expensive um, until they figured out how to do machine weaving. Everything was done by hand. Um, so if you wanted a new shirt, you had to weave the fabric and cut it apart and sew it yourself. Um, it's actually considered quite the loving thing to make your husband's shirts, for example. And um, if you're interested in King Henry VIII, um, Catherine of Aragon, even after they were divorced, insisted upon wearing, making King Henry's shirts. Um, I guess Anne Boleyn wasn't as much of a seamstress as um, she was, but he let her. Um, so she was good enough at making shirts that he was like, yeah, sure, I'll wear that. Um, but again, if you think there's no machines, everything has to be done by hand. So these are, um, you can't just go down to Forever 21 and pick up another one. Um, so you use it until it falls to bits and then you use the bits for rags and then smaller rags, then use it for stuffing for your pillows um, until it's completely used up. And it's a nice, um, I get, I get into my, you know, cause I like fabric and I like to sew and it's kind of an expensive hobby. 
Nope. Enter. Over. Enter. Now we're getting kind of tight together. Um, it's an expensive hobby, but like the dyes get into the waters and um, making sure that at least I'm not buying things and just throwing them away really fast. Um, I'm gonna have to get a new piece of thread here in a minute. But you can see it's starting to close up and it's starting to look, um, it's not hidden, but if you wanted to, like if I had, um, I could have chosen threads that are closer to this gray and this navy and it would be a little bit more difficult to see, but it will always be there. Several knots here. Um, and if you're good, like I've, um, and you choose your thread, thread carefully and you choose um, how you patch it carefully, you can, you can make things almost invisible. Um, I had a pair, pair of pants that were kind of expensive. Um, they were Ann Taylor, um, which is expensive for me because I'm cheap. Um, and uh, I, a friend was visiting and I walked down the stairs of my apartment and was just like, hey, it's good to see you and fell on my knee and cut a hole in it. And so I, I fixed that hole Oh no! and wore those pants for um, another four or five years. What? I've tangled up my embroidery box. And it's all twisted. I need to get it back out. And I don't. And there's a certain point where, like, I talk about waste, but I might just cut it off. Let's we'll see where it goes. It's, there we go. Nope. Yep, totally just gonna cut that off. Because in the interest of time, I'd really like to get this fixed, and I have 14 minutes left. So we'll just keep going. I don't do a lot of cross-stitching anymore. So this is what I mainly use my embroidery floss stash for. And right now I'm busy making a mess of thread slightly off camera. You don't always have to lick your thread to get through the needle, but I am today. And now this is too long, so I'm gonna chop that off. You know, I have a red thread and I really wish that I'd chosen that because I think it would have shown up better on camera. So I apologize for that. And so we're about halfway done. Um, you can see how it's starting to close up. I'm gonna come back up here again to try and put the big knot on the outside. Get it into the thing and get back into our weaving. Um, and so you can see how once you get going, it can be pretty meditative where you're just like, okay, over, under, over, under, over, under. Um, yeah, so we're, so the studio has taken over the I, campus IT's Instagram and we're doing creativity hacks. And so, um, one of my creativity hacks is to do something like this um, because I find that it, um, Therese was talking about this with jigsaw puzzles as well, is it kind of relaxes your brain and gets it to the point where you can um, stop focusing on the one thing and open up the brain to those other things that you're actually trying to get to. So instead of circular thinking, you can, you can do mending thinking, which will get out of your brain and into what you want it to be into. Um, especially if I'm trying to write something, um, doing something like this will get my brain to kind of stop focusing on the fact that I have to write something and I don't like it and start focusing a little bit more on the actual ideas and how, how I want to articulate them. Um, and yes, I do do quite a bit of talking to myself when I'm doing stuff like this because it's um, me trying to work stuff out and trying to work out my argument because I'm more of a um, spoken person than a written person. So when I have to write, there's a lot of talking to myself that happens. And activities like this 
um, give me a chance to have a full on monologue with myself. Um, this is why I have a cat is so that I can pretend that I'm not talking to myself, that I'm talking to the cat who does not care about my library research. Um, she cares mostly about treats and jingle balls. Um, but, but something like this also gives me a chance to kind of either in my head and sometimes out loud because I live alone, so I can do that. Um, work through my arguments and get what I want so that when I actually go and try and get it on paper, I've got a nice foundation there um, and I've worked through it. Um, good idea to keep a notebook nearby because sometimes you come up with those perfect turns of phrase and then if you're me, you forget to write them down so that by the time you get back to your paper, you're like, ah, I said that really well. And now I don't remember how I said it. But um, there's also something about the movement and stuff like this that can help you remember it. So if you come back and start um, doing the thing again, it might come back. But here, we're almost done. You can see how the hole is almost closed. Um, we just have a few more. Um, and we are gonna go into the sock so that we can, um, Um, make sure that it's good and anchored, um, but we don't have to care as much about where the threads are and making sure that we alternate. But at the end of this, where I did not have a sock, I will have a sock. Well, I had a sock, but you know, a sock with a hole in it. How much of a sock is that? Over. And now we can just kind of do it a little bit more randomly because this part is still sock, sock, as opposed to hole, but hole in a sock. Um, but just kind of pulling things up, making sure it's good and anchored, making sure that um, this darn has been integrated into the fabric of the sock for good. And then again, I'm gonna tie my knots. Um, I'm just going through and doing a little knot um, to make sure that it doesn't come undone. And then I'm gonna cut it off. And take it out. Darning egg, once again, really useful tool. And now where there once was a hole, there isn't a hole anymore. Um, it's a nice solid um, thing. And you can see how it's all tightened up really well. So it was pretty loose before, but now um, it's tightened up and it, you know, if you, if you did this to match, then it would kind of hide, um, but that gets into something a little bit more skilled than what I do, but there you go. Fixed socks. So, um, and they kind of complement each other. Um, but yeah, and if you walk around without your shoes on, as I sometimes do, and people are like, what's up with your sock? You can say, I fixed it. Um, and now I get to use it for longer. Um, so we've got our two socks right there. Um, and the nice, and so that took me about a half an hour. Um, it takes a little bit of practice. I do have another pair of socks here, but I can't remember what's wrong with them. Yeah. So. I don't think, there's, oh, there's a tiny hole. So the sooner you get, um, it's easier to fix a tiny hole than it is to fix a bigger hole. So um, getting in there and fixing it before it gets um, too big, because I mean, we all have those days where I'm just like, oh, I don't have time. I'm just gonna wear the socks with a hole in it. Um, they're gonna be in shoes, nobody's gonna see. But um, if I were to wear this again, then this hole would definitely get bigger. Um, but now, but if I were to fix it, then um, it won't get bigger. Um, doesn't stop holes from happening because you know holes happen, but this way, once again, now I have another pair of socks that I can add to my stash and they're, you know, probably another six months out of getting into a landfill, possibly even a year because it's no longer boot weather. So I'm not wearing those boots anymore. Um, I have noticed that like, these are socks that I've worn with those boots and the darn um, tends to hold up against the boots a little bit better than the, um, the knit fabric that Target uses. Um, 
So yeah, but there they are. Big socks. Um, so, all right, well, it looks like Julian's here. Um, so I'm gonna let him get set up, but um, thank you very much for watching. And I am more than willing to tell you about sock darning, um, should you want to know. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Julian um, when he's ready. Very cool. I am already here and set up. All right. Hello, everybody. I think I am on the live stream properly. My name is Julian Cuevas with the Library Studio located on the third floor. And today we will be doing the joy of producing. I probably should have called it the beat gym because I'm about to do one of my exercises for y'all since we only have about half an hour. And so just uh, in short, what I'll be doing with our exercise today, I wanna make sure I'm fully in space. But what I'll be doing with our exercise today is I'm just going to be building a beat specifically from samples because I have a huge sample library that I don't uh, use typically very often because I like to create sounds from scratch. So now we're just going to hang out and I'm going to do some sound selections and make a beat from them. Right now I'm working on getting my preferences set up. Audio output. We want to do zoom audio device. Make sure we're tracking here. All right. Um, do to do. Gonna see if the sound's working. <laughs> sound. No. Okay. Give me just a second while I fish around. Zoom and sound work is uh, a little chaotic. So, <laughs> my for pro speakers. So that's going to be there. That's going to do it here. Let's see. Maybe, uh, I think just got to do some fishing. Okay, so um, select the microphone external headphones and um sir i'm about to change this sound setting and let me know if you can hear it okay um okay i've just changed the sound setting can you hear it still no okay so all right so now you can. Hmm. Um, core audio. Okay, let's try to reset the program. Do do do. Plugged in. headphones and let's hope this works because I've had sound problems before with the live stream as well so let's see preferences okay. because it is Definitely allowing you to hear it, but not me to hear it. Maybe if I, let's see if I can share, share sound. Aha, okay. I think we're good. Can you hear that, Sarah? Because I can hear it as well. Aha, yay. We did it and just at three o'clock. Cool. So uh, essentially, let's get it rolling. Um, I don't need the Met too much because I'm going to find a drum groove first. Uh, let's see what I got. Do, 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 drums. 
I want some full. Nah, don't need the do to do. Let's see, lander. Take this up a little. All right, I like that one. Cool. And so what I, a lot of what I'm doing right now, this is a practice in compositional awareness and production. This isn't overcomplicating it, feeling like you have to create all the sounds yourself. This is just jamming, having fun, creating something, because it's like a composer kind of role where I've got samples from producers across the world, instruments from across the world, and I get to put them into my own digital audio workstation and make something from it and have a good time. All right, so it looks like we're in the key of F sharp minor. So that's why I'm gonna be looking for samples.
on my scale here. Not quite the blue I'm looking for, I don't think. It's just like my favorite one. CPU is clocking up. Excuse the CP as it's CPU as it's glitching out. I'm gonna go ahead and save this because this is actually really cool and I don't want to lose it. All right, so in the night I got a mess going on. This beat gym 2021. All right, so let's listen to what we got. nice and somber. All right, that sounds really cool. Let's see. Just grooving and added in MIDI. Take my hand off the MIDI key there. Okay, well, it looks like it's about time to get compositional. So I'm going to put my MIDI keyboard off to the side. Did great with that. Make sure I don't knock out my hard drive. Okie dokie. So let's get it started. Uh, when I go to compose, especially in the beat gym, I just have some standard 16-bar 
hook or 16 bar verses, eight 16 bar hooks, and I like to colorize everything and name it. So let's go. We got drum break. We've got the 808 right here. I'm really happy this 808 lined up easily because it is hard sometimes to find an 808 sample that's just going to meld. Usually you got to create it with the track because it's uh, a little difficult to get uh, the bounce of an 808 without the melody being in place. Just in my opinion though. So we got lead, we got flute. All right, and then we just got these cool spacey strings. All right, and now I'm gonna colorize everything. This will be like, uh, my favorite color is black, so I just really color code it hard. All right, so we're gonna drag this out over here, and then let's see what we want to kind of be our intro here. And with the beat gym, it's like I try to think as little as possible because I'm just here practicing. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> my little loop tool.
so cool. Honestly, I, I just don't know if I'm... Let's see. Okay, we're getting somewhere. I think some quick transitions in the last 10 minutes. Can we do it? Uh, I think so. I love this little beat too. And we'll save over here for an outro.
concussion Phil that's okay let's listen to it again Well, I'm going to play it through one time and then I'm going to turn this over to Erica as she is getting ready. And uh, this will conclude the joy of producing. So I'll just play it through one more time. I think my sound card gave out. Hold up. Sure did. Uh, well, you know what? That's okay because we got it done. And uh, there is not much I can do about that at the moment. That would take restart and everything, which will take a few moments anyway. And so I would like to thank everyone for watching if you tuned in. This was a pretty cool and productive 30 minutes, but definitely practice maybe beat gymming it up because. You never know what you're going to be able to make. And remember that this is in the spirit of collaboration and that as a producer, you are also a composer and you do not need to know how to play every instrument. You do not need to know everything about music production and create everything from scratch to be a good music producer and to be a valid music producer. Uh, the world and art is collaboration and I strongly encourage it. And I hope you all have a lovely day and I'm going to get out of here and hand it over to Erica when she is ready. Hey everyone. All right, looks like we are live here at the unboxing of Asian food snacks from the Asian gift store. I've got a lot going on, probably too much going on. <laughs> um, and I'm babysitting some dogs right now too. So this is, just guaranteed to be fun. All right. Make sure you guys can see a little bit of everything.
All right, so I've got a lot of snacks here today to try. Um, I'm outside, so you're gonna be hearing some birds and stuff as well. I've got some toys to unbox, um, boba tea, just a little bit of everything. Um, and if you have questions about anything, for sure, um, put those in the chat. Um, and we'll try to make this interactive as possible as well. Um, so I did want to share my screen right quick and show you where I got some of these fun things. Uh, so I'll do that now. Having technical difficulties, of course. <laughs> there we go. All right, so most of these snacks and items came from the Asian Food and Gift Store. Um, this is the box of all my goodies that I was able to bring home and I'll be going through. Um, this place is really close to campus, um, about 10, 12 minutes away. Um, and they have things like a whole wall full of ramen, um, tons of candies and snacks, um, frozen items, fresh produce, and they've been in business for 40 years. Um, so um, they're well known in town and they got some really great stuff as you'll see. Um, here are some of the things that I grabbed that I already ate. <laughs> so I just wanted to showcase those as well. Um, like I said, they have frozen items. Um, I got an ice cream sandwich that was really good. I got some bubble tea in a can that I was definitely not sure about, um, but that was really good. And um, part of what we're, we'll be doing today is making some of this pop-in candy, um, pop-in cooking. And so I did a test run on, on that as well. And they have soups and fried tofu as well. If you're looking for Gashupan and um, the toys that I'll be featuring today, a place to go and check those out is the iGo Tokyo store. Um, that too is close to campus and they are a Japanese boutique um, that has the Gashupan machines that you can buy tokens for. Um, you can do online shopping there and they will ship anywhere in the US. So, And then there are two other options that are relatively close by that I wanted to make you aware of. Um, there's two locations for the Asian market um, and you'll see those on the screen. And then the Indian Asian Mediterranean grocery kitchen spices um, is about 20 minutes from campus. So let me stop that and go back to my screen. Everybody see me there hopefully. All right, great. All right, let's 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 get to, to trying stuff. <laughs> so um, one of the items that I picked up was um, the Garuda coated peanuts. So I have those here and you can kind of see what those look like. Um, give those a taste. I've also got some drink selections here too. One of my favorite green teas is this one. And I grab that every time that I go. It is so good. It is just a plain unsweetened green tea. And it's good because um, these coated peanuts are a little spicy. Mm. All right, another one of the items that we have to show off are these chips. They, the flavor is extra barbecue. So let's see what those are about. It, it looks like um, the label is very similar to the Lay's, um, but you know, it's, it's a different kind of version. Try those. Mm. It's good. Um, I was kind of hoping for a little bit of a Korean barbecue flavor, and it's similar, as you can see on the package. The barbecue. 
let's try another one of our drinks. Um, another thing I picked up is, you may have had these before, aloe vera drinks. Um, they're unique in that it's got the chunks of aloe vera um, inside the drink. So not for everyone. Um, and I've tried the plain version, but this is pomegranate. So let's, let's see. I don't have like a spit can or anything, so we'll just deal with it. Mm, it's good. It's good. It's um, pretty sweet. And it does have those chunks in it. But it's tasty. It's full of vitamin C. So nice and healthy. All right, moving on to our next item. Um, you may be familiar with the Cheetos logo. But this is a different kind of version. Um, it just has lots of peppers on it and garlic. Uh, so I'm expecting spicy. It's got the flames with Chester Cheeto. Um, sweet, sweet and spicy flavored snack is what it says. And um, when I opened these, the color was a little different too. Um, very light as opposed to the spicy Cheetos I'm used to that are heavily coated. Good crunch. It is. It's kind of got a sweet thing going on. Um, no spice though. Not very spicy. So that's an option there. Moving on to our third drink. We're just moving right along. Um, and then we'll take a break and I'll make some of this pop in cooking and show you guys what that's about. Um, the third drink is um, strawberry Remu bottle. Uh, it's kind of like a carbonated, carbonated soft drink, strawberry flavor, uh, as you can see here at the bottom. Ooh. Definitely carbonated. It just tastes like a strawberry soda. So. Good deal. All right, so I'm going to clear a little bit of this out of the way and we can take some of the poppin' cooking. See those. All right, we have three options on those. I picked up a three pack. Um, this one's like ice cream cones. And then we've got one that's sushi, and then another one that is donuts. Um, anybody have a preference? <laughs> Which one you would like me to make? All right, well, I think we'll go with the sushi. And angle this so you can see a little better my workspace. All right, so for pop and cooking, all you really need is everything comes in this handy little box um, and water. So we'll open it up and make some sushi. Um, all the packages come in kind of like few packaging here where you've got your sushi table, um, kind of bento box style. And on the back, you can see the different sushis you'll be making today. Right, and everything comes in pre-portioned little packages here. So easy to work with. And your instructions are on the back of the box. So the first thing we're gonna do is make the rice. Um, and it comes with the package in which you measure everything. Uh, so we are going to add the powder from the blue packet and stir until we have 
Nice. All right, and everything, I, I don't know if you can see here, has numbers and letters so you know which compartment to make what in. So our rice pack candy powder is going to go in the first one. And going to add a little water to that. Not too much. It says fill the oval depression with water. So I don't think I need too much there. And we'll give it a stir. Like I said, it comes with all your tools there. Making our rice or our sushi. Probably a little water would be good, just a little more. Okay, now we have our rice. Good to go. Our next step is to make the omelet that will go on top of some of this rice. Um, and so we're going to move to the next container here. Uh, and we are going to add water up to the line on the side in the spiral section. So everything is, is well laid out. Um, not, it's good instructions for, for these. Again, more water. Making our omelet. To tell you the truth, I'm more of um, a nailed it contestant than a home chef. So hopefully this comes out looking something like sushi. All right, making our omelet. So um, we're gonna spread to flatten it using the same tool here. Making up our omelet. A little bit of a runny egg for this one. We'll kind of let that solidify. Okay, next thing we need to make is the tuna. Um, got a dog growling behind me. She wants her, her peanut butter treat. So for the tuna uh, in the wavy section, we'll add water. So again, this is really easy. You just Everything is water-based. We're gonna make it for tuna. Oh, that one smells really good. Maybe strawberry scented. Powder. All right, it's all coming together. Now we have to wait three minutes for it to firm up. And while we do that, we are going to make the dried seaweed for our sushi. So it came with little black candy here 
and we'll spread that out. Says to match the size and shape of the packing pouch, which is on our packaging here that we got. I'm going to do that in our Star Wars tray. Spread that out. In this case, uh, I'm using my fingers to do that. This tool is also good though. Spreading that out. Kind of a grape scent on that one. <laughs> All right, step five, we're getting to the end. We are going to make our salmon. Um, so for our remaining containers, A and B on here, we're gonna add water again up to the line and add our packets A and B. There we go. So this is pretty much foolproof. Packet A and packet B. And we're going to mix that up. And then we've got a little dropper to grab it in. So we'll see how that comes together. And I'm going to uh, use the dropper that it came with to add mixture B to mixture A. And I think this is gonna create some kind of a reaction where it's gonna form the salmon kind of balls that we have on the sushi here. Yeah, I can already tell that it's coming together. of mixing together. Okay. Give it a little mix together so it can more fully form. All right, and we're gonna put our sushi together now. All right, so to make the omelet sushi and the tuna sushi, I'm just gonna grab up some of our rice here and plunk that down, kind of form it into what looks like sushi. Doesn't have to be perfect. All right, so we've got our, our two there. 
I'm going to grab up some of this omelet, kind of cut some here, and a little too much. Just plunk it on top of my rice. So cute. Grab up some of my quote unquote tuna and plunk it on top of the rice there. Looking good. All right, and then for my salmon, grab this kind of fruit leather stuff. And it says to make it in kind of like a ball shape there, like an oval. And I'm gonna drop the salmon in the middle of it with my dropper. This I'm less confident in. I think I mixed the liquids incorrectly because I've got kind of a, a blob scenario going on here. But we'll put it on top and call it done. Now the big question is, I'm sure, how does this taste? How is this candy? So I'll give it a taste. I'm gonna try the the red, which is supposed to be the tuna. Tastes like a strawberry gummy to me. And some of the rice. Oh wow, the rice is really good. Very fruity. All right, so that was the poppin cooking. Now we can move on to opening some of our toys and um, some more of our candies. Hope everyone enjoyed that. <sighs> Had to give the dog some more peanut butter. So maybe we won't have barking. And that popping cooking also came with something to make soy sauce. So it's a pretty good deal, a good activity. So what we've got to try now is some boba that I grabbed from the Asian food store. Instant boba. Um, you put it in the microwave for 20 seconds and it makes boba so let's give that a try and see how it is all you have to do is add the packet of boba to milk drink anything like that so i've got some almond milk here And we'll give that a stir. So they really do have a lot of cool things there. Different things to try if you're looking to expose yourself to some new things. And there's the, the boba at the bottom here of the milk. So that was really easy. And it's good. It's nice and... um chewy and soft, not very hard at all. So if you like boba tea, I would suggest this boba, instant boba, which is also fun to say. Got a garbage truck coming by. So I'm gonna mute you for a second. <laughs> All right, so let's open some of these gashupan that I got.
All right, so out of that container, we got a cat on a cupcake. And that one was called the Cafe du Meow. And out of the other one that I grabbed, I tore the box, unfortunate. Um, it is Kitten Club. We could get a cat with a bagel. Let's see what we got. Oh, we got a good one. We got a cat with a coffee. If that's not me, then I don't know what is. And it comes with a little stand so you can put it on your desk. So these are things you can pick up at that um, I Go Tokyo boutique. Um, you buy the token at the counter and then they will um, give it to you and you go over to the machine and swipe it and there you go. All right, I think we got time to try maybe one more thing. So other things that I did get there um, was some candy that looks pretty good and there's another gummy candy probably won't try that because i'll be chewing for 15 minutes and then they even have they really had a great drink selection they have some hawaii kona blended coffee there there's so much you can get so the last thing i'll open here is um something you may have seen on tiktok or it's popular in the un unboxing videos. Um, the form of the Gashupan is the mini brands series and it comes with five different items that are like miniature version of things from the grocery store. So you can see here, what will we get? It's been hard not to open these for two weeks. And then next up, we have um, Wes, and he's gonna show us how to cook in the kitchen. So I'm about to turn it over to him once we find out what's in our surprise ball. We got it wrapped up tight. But it's like an orange when you open it. So what an experience open one of these. All right, our first item is some lotion, a miniature lotion with the barcode and everything. Very detailed. Let's see what's in the other one. Oh, how cute. Velveeta shells and cheese in the miniature version. So collect them all, you can have a whole grocery store. All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me do this with y'all today. I had a lot of fun. Um, good luck in your studies and your finals. I'm gonna hand it over to Wes in a minute and um, y'all have a great day. Thanks, Erica, for that uh, wonderful um, introduction as well. A bunch of cool items you got from the shop. Um, so what's up, guys? Um, I was going to do this one. On. <clears throat> hey, guys, welcome to my channel. This is Wes in the Kitchen. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, <laughs> but um, what's up? My name is, again, Wes Smith. I'm a studio librarian. We have a, a couple of guests in the house. I have my wonderful dog, Leo, who is uh, assisting in the kitchen. And we have my other wonderful pup, Lucy, uh, protecting the kitchen, uh, watching the door, make sure nobody comes by. So you, you might hear her as she is giving me a nice little warning bark about the people coming in and out of our little, um, of our front door. But today I'm going to be Attempting, I'm, I've never declared myself to be a expert amongst any of the things that I do, um, but we're just gonna do some fried chicken today. And you know, fried chicken is a just a very much a staple for that good old um, comfort food, very much that southern you know hospitality um, concept as well too. It's just very much a, a, a staple. Um, 
And we're going to be doing this maybe in a way that you haven't done it before, or maybe your grandmother had done it or your mother have, have done it. Because I think most of us probably have done, we've ate chicken before, obviously, and we might have done something lightly breaded before, we might have pan seared something before, we might have baked something before, we might have had fried chicken that's been recently frozen and then baked that before. But, you know, how many times have we actually got a chance to, you know, fry some chicken um, before? And it's not as hard as, you know, one might think. Now, just when we're talking about fried chicken, I can't be um, talking about the ways that we can, we can do it. And we're going to do it, I don't want to call it a special way, um, but we're going to be, this is buttermilk fried chicken. Now, I have my wonderful buttermilk right here. Um, and for those, so I have some buttermilk right here. And the reason why we're doing this is because that is the secret sauce of um, what I think of, of fried chicken. Um, how many of you guys have a liked or love Chick-fil-A? I'm pretty sure many of you guys have been on campus. Like, hey, let me just give me a little fried chicken sandwich. Let me let me swoop by on a Sunday. Unfortunately, when it's closed, the moment we were wanted the most, some you know some Chick Fil A. You know what makes their chicken so um to to die for, right? What makes it so that it just has a, that really good taste? Is 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 has everything we want, is nicely breaded, is warm, is juicy, is juicy than the chicken that we can get, you know, potentially from when we're at home. Like what makes it that type of, what gives it that kind of flavor? Well, here's this little secret that I'm just gonna tell you guys, or you can look on the internet and I can tell you the same thing I'm telling you as well too, is that they brine their chicken. Now, um, what is a brine, right? You know, think pickle juice. <laughs> They put it in something that is um, slightly, you know, I, I don't want, I don't want to say acidic in the sense, but vinegar based, right? Um, it so if you think of chicken itself. Chicken is typically there's no fat on it. Um, let me actually bring out a piece of chicken so we can, so we can talk about that. So I have a piece of wonderful chicken thigh with me today, what we're gonna use for our sandwiches. So here is a chicken thigh for those who have never seen chicken thigh before. And you know, if you, what we're eating is all muscle here. We'll see a little bit of uh, fat right here, but chicken is relatively a very lean meat. And that's why, that's why we eat it a lot. And so, um, with things being very lean and not a lot of fat in it, we, we tend to lose a lot of moisture when we cook it. So that's why, you know, if you're at home or you're in a restaurant, you know, we've all had a piece of like a very dry chicken dish because it doesn't have a lot of fat in it. Um, and so what the brining process does, um, you know, I could probably give you some, some, um, if we have our, uh, you know, one of our, our health science librarian, maybe chapel or one of our other <laughs> librarians who um, deal with the sciences can talk about a scientific process um, is that placing, you know, um, we, are, we can bring in more moisture into the chicken due to the, um, the properties of the brine, um, similar to, you know, when you're having something super salty and you're, you know, you sweat a lot, so you expel more water or take water in, I forget how the process goes, but you know what I'm saying, you know, it allows for us to, it allows to bring more moisture into the chicken. So when we actually do cook it, there's more moisture can be released out and not necessarily be all the way out to dry out the process. And so we can, oops, let me, I'm going to hold you for one second, guys, I want my dogs to bark at And so we have, again, you know, we're, we're trying to just make sure that this piece is as juicy as, as it possibly could be. And I'm choosing for this, for this recipe to choose um, thighs. You can choose chicken breast as well too. To me, thighs have a little bit more, a um, little more flavor, but they also could tend to be due to um, where they're located on the chicken, a little more tough if you're not paying attention of how you cook it, just because the muscle gets, gets worked a slightly bit more than, than usual. Now, uh, maybe next, our next uh, live stream, I'll actually um, uh, do a whole chicken for you guys. But 
to save time. Again, just went and bought some chicken, some chicken thighs from, from Publix. Um, like a good chef, I already have some um, marinating right now. But let's talk about the marination process um, if I was going to do this from scratch. So I have, um, it's a, actually a very simple recipe that I'm doing today is all I'm taking is a little bit of the uh, buttermilk, again, which is, if I didn't necessarily refer to it, what it was, it just, you know, it's culture milk. Um, it has a super, if you smell it, smells bad. It is a, um, how would I explain this? Uh, it has, it's what you use for all your favorite things, like, you know, buttermilk biscuits, buttermilk pancakes. Um, it has that slight, maybe, again, I don't want to call it acidity taste to it. Um, vinegar based taste to it so think of it as like you can make cultural milk with if you don't have it with a little bit of milk and a little bit of, of lemon juice um, a little bit of acidity to it so all we're going to do is i'm just going to take a half a cup of this and i'm going to pour in my favorite hot sauce louisiana you can do anything that uh any hot sauce that you that you like i am i like it so much i got two balls to make sure we have have enough for this process. And so um, we're gonna take just a half a cup of, of buttermilk and then as much hot sauce as you like. You know, if you don't like it as hot, just don't you have to use it as much. If you like to be really spicy, have a lot of, a little bit of a kick to it, um, you absolutely can use a whole bottle if you want to. I maybe not recommend it, but you can absolutely do so. This is your food, not mine. Now, Typically, uh, what we like to do is we would like to, you know, marinate for at least, you know, at least an hour. Um, I know sometimes if, if we don't have the time, stuff like that, we end up typically, uh, this process might not be for us. But, you know, again, guys, all we're doing is putting some buttermilk in a bag or a bowl and put it into the, into the refrigerator. It's great to do the night before or morning before you go to work. Because um, the longer you let it sit to a point, right, you know, we don't want to have to sit, you know, for you know, for 36, for, you know, 36, 40 hours, because we'll, and, you know, it's not necessarily going to cook the chicken like you would for like a ceviche, if you have a little bit of acidity to it, but it's, you know, it's not going to have this, you know, ultimate um, process that is going to be like, the longer we leave it in, the more tender the chicken was going to be, there gets, there gets to a point. So I like to do mine for 12 to 24 hours, just depending on how I'm doing. So chicken that I'm going to be using to cook with has been uh, marinating for 12 hours. And then um, this little piece right here, I'm gonna marinate for an hour because I'm actually eating this for dinner tonight. So again, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna put my little piece of chicken into here. I'll take some um, buttermilk. Pour it in. And then I'll take a little bit of hot sauce to it as well. I'm give a little stir around. I'll also put a, I will put a little bit of salt in this as well too, because the milk itself is actually, um, you know, not salty in, the, in and of itself. And so we want a little bit of salt for that flavor. You know, salt is flavor. And so I will put this, put this to the side and, you know, we will be good for that. I'm gonna wash my hands and we'll get to talk about the next process. So while my chicken is all squared away and marinating, you know, you know, it's again, we're living for 12 to 24 hours. You know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what the, our next step we're going to, we're going to do is we would make sure we are going to start the process for heating up our oil for frying. Now I have two devices out to show you guys today. I actually have a fry daddy um, that I use for most of my most of my frying um, is just a um, small fry daddy. It has a temperature gauge on it. 
Um, great for French fries. I've done fried okra, fried catfish, uh, chicken fairly often. Um, but if you don't have a fry daddy, which is absolutely okay, um, you can take any large pot. I'm actually using a Dutch oven, a small Dutch oven that I'm using for today. And we're going to be using, using some canola, canola oil for our actual oil. Um, you hear people, some people like to use uh, peanut oil. Um, again, it, peanut has a very peanut oil has a very robust taste. Uh, if you've ever cooked with it before, um, we you typically don't see it as much in the. I'm gonna go out on a limb to say, you, know, you probably don't see as much in, in the restaurant scene just due to the fact that um, a lot of people have peanut allergies as well too, and stuff like that. Um, but peanuts give a very robust flavor when fried chicken. Oops, excuse me, guys. We had somebody trying to steal the chicken walking by the door. So they were making sure they let me know what was happening. Um, but you know, again, uh, peanut oil gets a very robust flavor, but we're just gonna be using some canola oil today. Now, what I like to have in my kitchen is a thermometer. Um, this is a typical candy thermometer. Um, bought this off Amazon for a couple bucks. Um, I like to have a thermometer so I know, you know, how hot my oil is getting. If you don't have one, that's absolutely okay too. I didn't have one, you know, for several years. And, you know, I'll talk about the process of discovering is your oil high enough to actually fry whatever you're trying to fry without a thermometer. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, put my thermometer in my, My Dutch oven, um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just looking for um, enough oil, you know, so enough oil within my Dutch oven so that I am not a wasting oil, um, but make sure that uh, I'm not necessarily pan frying my chicken either. So I'm looking for about one and one half inches worth of oil within the pan. So again, depending on if you're using a bigger, bigger pot or if you're using a, um, let me see if I have a pot here to show you guys. You know, you can use a pot like this. You know, you can use um, a larger pot, a smaller pot. You're just looking for one and a half inches of oil. And so um, I got my oil ready to go. It's, um, it is on and doing its thing. Got my thermometer in there as well too. And so as that is working, we'll talk about some other ingredients that I have. And then we'll kind of get talking about, you know, just, you know, the history of fried chicken, the history of it in the South um, as well too. So I got some, I'm cooking, Grand total for chicken breasts or for excuse me for um, chicken thighs, um, and so I have a um, looking for basically one to one and a half cups of all-purpose flour. I have, uh, and I'm looking for about two teaspoons of uh, garlic powder and then some smoked paprika, and then I will uh, put some fresh ground uh, pepper, and I'll put some salt in there as well too. 
So today we're gonna to be eating our fried chicken. We're actually making fried chicken sandwiches. So I have some brioche buns available as well too. And we'll make a little bit of um, some spicy mayo with some, again, more hot sauce and some mayo. And then uh, typically, you know, if I'm making this for breakfast for fried chicken biscuits, if you guys were a bit with me for my um, fall uh, live stream where I made biscuits, you know, using that recipe, I usually, I typically make, um, uh, biscuits and fried chicken with some, uh, sweet potato butter as well too. Um, but today we're just going to do the mayo and the fried chicken. And then again, I would, I would probably make some, uh, some fresh pickles as well too, um, during the same time doing a, uh, quick pickle. Um, but forgot the ingredients so we're not gonna be doing that today and so um to get started i will just um pour my ingredients into the flour I will oops, just take a, I'll just whisk it up. Nothing too crazy. Use a, use a finger, use a spoon. And I'll be ready to go for my fried chicken. I'm gonna grab those out of the, Grab my fried chicken out of my marinated fried chicken out of the refrigerator. So if you see, this is you got some uh, chicken thighs that's been like some marinating for a couple hours now that my oil is heating up, my thermometer is in there. I like to use a, if you have a metal spoon or if you actually have a, um, metal strain like this right here, um, you can use that to, uh, pull up your chicken. So now when I typically this, you know, if I'm doing bigger batches, I like to do my, um, like to do the fry daddy a little bit more just because, you know, I like to reuse my oil. Um, I find it best when, particularly if I am going to be doing maybe a lot of frying that month, um, that I like to have my oil well seasoned. Uh, and what we mean by well seasoned is that I've cooked several things in it, whether it be several fried chickens or some fried fish or fried okra, you know, really that, that oil and fat really seeps through and really marinates the oil very well. And so, you know, your favorite restaurants, they probably, um, you know, all those, um, you know, back alley, you know, not really back alleyway, but all those, um, um, fair fried chicken joints, they probably still have a little bit of oil from when they first opened up. And does oil go rancid? Yes, it does. But what we're talking about is what they do is that they probably, you know, they continue to strain their oil. They will, you know, um, as you know, the, the next day or the next week, they will continue to, you know, bring a little bit of oil from the first, from the day before into that batch to continue that flavor, that tense flavor that they had. And so, you know, if you ever have tried to cook something um, in oil that let's say maybe you went to a restaurant and you did all the right things and it just didn't turn out well, it's because really it could be just due to the oil is, um, you're not as seasoned as was before. Typically when I do, you know, I don't really, uh, I traveled my Friday Eddie, um, a couple weeks back. And so I cleaned it out to make sure that I could, that it was, um, I wasn't gonna spill oil all in my, all in my car. But, um, you know, I'm a little, little sad. I don't have enough. I don't have oil from my previous fries to bring to this fry to really bring out the flavor, but it it's not going to make it super, super bad. Now, 
Um, we do have, um, you know, I can't help but to give a shout out to, we do have some faculty members in the history part, history department and the uh, African American studies as well to that uh, do research into um, into um, recipes in the deep south and so if you're interested in this type of type of field feel free to you know check out the faculty members in the history history department see you know what type of research that they're doing um this is a research um a uh, topic that is near and dear to many people's hearts and you know even if it's not it's something that you can pursue if you are interested in it but just to uh, you know pull in some you know some a uh, little bit of of potential potential i guess not potential a little bit of history into this um you know fried chicken was thought to be brought um by into the new world and we're talking about the new world into um current day uh, United States of America by Scottish immigrants. Um, but the idea of frying chicken, particularly in the South, um, came from African descent. Um, and so it has been, you know, it's, you know, been around for a long time. Again, and we're talking about, you know, when we're looking at, you know, the, the way in which we kind of go about into, into frying and different techniques, it changes from, you know, region to region, person to person, there's no right or, or wrong way how to do anything, right? You know, we're all chefs in the kitchen, we can all kind of mix and match how we see fit. Um, I also want to recommend a couple of recipes that I have tried and liked. I really love um, one of my favorite places and this is not advertisement. So um, unfortunately I don't get money for this, <laughs> um, but I'd really like um, Bon Appetit, bon Appetit um, recipe for a, uh, for pickle brine, um, pickle brine buttermilk fried chicken. Um, also food and wine does a really great variation of that as, um, as well too. And so just a couple places for you guys to to kind of go and look. And you know, I will say, you know, as you guys are thinking about, you know, frying chicken at home, maybe you're afraid of oil and, and whatnot. Um, you know, you might have, you know, throughout the years hear people burning down dorm room, burning down homes, you know, just using, you know, frying, particularly frying a turkey. Um, you know, and I, I want to put all of those, you know, um, fears at ease, you know, oil, well, yes, it's dangerous and, and, and it can burn like everything else in the kitchen. Um, we're not dealing with anything that is um, frozen or we should not be doing dealing with anything that is frozen or things should be dethawed. And when it's dethawed, you know, oil, I mean, oil reacts badly with, not badly with water, it, it reacts to water. And so you see people kind of like, you know, burn down the side of the house or burn in the kitchen is because they have, you know, a frozen item. Um, and it causes splashback, and that splashback gets kids caught onto, you know, uh, wood siding, and this is already, depending on if you're frying a turkey, you know, it's already 300, 400 degrees, you know, you might be next to your house, and so you have trees, and it instantly catches on fire, and, you know, you know how that story goes, um, and so, but when we're, since we're dealing with this already thawed chicken, once we put it in, it's only going to be reacting to the water that is in the chicken itself and really not that much because we are sealing the chicken in with our buttermilk then our flour and then the super secret sauce as well too is doing a double coat if you like an extra crunchy and so we'll be doing an extra coat of buttermilk on top of an extra coat of of our flour mix We are still cranking up on the oil. We're at currently 260. We like things to be at at least um, 325 or excuse me, 350. We're going to be doing these in batches as well too. So if you've never fried before, um, anytime that we place uh, essentially a cold item into, I guess it's kind of like science, anytime we place a cold item to a hot item, it's gonna lower the temperature. And so we wanna make sure we keep on frying, especially in batches at, um, you know, at 350. And so I only have three pieces right now. So I'll only probably only do two piece batches. Um, 
because I don't want my oil to dip too far down because it's going to, you know, it won't fry the way I want it to. And so we're just going to make sure we keep it at 350. And so that's why we're just going to do it in a smaller, smaller batches. Also too, um, I am going to set up, uh, I'm going to, uh, well, I'm going to set up some, I'm set my chicken up on just a typical cooling rack because I don't want the chicken to be to really sit in its own um, to sit in its own uh, sit in its own the oil. I don't want it to get soggy. You know, sometimes we've had you know you guys might have had like hot chicken but it's soggy. Um, isn't, and that's not bad necessarily. If you ever go to Champies, uh, the best part of of eating the meal is the soggy bread that they put on the bottom of their plates, and so. It's not a bad thing necessarily, but I don't want my chicken to be um, so you when I'm eating my eating my sandwich. And so I have that set up. We are at 300, so it's, it's rising fairly quickly. Um, since I am using my stovetop and not my fry daddy, uh, the fry daddy has, um, while not great, it does have a temperature regulator. And so I can just easily um, have it set to a temperature and it will stay there. Um, with the stove top, you're just gonna make sure you're gonna do a little more fluctuation. So I have a little bit higher right now and then I'll drop it back down once I get close to or at temperature to make sure that it maintains right at the temperature that I like. And so one of my favorite places, and you know, I, again, I'm, I'm gonna give a shout out to a local Chattanooga place that I think has some, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about my favorite uh, uh, fried chicken locations here in um, Chattanooga. I haven't been to all of them, um, but I do like um, the, uh, the public house. I think they have a very interesting, um, they do a sweet tea infusion to their fried chicken. Um, they pretty much fry a quarter of a chicken. Um, they'll do a chicken breast and um, and a uh, and a wing and a leg. Um, it has a very interesting taste. They also do a uh, fresh or homemade hot sauce. Um, highly recommend you know trying um, that location out if you've never been before. I also recommend, you know, you know, right next to Champies, I think that is, you know, always a classic place for, for those who are local to UTC and, you know, local to, you know, if you're on campus, we've all had campus meetings or just like, hey, we just want something quick and ready to eat. That is a nice place to go. And so let me double check. Uh, we're at three. Oh, we're we are at three fifty, and so I'm right next. I'm going to plot my. I'm going to go ahead and start to do the breading process with my chicken. So I got some tongs. Um, I'm just going to. Take my chicken, I'll make sure that it's dripped, uh, pretty much drip dry. I don't necessarily want it to be um, wet. I'd rather have it be a, um, I mean, I, I don't wanna be like drenched. I don't want the, you know, the, the buttermilk to clump up on my chicken. So I'm gonna let it drip dry. I'm gonna dap it in there. I'm going to make sure it's nicely coated. I'm gonna put it on a plate. I'm gonna do all of them and then I'm gonna repeat, repeat the process. I'm gonna go grab a plate. And what we don't want to do as well too, already um, within that little time span of me talking, um, I don't want it to be too hot because I don't want to burn 
my chicken either. And so I'm going to turn it down and let it cool off for just a smidge. I'm gonna let it cool off and then we'll be back in business. And so like I said before, you know, one of the things about doing on soap top, you just gotta be super, super cognizant, super aware of what your actual temperature cooking is. But this would be a great time to talk about how do I tell if my actual, you know, if I don't have this fancy thermometer, how do I know that it is, you know, hot enough for me to actually fry? We can take a little bit of our actual flour um, right here in our mix. And if I toss it into, if I toss it into my, uh, my oil, it should actually, you should see it, sizzle, you should see it, I don't want to call it fry, you should see it, um, you know, you should see it sizzle and, and move. And so if you, particularly if you, you know, were to take a little bit and clump it up with some um, buttermilk, you'll definitely be able to see it um, in its If you like I say, if you take some buttermilk, you better have to go see it um, start its, um, its fry process. So a little bit still a little too, too hot. Again, I'm not trying to burn, burn my chicken for the, I'm not trying to burn my chicken for the night. That would be, I think my partner would be not happy with me. Um, this is, this is going to be our, our dinner in a little bit. But what we're looking for, when we start this process, we're looking for a nice, golden brown crispy crust um for those who never fried before too when so we'll put it in the um, you know we'll take our chicken and once we put it into the oil it will actually not sink down to the bottom but it will not necessarily be floating on the top now that's I, that's super not particular um it, it will probably when we put it in there it will essentially drop maybe um just underneath the surface, if not right at the surface. And then as it cooks, it will slowly start to, to rise. And so you'll, you'll definitely start to notice that when it's starting to be done, it'll start to, it'll start to floating more on the top. We're looking to cook into this at maybe two to um, two to three minutes. Um, we'll, you know, we'll give it a, a good college eye look test and see what we need to do because these are chicken thighs. They're super small. And so it's not gonna take that long. Two minutes might be too long. And so again, we're just looking for golden brown. And once we're done, we're gonna pop them, pop them right out. Oil is just now starting to, to come down a little bit. So I can, you know, again, if I wanted to, I could probably throw them in, throw them in there. If I'm super, um, super conscious of them and make sure I'm watching them, but I'm talking to you guys. So that's going to be a no, as I was talking to you guys before. And the, uh, <laughs> it got, you know, went up 50 degrees on me without me paying attention. Um, and so I will make sure, I'll make sure it comes down just a little bit more. And so, you know, I think if, you know, if you're looking to do a little bit of entertaining um, fried chicken like this um, in, the, in the sandwich type of format, um, what does really, really well, you can, you know, make a whole batch of marinating overnight, and then you can, you know, have a fried daddy, or you can have a, you know, a uh, Dutch oven or just a pot in general, and, you know, fry up a couple pieces. And then let your oil just sit there as well, too, as if, you know, and then you can serve your guests and people are still hungry um, and you have a flexibility to do so. You can always drop some more fried chicken in, fried chicken into your, um, your pot. Because again, it, it takes, you know, it, two to three minutes. You can keep on busting, busting them out. Um, typically, I like to do, I'll fry some fries after my chicken to get that nice kind of just that nice chicken taste to my fries to make it, I don't know, I guess I'm, yeah, it might be weird like that. Um, I like a nice, you know, I like my fries to taste like, you know, especially I'm frying everything together. I like my fries to taste like my food a little bit. 
And so um, I will fry them you know, immediately, immediately after afterwards. We're about five degrees away from actually being ready to go, which is good. <laughs> I'm gonna put the other set of chicken that I just started marinating away while we wait. Now, um, for those who may not know where to get buttermilk, is actually in the Milk Island, Milk Island Isle. And if you go to your, I say, in my local Publix, it is located at the very end, um, you know, near the, you know, not necessarily near the specialty stuff, but like where the, you know, Christmas, where the, in the holiday season, where the eggnog is, um, it's going to be right there in, in that um, little, little section. All right, we are at temperature. We're at temperature. I'm going to go ahead and put that back on. I'm going to take my my chicken right now. I'm going to go ahead and do my double, do my first piece double batter real quick so we can get one going for you guys. So my first batter in there. Second one. Nice and battered up right now. Making sure there's not as many dry spots. Gonna hit that shake loose. And we're gonna drop it into the oil. Now when you drop it into oil, um, again, I know oil is, is scary for a lot of people. Make sure you don't just plop it in there, but just lay it in there. Um, otherwise, you drop it in there, it's gonna splash back, and this oil is already 300 degrees, 350 degrees. And we don't want to say, having injuries and say, hey, what's it said to drop the oil in there? I did not. All right, I should put one piece in there. Hopefully, this will work. Let's start some video on a. Another device here, guys. And so we have this, um, again, you know, nice little piece of chicken is going. Um, it's not going to take too, too long to, to do. And we can actually, I don't know if you guys can easily tell, but it is already starting to get that light brown color. Now it's sitting in the um, sitting in the oil currently right now, um, and you see that it is starting to brown right there. If you see it's starting to brown right there as well too, we're going to make sure we actually turn up our oil some. Um, 
because after that initial jump of putting in putting our cold iron into the vat of oil, it instantly drops the temperature back down. Um, I have my thermometer right there, not in the oil, which is a rookie mistake. And so that is currently going at a fair pace right now. Um, we're looking about maybe another minute, minute and a half, if, if that's. Um, to me, the best part about the test of a good piece of fried chicken is the sound of the crunch. If it has a good crunch to it, that's how you know you got a good fried piece of chicken. Um, particularly, hopefully, that's not burnt. Now, typically I would have, um, in my Friday, I would have a little bit more oil in it um, currently um, than I do right now. That's so all I'm gonna do is just that, and we wouldn't need to do this if in the Friday, they'd be in the pot. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and give it one little flip. Again, where it's already sitting majority in the oil and it's already starting to, um, to float back up. I just gonna make sure that it is gonna be, um, nice golden brown all the way over. And so just because how this particular um, thigh was cut, um, it just has two pieces, you know, where my fingertip and where my wrist would be that are sticking up out of the oil. I should make sure those are nice and golden brown. So I'm just gonna flip over that, um, that chicken thigh um, just a little bit. Now, the other secret to frying for me is that, you know, sometimes you get caught up um, looking at the, the chicken and you're like, oh, is it golden brown? Is it golden brown? It is wet currently. Um, if that, if, I don't know if that makes sense for, for you guys, but it is currently in, you know, it's currently in liquid. So it's going to look different in comparison if the chicken was completely dry as well, too. So you don't wait too long because otherwise it'll end up being, you know, you end up being on the burnt side. You know, it'll end up being on the um, on the burnt side again. So we just want to make sure nice golden, nice golden. I like mine to be a little bit more on the darker end of that golden brown um, section. And that's going to be also too, that's going to be a variant on how much, you know, you have paprika and stuff like that. And so some other factors we, we were talking about that. So again, guys, we have a double battered piece of buttermilk chicken um, with, you know, the recipe is just a cup of buttermilk um, with some hot sauce marinated overnight with a um, breading of two tablespoons of paprika, two tablespoons of uh, um, garlic powder, some, um, some additional salt in the and then breading and having some um, uh, black pepper in there as well to either fresh or I guess it's called canned. <laughs> I'm gonna give it 20 more seconds. And then we will let it cool off. And then we'll, we will do the crunch test. I don't know about you guys. I I, I wish uh, you 
you know, I wish we could, I, I wish, I guess, I don't know if I wish it, but I wish you guys could smell this. I want to have it smell everybody's Zoom, but this Zoom has a great fried chicken smell. Um, a question about, came up about what type of thermometer I use. So if you just do a typical, um, I'm not particularly in love with this actual thermometer, I'm not saying that it's bad, um, but this is a typical candy thermometer. Um, this is from the brand um, Polder. It, you know, we're just looking for a thermometer that I can pick up. Whoops, my burma chicken guys, hold on. <laughs> Um, we're just looking for a thermometer that's deep enough that I can that you can pick up that has a handle on it that is hopefully plastic. Um, you know, this is just an Amazon find. Um, nothing particularly crazy. It goes from 100 to um, 390 degrees. I think it's uh, for me. This has been very reliable. But again, you know, you don't necessarily need to have the thermometer um, to do fried to to cook fried chicken. Um, it is helpful a thousand percent, but is it necessary? Absolutely not. Um, cause yeah, I think before, you know, we had a thermometer, a thermometer ready, readily available for a lot of people. We were still frying. It was just eyeballing it. And so, you know, a, a lot of what I did today is just eyeball it is eyeballing it. Since I took the thermometer out, I realized when my chicken was in it, in the, um, and the oil that the oil was getting a little too low, so I just cranked it, cranked it back up, and I could tell by the way it was frying, um, there was not as many um, bubbles um, popping up. And we're gonna take a look at look at this. I don't know if you guys can tell um, by the screen or maybe the, too much of light. This is a nice golden brown piece. Um, not the most, not the most ideal sandwich size, but I'll just have this as a snack right now before my partner comes home. Now, hopefully this is the moment of truth, guys. This is, this is what I've been, I've been, um, talking about. This sound is going to be important. So, shh. do you guys hear that? Do I need to do again? Here's another, here's another slide for you guys. Whew. that sound, guys, was, was, to me, that's what fried chicken is all about. So we have this juicy piece right here. I don't know if you can see, um, just, I don't want to get my nice new laptop all messed up, but there is a wonderful, you can, it is exploding with juice and a little bit of oil. Um, we'll go ahead and get this a taste test. Yep. Chef Boyer West has done it again. I have. That's pretty good. Um, sorry, we have another little bite. So, again, I'm sorry, guys. You know, I'm, it's like being a comedian. I'm laughing at my own joke too much. I'm eating my own food too much. So, to recap this, this is just um, simple fried chicken. You can make this in your own. You can go buy a fried daddy from Amazon and go to your local Target or local Publix grocery store. We'll have fried eggs in there as well, too. Um, I, the rest, this is almost a, maybe like a six ingredient dish. So we have the one cup of buttermilk. Buttermilk will last for a super long time. This expiration date right here is on the 22nd. Since it's already, um, it, it, it will smell sour, right? That's, you know, it has a sour, sour smell to it. So it will last pretty long, already open. Um, we have, for me, Louisiana hot sauce. You can use your favorite hot sauce that you want. We have um, two tablespoons, two teaspoons, ooh, don't do tablespoons, two teaspoons of smoked paprika, two sp teaspoons of garlic powder, a 
uh, some crushed black pepper, some salt, or if you have kosher salt, I actually put a little bit of kosher salt in there earlier, some kosher salt. Um, you're wanting to marinate your piece for, um, you know, hopefully 12, 12 plus hours. 24 is, will be, it will taste great um, for you guys. Um, what I like to do, again, everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, I like to, once I take my, my chicken thighs out, I like to bread them one time in the, in our flour mix. Then I will um, put them back into the um, buttermilk and I'll put that back into the flour to get the double crispy, crunchy chicken. We want to heat up our oil to um, 350 degrees. We don't want it too hot, but we also don't want it too cold um, because we'll have an uneven fry if it's too cold. And then we want to do it for two or three minutes. Make sure you keep an eyeball on it um, because we're looking for that nice, deep golden brown color like this. But also to know that again, that deep golden brown color is not also going to appear instantly. You know, the you know the breading is still wet, and so it's going to you know change the color just a little bit. And so right, we think is about ready. You can go ahead and take you know and and take it out, but you will know when it has a nice brown color to it. We're gonna let it rest, and you know, hopefully you have a um, cooling rack. If not, you know, a typical piece of paper and a paper plate is fine. But I definitely recommend that cooling rack. And then from from there, um, it is to the dinner table. Whether you're doing it with a brioche bun like these, or you're just having the fried chicken by itself with um, with some, um, you know, with some additional sides. Uh, you know, there's many different ways to kind of get into fried chicken. You'll have probably your, your favorite recipe, your grandma's favorite recipe, your, you know, significant other's favorite recipe. Man, guys, chicken's pretty good. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just munching all up in your ear. Um, you have, um, we have all these great, you know, you probably have all these great recipes, you know, freestyle, change things up. There's no right or wrong way how to fry chicken. I hope you guys, you know, as you discover, you know, hopefully the ability to, um, your freedom to fry chicken and not feel afraid to deal with the oil or deal with anything um, associated with, uh, with that. Um, but that is all I have for you today. We have the wonderful uh, Sarah Cantor next. They are doing some cross stitch. And so I will give the floor to them. Thank you for hanging out with me this um, lovely late evening. If you need anything or have any other questions about this wonderful recipe, feel free to shoot me an email. My email is Wesley, W E S L E Y 01. Or Wesley Dash Smith. Ooh, I can't even say my own email. Wesley Dash Smith, W E S L E Y Dash Smith, 01 at UTC to EDU. And we can talk food, talk whatever. Um, but otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your day, guys. Wes, that looked and sounded so good. It is bananas. Um, but hi. I'm Sarah Cantor, and uh, I'm going to be doing some stuff now. Um, I'm going to be doing some cross stitching. So I'm just making sure I have everything set up right now. I am going to be like moving the camera around a little bit. So I do apologize in case anybody has any, um, uh, you know, motion sickness things. I'm going to do my best to make it not too bad, though. I promise. Okay. And all right. So anyways, again, I'm going to be doing some cross stitch. And I don't know if you've ever done cross stitch before. I find it really nice and like meditative. Um, I know a few people have been on 
already today, doing different kinds of activities, um, talking about how, you know, it's something that you can just sort of zone out doing. Um, Teresa, who was our dean, who was doing some puzzling this morning, you know, talked about it. Emily, um, you know, was talking about uh, like with uh, when she was darning some socks or mending socks, um, you know, that doing these sorts of activities can really help. They can not only help you de-stress, but doing something that's a little bit, I don't want to say brainless, but something that's not, you know, super, uh, doesn't require a ton of thought, I guess, let's say, um, can be really helpful if you are looking to get a little bit more creative or if you have a creative block. Um, I, this semester, done a couple workshops on creativity. And one of the big things with creativity, you know, people always think that you have this lightning bolt moment and the light bulb goes off over your head. And that's really not true. Um, what it actually says, you spend a lot of time thinking about something and then you go and do something and use a completely different part of your brain. And it could be cooking like Wes was doing. It could be cross-stitching like I'm about to do. And that actually lets your brain sort of think about the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and so cross-stitching is something that for me, um, the way I do it, I like to set everything up so then I can go in and just mindlessly pick it up. And so if I'm working on a project or writing something and I get stuck, I can just pick up my cross stitching and do it for 20 minutes and maybe, ooh, something will come to me. So I'm gonna show you how I do that. I'm gonna start out, uh, let's take a look at my supplies. So I'm gonna switch over right now real quick to um, like a top down thing. So I'm gonna turn off my camera really quickly just so that you don't have to like, go through <laughs> the trouble of seeing the camera move like that because nobody likes that. And I do have my uh, camera up. It's on a tripod, but it's also on a cardboard box. So that's that horrible noise you just heard. All right. This. Hmm. We're going to see how this works. I've never done it before, all right? At least not with this setup. <laughs> okay, this is gonna be like a little bit closer, maybe to the table. Oh, I didn't have it turned back on. Okay, there we go. All right, so now you can see the table. These are my hands. I apologize for, you know, not maybe having like the best cuticles and stuff. But all right, let's take a look at my supplies. So first of all, when you're cross stitching, you need to have fabric to put your stuff on. So this is the fabric. Oh, there we go. All right, so this is called, um, I don't know why it keeps going out of focus. Okay, well, anyways. This is called, I, well, I don't really know how to pronounce it. I pronounce it Aida fabric because that's like the name right there. You can see Aida. That's also like, I think it's a person's name. I know it's a musical, <laughs> um, which I haven't seen. I just know of it, I guess. <laughs> um, and this is fabric that is made for cross stitching. So you can get it in these tubes. Um, they come with uh, like it's about a quarter of a yard of this fabric. You, you can also get it in larger sizes. I'm going to open this up. I'm actually going to tilt this like slightly so that it's not quite totally face down. Okay, here we go. All right, so I already cut this up, but it comes in pieces that are like about twice the size of this because <laughs> I cut it in, uh, I cut a little bit more than half of it off but it's really easy to cut and it comes with this sort of grid pattern. So it's a pretty open weave fabric. And the cool thing about cross stitching, unlike embroidery, is that you go through these holes in the fabric. So you make X's by going through the holes. 
And that is something that, I don't know, I personally just really enjoy doing. Um, and it's something that doesn't happen with uh, embroidery where you're like going just through regular fabric. And when I do embroidery, I like to have it be with a kind of tighter weave fabric. So it's a little bit sturdier. Um, and so it can be a little bit more strenuous, I guess. The other thing, so, and then here is my cut piece. to do this maybe, maybe if i just move the camera like that okay so here is the fabric that i'm using this is really confusing because i'm also watching it on the screen to make sure <laughs> that it's there <laughs> and so it's all backwards <laughs> um anyway this is the fabric i've already prepped it for my work i'm doing what's called counted cross stitch and so you start from the center which i marked and I use, you can use anything to mark the center of your cross stitch. Um, I use, because it's what I had handy, uh, one of my favorite pens. It's called, it's from Pilot. It's called the Friction Pen. And this is not an ad. This is not sponsored. I just genuinely love these pens. Um, it's really cool because you can erase it and it erases cre uh, cleanly. So let me grab one actually and show you because it's just so cool. I meant to have this with me. All right, so going back to my fake document camera. So this is the front page of my cross stitch pattern and this is my friction pen. And so you just do a little doodle and it comes with a rubber eraser and see it erases super cleanly and you can actually erase it um, in any other way. It, it's the heat that is produced by the friction of the rubber. Um, and so with this, when I'm done with it, even though it's just a little bit, I'm going to probably end up like ironing it um, before I, you know, display it or do whatever else I'm going to do with it. Um, and so that, mar that pen will go away. You also might notice that I have tape around the edges of my fabric. And that's because, again, this is a super open weave fabric. And so it frays really easily. And so putting tape around the edges of the fabric can help keep it from fraying so much as you're working on it. Um, I used like scotch tape. I don't recommend it <laughs> for this. Um, but usually I would use uh, either like washi tape, especially one that's on the wider side. So I can just fold it over, uh, which isn't as sticky, but is a little bit more flexible. So it's, I like using it. Or if you have something that you, uh, We'll be working on for a while maybe um you could use um like packing tape but something that comes off you know that's that's an important thing all right so then i have my other supplies in here and this is a little like case that uh my mom gave me and you can see here my cat got to it there's a bunch of like scratches on it um but this is nice because the sides the top and bottom of it i mean are magnetic so i use this especially if i'm traveling and you can see here, I'm not sure what that was, but some, some thread. Uh, but I usually have a pair of scissors, a needle threader, and then I'll usually keep my embroidery floss in there. So this is the embroidery floss that I pulled out to work on this project with. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna end up using all of it because um, I'm probably gonna just start with one. Um, and then I also, as you can see, I have a bunch of needles in there, but I'm going to be using one of these needles. I don't know if you can see it um, for this cross stitch just because I have them. But it's gold and it's blunt. It, uh, it has a blunt point. So you can't hurt yourself with it. That's not why I'm using it. That's just a fun fact. Um, but I like it because it stands out a little bit more. So, um, and then my final supply is my pattern. And reading a cross stitch pattern can be a little bit tricky. So I got this pattern on Etsy and unfortunately it doesn't have just a picture of the pattern. Um, so this is the closest, the colors look a little bit different than they do in the picture. 
because it's you know also on this grid. Um, but when you buy a cross stitch pattern, um, especially if you buy it online, it usually comes in a couple different formats. So this is one where you see the whole picture. And then on the back side of this sheet, uh, it kind of gives you some information. So it gives you, here we go. It gives you um, a legend that you can use to read the pattern. And then it also tells you uh, what colors of embroidery floss to use. I am not using the same colors. I almost never use the same colors that it says to in a pattern um, because I like to be creative. Uh, it also tells you about how much um, uh, how much fabric you'll need, um, and it tells you what kind of fabric. So I mentioned already that I'm cross stitching. I'm cross stitching on Aida fabric. It actually comes in different sizes. So I went out. It comes in different colors too. I this is like a sort of you know minimalist abstract kind of design. I thought that's going to look really nice on like a natural linen fabric as opposed to like a white fabric. And so I got some natural fabric. And then I also got it with um, 16 count. And I believe that means it's 16 something to a something. I, I actually have no idea. I don't know why I was going to say that, oh, this is what it means. Um, it's like, oh, it means 16 boxes to an inch. And I don't think that's true. Um, so I don't really know what it means, but the smaller the number, the wider the boxes on the fabric. So like this is, you know, I, there we go. There it goes. So this is the size 16 count. Another common size is 14 count. And so the holes are a little bit uh, bigger. They're further spread up. They're spread further apart. Um, so you can also get smaller count, which is a higher number count. And that means that it's going to just affect the size of your stitches and the size of your finished product. So I went with 16 count. That's what I usually go with. All right. So then we get into the actual grids. And I am actually going to skip these. I this particular pattern, and a lot of times, again, when you buy them online, they'll come with the colored grid. Right there, there's more. I like to go with the black and white grid because um, it uses symbols. I just sort of personally find that a little bit easier to use. And one thing you'll see on here, there's that arrow right there. That means that's the center of the whole project. So I'm going to start with this sheet. And I marked my center, remember, with my friction pen. So it's going to come off when I iron it. Or maybe if I just stitch so fast that it, you know, burns the pen off, which could happen. It's happened before. Not for me, but I mean, it could have. All right. And then I'm just going to double check my colors. So it gives me the colors to use. Like I said, I'm not using the same colors, but I'm starting with the heart color, and this is a pretty similar color. I just, I went to the store and I liked it better than the one that's on the pattern. Um, so this is what I'm using for my heart. So keep that in mind. And uh, a lot of people like to, like, these are uh, called skeins of embroidery floss. A lot of people like to, like, take these off of the skein and wrap them on, uh, I think they're called like bobbins, I wanna say. Um, and sometimes I do that. It does make it a lot easier to store, but I don't always, so. And I just pulled off three loops. So it's about two feet, uh, which is longer than you're supposed to do. Um, a lot like, you know, fancy people will say, you wanna keep your strings to about 10 inches. But the first thing I do, um, if you were watching Emily mending socks before, you'll already know this, but embroidery floss is made of different strands of thread. And I typically, unless it says otherwise in the um, uh, pattern, I always go with two strands. And I am pretty sure that's what this two means um, right here. So you use two strands on 16 count fabric. And so, oh yeah, you pull up two strands. 
false. No, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull off one strand, this. All right, then we'll go back down like this. All right, so I'm going to just pull off one strand. So I'm going to have five strands left over in this piece. And I'm going to continue to pull off single strands. And what I do is rather than uh, having to have a bunch of knots on the back of my project and having to weave in a bunch of extra ends, boom, I fold it in half. So what was one piece is now still one piece of thread, but it's half the length. <laughs> um, and then it has this loop at the other end. So I'm gonna put this on my needle. I am off camera licking it to keep it together, um, just out of habit. And this is a nice needle. I think it's, I think it is actually a full on embroidery needle. Um, and it has a really nice uh, big head. So it makes it easier to thread your stuff. So I mentioned that my little magnetic thing has a um, needle threader for this. I don't need it. And then I leave a little strand at the top. And then I have, at this point, it's probably yeah, about like 10 inches. Um, so I'm going to start you look here I'm and I'm going to be going oops, not to the camera from the center to the right to my right anyways and I'm going to start with and again this is the counting part I'm going to do one two three four five six seven eight nine ten stitches using this thread so please help me remember that I'm going to make sure I have the chat up um, in case I'm like, oh no, how many stitches do I need to do? You can tell me and I'll, uh, I will so appreciate it. It's 10. I'm going to remember 10. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is go up right here where I've marked my center, bring the needle up. Let's see if I can get this a little bit higher. Let's see. Okay, there, um, that's a little bit better, I guess. Okay, sorry for all the moving camera stuff. I know it's terrible. All right, so I have my thread through the first hole of the fabric, and now I'm going to put it back down on the diagonal corner. Can you see that? Around the box. So there's the holes, and then there's the boxes, the squares of thread. I'm going to go across diagonally across this box. I don't know how well you can see it. I should have done something way bigger so you can see better. <laughs> and then instead of pulling it straight through, I'm going to flip it over. And remember how I said, um, like, this is my special trick for embroidery. I don't know if I, or cross stitch. I don't, I didn't maybe say it was my special trick, but this keeps me from having to even so many ends. I pull that needle through the loop that I made when I folded my thread in half. And now it is totally secure. I don't have to worry about it coming through. I don't have to go back and weave in that end. And now I have half a stitch. Can you see that? Can you see that? You can maybe just barely see that. And I'm gonna do that 10 more times. And I'm just going to go down the line, one, two, oh, this tape is terrible, three, don't use scotch tape for this, I'm telling you, four, five, make sure it's the next one, six, seven, eight, 
eight. Nine and oh, I'm struggling. There we go. Ten. And now I have a row of half done stitches. There you go. We're going to finish the stitches by crossing them over the other way. But what I like to do when I'm cross stitching is go through and do all the crosses one way and then go back in and fill in the crosses the other way. And that's gonna just help me uh, sort of plan out my pattern. Um, you can also, if you notice here on my pattern, I have like an outline that I can create. I can also start making that outline. And then I'll know that pretty much, um, even though there are a couple triangles, which is a different color. So triangle is this dark, um, color right here that I think it says garnet. So I guess like a very dark red. Um, I think, yeah, I pulled out a different dark red to use. It's similar. Um, I may not end up using that color though. That's just sort of what I had with me today. But I'm going to sort of just map all this out so I can fill in all those hearts. And this is where, you know, talking about, you know, it becoming something relaxing, something kind of meditative. You're just going through, and first of all, I find counting things to be very meditative. Um, you just sort of like count. I don't know if that is something other people find, um, but you go through and you count the stuff. And then once it's counted, you just go in and fill it in. So I already have my needle through the next hole, but let's actually count how many stitches I need to do. So I have my next line right here. So I'm going to start right below that last heart on this row. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six lines to make. So we have one. Two, three, uh, doing it backwards, so I'm really having trouble with the holes. <laughs> Four, five. And six. All right. I'm just going to double check that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so it's counted cross stitch. I don't know if there's another kind of cross stitch. I'm sure there is. I only know this kind. Um, I know that it's called counted cross stitch. Um, because you count it. I don't know if like other people do ones where you just sort of like freeform. I get, I would imagine that that's probably the case. Um, but I like doing this kind. I like working off a pattern. Um, my next row is going to just be four lines. So you do one. Two, three, and four. And one thing that's very important when you're doing cross stitch, I mean, you can do whatever you want. Like that's one of the things, like even though I'm telling you, you know, like you do it this way, you do it that way. You don't have to do it that way. You can do it however you want to do it. Um, that's the beauty of making stuff yourself. You can do whatever you want with it. You can follow your own rules. You can follow no rules. Um, but one thing I do recommend doing when you're doing cross stitch like this is just make sure that all of your crosses go in the same direction. So I'm going to make sure that I have all my like top left to bottom right lines 
underneath, basically. If you switch that up, it's going to just look kind of weird when you're done with it. And you, as the person that made it, may not even know what it is, but like your eye will see it and be like, that's weird. Um, and so I just like to avoid that because it looks weird and I don't want it to look weird, basically. Um, but this is how uh, you can avoid that happening. It is possible though, maybe you have something where you want that, like that's what you want it to be like. So then what you would do, and I'm gonna undo this because again, I don't like it. But what you would do is then, where we go in like and have your bottom cross oops, go the opposite direction like this can you see that so like that and again that's not what i would do because i don't care for it but you can do whatever you want when you're making stuff yourself you don't have to follow the rules You know, cool kids can break the rules. Some cool, some cool kids will follow the rules. Some cool kids will break them. But with things like cross stitch, you can do whatever you want. All right. So now I've done that row of four, and now I have a row of five that I'm going to go in and see. I'm going back to having it cross the same way because that's my business. Uh, to quote, um, oh, what's her name, Tabitha? Uh, the vegan lady from TikTok. That's my business. Um, and when you do this kind of stuff, it's your business. Ooh, I am hating this tape. I cannot tell you enough. That's really irritating. <laughs> All right, so I have two, three, four, four, and five. I think the problem is that I have my webcam on a tripod. I didn't know you could do that, but some tripods have a little things you can put it, uh, or sorry, some webcams have a little things you can put it on a tripod. And I got a tripod out from the studio. We have tons of tripods and I got a tabletop one. And I think I should have gotten one that was a little bit bigger because I ended up having to put it on a box to use it the way I wanted to. And so I'm hitting my hand on the tape every time I go through the fabric, but I'm also hitting my hand on the box, which I'm sure is shaking the camera. And as I'm doing it to make a point, I'm sure it's driving you crazy watching it. It's like the Blair Witch Project over here. Ooh, the Blair Stitch Project. Ha! Ah. Perfect. Nailed it. All right. Sorry, I have, to laugh at that. I have to laugh at myself. Um, all right, so I'm going to do now a little row of three. And again, this is just kind of mapping out my shape. It's an abstract shape, but you can do um, all kinds of different uh, shapes and stuff with cross stitch. Um, my mom was always trying to get me to do cross stitch when I was a kid. Uh, I think, so one of the things, I think I talked about this uh, on our fall reading day live stream, I think I was knitting and I think I mentioned this, but when I was growing up, when I, like little, little, not even like growing up when I was like a toddler, um, I think from when I was like two to four, maybe five, my mom worked as a docent at a living history museum. And sometimes she would bring me to work. And so starting around then, she um, would try to get me to do uh, like samplers as I was older, not when I was two, but like, you know, very, you've seen them probably the old fashioned things that like, you know, in the 19th century. So, you know, the 1800s and earlier, um, young children, especially girls would do cross stitch and embroidery samplers. And one of the cool things about those, you know, from a historical perspective that I know now as someone who's interested in um, fiber arts and the history of fiber arts, uh, making those sorts of samplers, what they're called. And I don't have an example with me. Gosh, I should have thought, oh, I might talk about that. 
and at least brought a book to show you an example. Um, oh, well, they a lot of times would be um, rectangles and they would have the alphabet, maybe they would have the numbers um, on there. And then they would also have designs um, that, you know, could be pretty. Some of them are not that pretty. <laughs> Uh, I guess you could say, <laughs> but um, that would be a way for girls to learn how, especially middle class girls, to learn how to make decorative things like a cross stitch um, or, you know, not necessarily cross stitch, but also embroidery. Um, but it was also a way for them to learn their letters. And that's something, you know, thinking about that, that's sort of, I think that's sort of cool. All right, so I now have two rows of three and I just wanna make sure I don't mess this up. So on my pattern, I have one, two, I have one more row of three and then I'm gonna start uh, going down in a vertical line. And anyway, those samplers would be um, ways for girls, you know, I don't know really exactly when they started, but preteen girls, um, so, you know, by the time you're eight, 10 years old, um, you've probably made a couple, but again, it would be a way to learn your stitches. So you might be doing a cross stitch sampler. You might be doing an embroidery sampler. Um, you might be doing a thing called cruel embroidery. I think I'm saying that right, um, which I don't really know too much what it is. I know my grandmother did it, um, but it's a little bit like puffier. You use like wool, I think, to embroider. Um, and I want to say it's on a similar fabric to this kind of fabric, this Aida fabric, but I'm really not sure. But the difference is you sort of make shapes like with big stitches. Um, but all I really know about it, again, is that my grandma did it. Um, and that's all I know. <laughs> it's not something that has really um, appealed to me, but um, doing that was also a way to practice your hand stitching. Um, one of the things I found, uh, I used to do, you know, I was a Girl Scout, I'd have to sew stuff by hand, and I wasn't very good at it because my stitches were always really uneven. And doing things like embroidery and cross stitch helps you sort of get an idea for making your stitches more even. So I assume that's also part of why they did it. All right, so now I have this line right here going down at the edge of this um, section of the pattern. So let me count up how many use my scissors to help me uh, count it. So I'm gonna count up these lines going down and then I'm gonna start stitching them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Ooh, so far I'm liking this pattern because it's in like uh, counts of five. So I already have, so it's a little bit easier to remember, but I already have one stitch. So I'm going to do 14 more. So I have, uh, all right, one. Two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven. 
right? I think that's 11. I'm going to count it on the next one. So I believe this one next, uh, this next one should be 12. Um, so I'm going to bring my needle up and I'm going to count down just to make sure that I'm right on my count. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Yep. 12. 13. 14 and 15. And now I could keep going and sketching out this pattern like this, um, but I'm actually gonna go back and start crossing these um, just because that's what I feel like doing right now. Um, I The next part is gonna be going down this edge, uh, the bottom of this shape right here, right along this line. And I just don't really like counting back to the right so I'm gonna, instead of like leaving, I have this thread here. Oh no, did my needle fell off, oops. Um, so you get to see that happen. So I am gonna re-thread my needle and then go back and fill in the rest of the crosses, All right? And again, I'm just looking at where you can't see and I'm gonna re-thread this needle, there we go. And sometimes, when this happens, your thread will get like a little bit frayed on the end. So I'm gonna put this on there. I don't know how we can see it, but the thread is a little bit frayed. If you ever have trouble, you just trim it and you should be able to um, get it back uh, on the needle, no problem. Or again, you can use one of those needle threaders. I don't really like using needle threaders too much, um, but Sometimes they are necessary, depending on what you're working on. If it's a very teeny tiny needle, um, having a needle threader can help. So, yeah, uh, my mom was always trying to get me, she was getting me these like little cross stitch samplers and I never did them. First of all, they were just not my style, even as a young child. Um, they were a little bit too like, I don't know, just not my style, I guess. Let's just say that. Um, and it didn't appeal to me because it just seemed like literally something my grandma did. You know, I didn't want to do that. Um, and then I got into cross stitching a few years ago uh, because I had a friend who, um, ironically, our nickname for her was Grandma. <laughs> um, grandma said, would do cross stitches and I thought they were pretty cool this was like I think a lot of the I think she did a lot from a a designer uh called I want to say like surly stitches and so it'd be like you know curse words and stuff like that and so that kind of got me interested again and then I found a pattern uh with you know that appealed to me I don't know my favorite curse word or something um after seeing all the ones that she made and uh, so I decided to get started and I kind of just jumped in. Um, I, it was around the time I also started, you know, learning uh, embroidery, which is different than cross stitching. Embroidery is where, again, you have like a more normal fabric. So it doesn't have these holes and boxes like my fabric here does. There we go. So it's like, you know, a uh, more like the fabric that your shirt is made out of maybe. Um, and then you, uh, just make whatever you want using various different types of stitches. And if you go back on the UTC library YouTube channel, um, where you're watching this live stream, we do still, I believe, have our live streams up from last semester. Um, and I know I did some embroidery on that one. Um, so you could go back and watch that if you wanted to learn more about embroidery, but I don't remember what day or what time. Oh, I do think there are timestamps actually on those videos. So if you do go back and you want to jump around and you want to watch Bo Baker noodling on his synth or let's see what else. Oh, you just watched Wes make chicken. You could watch Wes also make biscuits and then you have, uh, you know, lunch, maybe chicken on a biscuit. 
that was not, that sounds good. Um, trying to remember what else we had. Uh, hmm. I don't know. We had a bunch of people doing all kinds of different things. I think, um, trying to remember, it's been so long. It's been such a long semester, right? I'm sure everybody watching this is so happy, so excited for finals to be done right soon. I know they're just starting, but soon you'll be done. And then, you know, you'll have a little bit of a break, whether it's, you know, a couple of weeks between spring semester and summer classes, or maybe you have a break until fall classes. But after the last year we've had, everybody deserves a break. You know, it's been very stressful. And, you know, as someone who works in the library, I've been so impressed with how many students have really, you know, gotten through this year because it's been tough on all of us. And you're in classes. It's tough. All right, see now I'm going through and this is where, so now let's bring this up here. There you go. So now you can see it's making little X's and that's where the term cross stitch comes from because you're crossing your stitches. I assume that's true. I haven't like looked it up or anything, but it makes sense, right? Um, all you have to do if you want to sound smart is just say it. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, uh, Wes just put in the chat, Erica made slime. I can't believe I didn't remember that. I think about it all the time because, uh, I, I do not make my own slime, but sometimes, um, like I had a birthday recently and so I went out and I, uh, I had to get cat food, uh, which was not for my birthday, but was just for my cat to stay alive and not hate me. Um, and I went to the store and they had like a little jar of slime and I'll like buy that because, uh, and every time I do, I think of Erica who made slime and I say, I should make slime. I should stop buying the slime that's pre-made. I should make my own slime, but I tried it once and, uh, <laughs> I kept messing it up and I just, it was, it was very sad and it made me very sad. And I said, literal four-year-old children do this on YouTube. Why can't I do it? Um, so I should go back and rewatch our live streams and learn from Erica who did a fantastic job. Also loved watching her unboxing today of different snacks and stuff. I think she also had some gifts, but I had to step away for a little bit from the live stream. Um, so I hope the pop and cook in sushi she made came out uh, well. I was supremely invested in that, but again, I had to, I had to go do something else. Right. And now, now my thread, there we go. Didn't want to move along. Um, so you can keep going until you run out of thread. Um, I usually don't go until I'm like completely out of thread because that is hard to stitch with. Um, so I'm going to probably wrap up a couple, well, I'll see how long I can get, but I like to give myself probably like another inch and a half to two inches on, um, between like where I am and the needle, uh, like the, this end, the head end of the needle, um, so that I can, um, what's the word weave in my thread. I like to try to keep the back of my embroidery as neat as possible. Uh, that is not always possible. It depends on the pattern and what you're doing as the stitcher and what the colors are and things like that. But so right now I have a very, I have a really pretty neat back, although you can already see I have some like blobs forming. Um, my, when I say I like to try to keep the back as neat as possible, I mean, like for me, <laughs> not, some people will have really, really neat um, backs of their embroidery, um, but not me. Um, I'm trying to remember 
her name. I think on Instagram, I think her name is Stitch Goddess, I think. Uh, and it might be like G-A-W-D uh, for goddess. Um, but she does a lot of, she's like a professional embroiderer from Chicago. And she uh, will do really large scale um, cross stitch stuff. Uh, I know she did, um, I think it was like a life-size portrait of Beyonce, uh, or it might've been larger than life-size. It was huge on like plywood. Um, and, you know, so she's someone who, she's like very good <laughs> at cross-stitch and she does it all the time, gets paid for it and stuff. Um, and sometimes she'll post a picture, especially of these like very large scale um, projects. Like I think I think she still is working on a portrait of Fred Hampton. And I know that that's one, um, cause it's all in shades of like blue and black. Um, she's posted the back of that and it's, and I just look at it and I'm like, I could never make it that neat. <laughs> so when I say I try to keep it neat, I mean neat. I mean neat for how I do it, uh, which is, blobby um but and so now i am getting close to my time um but i'm gonna maybe wrap it up a little bit gotten through about two feet maybe a little bit more than two feet of thread but again it was folded in half and ooh, i just have two stitches left Ooh, this was turning around where i did was just perfect because, so now I have crossed all those stitches that I made and I have um, about two inches of thread. Ah, I don't wanna pull the needle off of it. I have about two inches of thread hanging off the back. And so what I do when I finish it is thread the needle through the lines that I made. I'm trying to see how well you can see this. Um, but so you see, even though you're, you're making crosses on the front side, you're making straight lines on the back for the most part. And so it's really easy. I'm going to have to do this this way, I'm trying to do it so you can see it. Um, I will skip this first one, um, just cause I don't want to loosen the stitch. And then you just thread your needle. underneath a couple of these lines that you made. And that is going to hold everything in place. All right, let's see here. So I have it under two. That's one thing, as I said before, this needle is very blunt. Um, it is designed for cross stitch where you don't have to pierce your way through the fabric. You just go through the holes that are already there. But because it's so blunt, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting it through. And I like to go through four, or sorry, uh, five or six um, of these little lines. And that way I feel like it's very secure. And then we just snip the ends. And now what's really important for me is I'm gonna take this and I'm not gonna throw it out. I'm gonna put it back in my little needle case thing because I have a glass jar at home that I collect all those little pieces of embroidery floss in. So whenever I do a cross stitch or an, embro or an embroidery project, I like to collect all those ends and uh, then I don't know, I could do something with them decorative. I've seen people who will um, you know, get those like uh, fillable Christmas ornaments. And, you know, they'll, uh, these are people who do a lot of crafting with embroidery floss, whether it's um, cross stitch or embroidery, or I don't know, maybe making friendship bracelets, whatever it might be. And they will make one of these fillable ornaments every year um, with all of their little ends of embroidery floss. And I'm struggling to thread this. 
because I'm at a weird angle. Another thing, this is something that I learned from Emily last year, pre-pandemic. Um, we did a workshop on how to like mend your clothes. So I think it was like how to sew on a button and fix a hem kind of things. And I learned from her that there are actually two different sides to the eye of a needle. And so if you have trouble getting through one end, if you flip the needle around, a lot of times you can get it, get the thread in a lot easier through the other end, but I'm still struggling. So this is when I use my needle threader. So I think what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do this again. So maybe you can see it better and explain what I'm doing just in case you ever need this. Um, and then it's going to be Kaylin's turn on the live stream. So I have my needle right here. There you go. And this is my needle threader. And it has this, um, like, this is one that's a little bit flimsy. Um, I got it in a sewing kit that, you know, is a giveaway kind of thing. Um, so you can get ones that are sturdier if you ever need it. But it has the end that you hold on to. And then it has um, some wires that create like a diamond shape. And you put the wires through the head of your needle. And then you take the end of your thread, in this case, embroidery floss, and you put them through the wires. And then you pull, ah, there we go. Then you pull it through and that threads your needle for you. So if you're ever really struggling to thread your needle, a needle threader can really come in handy. Um, and with that, it's about uh, 5.45 and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kaylin to get started because also it looks like uh, she needs to use a different camera that's not showing up. So I'm also gonna head over to meet Kaylin to help with that. Um, so there we go, unless there's someone else that can help, but. Hi, Kaylin. Hi, Sarah, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I am wonderful, I'm very excited to do this. Yes, I'm so excited too. Um, yeah. And also it occurs to me that uh, this might be like bad audio. So I'm going to turn off my stuff and come over and help you with that doc cam. That sounds great. I would really appreciate it. And I will, I'll just talk a little bit while I wait yeah. for you. All right. Teamwork yeah. makes the dream work. Yes. yes. All right. Good luck with finals, everybody. Hi everybody, I'm Kaylin. I work mostly on the second floor. Um, I'm super fun, you should come visit us. So what I'm gonna be doing today is uh, crocheting a succulent and hopefully I'll have enough time to get it done because it's super cute in the end. Um, just to let you know what I'm gonna be doing, I have a pattern here. It is from Planet June. It is, the artist is June Gilbank. Um, she does lots of really awesome patterns. I love the succulents. I made my grandmother a Christmas cactus for Christmas because my grandmother loves Christmas cactuses. So I made her one that can never die. Um, I kill plants, my grandmother doesn't, but she still thought it was cute. So it was worth it. Um, anyway, so the one we're gonna be doing is this one right here with the little red wavy pieces. It's modeled after a Mauna Loa succulent. And it's gonna be super fun. Um, I do, I like to use different yarn than what's pictured here. As you can, hold on, let me get to the right page of my pattern. As you can see how she does it is with green and then transition to red which is a little more true to how the succulent would actually look, but I like to have a lot of fun. And so I use this multicolored yarn and that way I don't have to worry about switching colors, but it still comes out in this really cool pastel multicolor that we're gonna see. Um, and until Sarah gets over here to help me with the document cam, because I, I'm struggling. Um, we're gonna, we're just, we're just gonna tilt this and hope that you can 
see at least decently well. So our first thing we're going to do is, oh, hold on, Sarah's here to help me with the document cam. So I have it turned on, but is then, again? yes, yes, I checked. It is plugged in and it is plugged in. Oh, there's two computers. Okay. Yeah, this, this is just mine. So you can ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> So I learned something today, Sarah. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to all the people who are oh, still yeah. listening while we try to figure out this technical difficulty. I learned something today. Um, as far as we knew here at the library, everybody should be officially finished with everything by May 4th, but I would, it's there now. Yeah. Okay. Everybody should be officially finished with classes by May 4th, but I had somebody tell me that they still have assignments due on like the 7th and the 9th. And I was very offended on their behalf. I am very offended on their yeah, behalf. Yeah, I did not like that at all. No, this is terrible. It was. I was like, we should all be done by May 4th. But anyway. I will write them a note. Yeah. <laughs> no, Sarah from the studio. <sighs> classes are over. Yes, Final classes are over, over by May 4th. Anyway, we're going to get back to actually doing what you're here to see now, which is not me and Sarah complain about dates not being what they should. Anyway, so we're going to start off by making a loop and you just kind of flip it over and pull a loop up through here. Yay. And now we have a loop that we can tighten down. Then we're going to chain 12. And if you've never crocheted, I know that you have no idea what this means, but a chain is basically just, it's your starting line of stitches. And it ends up looking kind of like a little, a little braided chain type thing. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Great. So we have our nice little pink starting chain here. And next thing we're gonna do is double crochet into the fourth chain back. So we're gonna count one, two, three, here's the fourth one. And so a double crochet, hold on, I'll do a better job explaining it the second time. So whenever you start, you always have one loop on your hook. And so a double crochet means that we yarn over once, put it through what we want, and then where we hook this, that's our second yarn over basically. So that we have, so that we can pull this through once and twice, and that's a double crochet. So we're gonna do that in all the rest of our chains. So yarn over, through, yarn over, back up, back up, voila. And so you can already see how how this multicolored yarn is making this really cool, like almost, almost tie dye look creation that's gonna be, that turns out great whenever you're making succulents, at least in my opinion. Everybody might not agree, but I don't really care about that because I'm the one making it. So we're still double crocheting along. Um, my mom always crocheted when I was growing up. And I did not learn how to crochet from her. No, of course not. That would be silly and make sense. No, I learned how to crochet from YouTube. So if this looks at all interesting, YouTube has lots of really awesome crochet tutorials. And also I know how to knit just a little bit, not nearly as well as I know how to crochet. My grandmother knows how to knit and wishes that I liked knitting better, but I don't. Sarah, who you just watched and who was in here helping with document mm -hmm. camera, she likes to knit. And we kind of laugh at each other because like crocheting just makes so much sense to me and crocheting does not make sense to her. And I'm the same way with knitting. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't make as much sense. I think it's messier, it's harder to keep up with and, but. You don't really care about that. Okay, what's our next plan? Now that we have, we should have 10 of these double crochets. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this counts as our last one, 10, perfect. 
Okay, so now we're gonna chain three, two, three. And then we're gonna turn it over like so. And we're going to double crochet at the base of our chain right here. So same thing we've been doing, pull it back. Oh, 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 too much. I got too excited, got too excited guys. Okay, there we go. And now what's next? Now we're gonna add two double crochets in each of our remaining stitches. And this is what's gonna help us make the fan shape that was in the pattern I showed you at first. So that is, and that'll help us, the fan shape is what helps us make the plant later, but we'll get to that, don't worry. I know you are worried, don't worry. This is not the place where we come to worry about things. Anyway, I was talking about my grandmother and knitting. I learned how to knit whenever I was in a secret Santa group. I know this sounds like they have nothing to do with each other. I promise it's related. I was in a secret Santa group and this guy that I was in school with at the time got me for his secret Santa person. And he was like, like we didn't know each other very well at all. And he was like, I don't know. I think Kaylin's crafty. So he had his girlfriend take him to Michael's and they bought me knitting needles and some yarn. And we're like, this is fun, right? And I was like, yeah, I don't know what to do with it, but I'll learn because this was a very thoughtful present, even if it was not necessarily accurate. And I'll take thoughtfulness. So I, that, I learned how to knit because I had gotten knitting needles as a present. And then my grandmother was delighted. And after that, I learned how to crochet. And I was like, I'm sorry, I like this better. This is what I would rather do. I'm sorry, Nana. My Nana is, is who taught me how to sew though. And the biggest compliment that I ever got from her was whenever she looked at something I had sewn and she said, you know, in a week, I won't be able to tell whether you did this or I did this because I'll have forgotten who did it and I won't be able to look at it and tell. And I was like, you know what? That means I have done a good job. Okay, so we're getting to the end of this row. Yeah, and we're going to do two more of the double crochets in this last stitch. Okay, see how we're starting to have a nice little fan shape. Look at it. And look at that color variation. Isn't that just wonderful? I love it. Okay, so now we're going to chain one. Go up a little bit and turn again. Oh, hold on. I gotta unwrap some more yarn. Here we are. Okay, so now we're working back on this side. Okay, and this is where things get kind of fun. Because if you look down on top of this, we have a front loop and a back loop. So we're gonna do some stuff where I'm either gonna go only in the front loop or only in the back loop. And that's gonna make a nice little ripple effect to our last row. So we're going to single crochet. So we've been double crocheting. Single crochet is where we have, we have our loop on the needle and then you just go through your loop, pull back once, and then you only have to go through one time, that's a single crochet. So we're gonna single crochet twice in this front loop and then three single crochets in the next back loop. One, two, three. 
and we're just going to go every other stitch with this. So it's going to be two in this front loop, one, two, and three in the next back loop, one, two, three. Great. So this may or may not make sense, but I tend to crochet a lot more in the winter than in the summer, you know, because wintertime it's cold and you want to do things that are cozy where you can just huddle in on the couch and, and be covered in yarn because it's warm. At least that's what I tell myself. So especially this past winter when we were even more stuck inside than normal winters, it's been a lot of time crocheting. I also adopted two kittens back in March. So when I started crocheting in the winter, they thought that was the most fun slash terrifying thing in the world. Like they didn't like it while I was crocheting because the yarn was moving too much and it looked like it was moving on its own. Like it was alive. But then apparently whenever I was going to work during the days, they would have yarn parties because I would come home and there would be yarn strewn everywhere across my apartment. I live in a pretty, like, pretty small apartment because it's only me. So why do I need a lot of space? Did I do that right? Yes, I did that right. Okay. Anyway. And I like to joke that it, you know how when you're watching like a crime, a crime solving show or something like that, and there'll be a board and all these things stuck to the board and connected with pieces of yarn. That's what my apartment looked like. It looked like my apartment was a living crime board, except that instead of leading from pictures of a mobster to crime scenes, it was leading from the dining room chairs to the clothes drying rack that has become a piece of furniture because I don't know how to take stuff down in my apartment. That's okay. It's all fun, right? Anyway, they would have parties while I wasn't there with the yarn. Okay, we are moving right along. Two, three. And if I have lost my mind and miscounted here anywhere, we're just not gonna talk about it because Who's ever gonna know? Maybe you, if you were counting really carefully, but I was talking and so I was not counting really carefully. Three, maybe, and two. Now we're gonna do three more in this last loop. One, two, three. Great. Now, see what a nice little, a nice ripply edge that made on top of that? Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. So we're done with this piece. This, this particular succulent plant is made up of two pieces. So this is the first piece. We're gonna cut off the end here. And how you tie off crochet is, so you've got your last loop here and all you have to do is pull your string all the way through that last loop and then tighten it down. That leaves you with a nice little knot at the end that if it ever, like if any pressure on it, only pulls it tighter instead of loosening it. Okay, so now, we're gonna start on our second piece. I'm gonna unwrap some more of our yarn. An interesting thing about yarn, there's a neater way to unwrap it than this. There's a way where you like, you find the end that's on the inside and then you get to just pull yarn from the inside, but I never remember to do that before I'm committed to pulling it from the outside. Okay, so now we're gonna go for our last 
our, mid, our center of our plant. So we need to leave a longer tail this time. And we're gonna make our first loop again, like so. Down. And we're ready to start again. So what do I need to do? I need to chain 14. One, two, three, four, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay. Now we're going to double crochet again in the fourth chain from the hook, like we did before. One, two, three, four. One, there's our double crochet. What's next? And we're going to do one in each stitch. So, double crochet, double, and over, through, over, single, double. People who know how to crochet may be watching this and thinking, this doesn't make any sense. How this girl is talking about crochet, how she counts things. And that's okay. That's one thing I like about crochet is how you think about it. How it makes sense to you is all that really matters. And as long as your stuff comes out like you want it, who cares if it's different from how other people think about it? That's not true if you want to write a crochet pattern. I have read some crochet patterns that I was like, I, I don't know what this means. I don't know. Do you want me to do it in the, the, the fifth thing or the fourth thing? Or what? How, how are you counting this? Counting is important in crochet. Like you don't really have to be able to do math, but you need to be able to keep kind of a running count in your head. Okay, we are almost to the end of this line. Just got a couple more to go. Do, do, do. Last one. Okay. Do, up and up. So actually when Sarah and I have talked about crochet before, she was saying that like she has made amigurumi before, which is, you know, little, little shapes and animals that you can crochet. And how you do those is basically you single crochet in a circle and you make the circle bigger or larger. I mean, big, bigger or larger. Those are the same thing. Bigger or smaller to sh shape what you're doing. And this, what I like about crochet is so your chain is how you make length. And then you can double crochet or triple or quadruple crochet. And that's what gives you height. And then there's all different ways, like how we made this wave that are just all different, just different little techniques of crochet that that you can learn when you just to go look at different patterns for stuff. Okay, I'm gonna stop rambling and actually see what I need to do next. Okay, we need to chain three. One, two, three. Turn it, and then we're gonna double crochet at the base here. If this seems familiar, that makes sense because this is a lot like what we did before. Okay, and then we're gonna, uh, let's see. We're gonna do one more right here though, which is different. Mm, two. Okay, now we're gonna do three double crochets in our next two stitches. There's one, two, 
screen. And we're going to do that one more time. And if you notice right now, we're not doing any of the front or back loop thing. I'm just going through the entire loop. That's because we don't want to create that wave right now. Right now, we're making a fan. And we're going to build our wave on top of the fan in a second. Let's see, is that one, two, three in that loop? Great. Okay. So now we're going to chain one. Now we're going to make our wave. So we're going to, every once in a while, I need to actually look at the pattern, like stop talking and look at the pattern. OK, yeah, we're going to do single crochet in this front loop twice. And like we did on the last piece, we're going to single crochet in the back loop three times. Three and go back to the front loop. Twice and back loop three times. And forward. I know there's some people who are having to do the counting and kind of keep up with where you are in a pattern. It's kind of stressful. But I've always loved working with my hands. And there's something just very comforting about once I get a pattern down, recreating it a few times and almost learning muscle memory that goes with it. And then do two more in here. Okay, and now we're going to tie this off. And I know you're thinking, wait, why did you only do that little bit? We're going to do this part three more times on here. And that way, it's kind of making separate leaves for our plants. And whenever we put the rest of the whole plant together, it makes them layer really nicely. So we're going to pull this up and tie it off. There we go. Now, again, I have to look at the pattern because it's been a little while since I did this. I did a bunch of these as like Christmas presents and stuff over the break, but it's been a few months since I've done them. Let's see what colors we're going to do next. Oh, we're getting back into like blue and purple. Okay. This is going to be so pretty, guys. Okay. Got our, our end back now. So we're going to make a loop. The loop. Okay. And what we want to do is go ahead and put our hook through here so that we can draw the loop like so. Tighten it down a little bit, but act like we're just crocheting from this from this spot, basically. So we're going to chain one, two, three, right here. And because we drew that loop up right there, it's fastened into that chain. Like it's not going anywhere. And we're going to double crochet two more times. So, and then three double crochets in our next two stitches. So 
that was the three in the middle one. One more time. Okay. See what I mean about counting? Just a lot of counting. Kind of like swimming laps at the pool. If you don't count, and you just don't know how much you've done. You end up leaving and being like, yeah, I exercised. How much did I exercise? That's a really good question. Okay, so we're going to chain one, flip it over. Now we're going to do our wave again. Okay, so we want to do front. Single crochet, single crochet, back three times. One, two, three. Front, So I've been talking to a good few students today. We've had a busier than normal reading day here in the library. And I've talked to multiple students who still just have a lot of stuff due. And I mean, I know that's how it works, but also, you know that feeling where you're like so close to freedom. That's the time that it is. But know that you all are gonna get all your last stuff done. You're gonna do all your finals. You're gonna do great on your finals. You're gonna study for your finals, study for your finals, guys. And we're gonna get through this. And then we're gonna go enjoy some sunshine with sunscreen. Be safe, sunscreen. Be safe, don't drink and drive. What else can I tell y'all not to do that will undermine what little coolness I have. I don't have a lot of coolness. Okay, so we have finished this leaf. So we're gonna tie it up. Or we're gonna cut a string, tie it off. Then, so you can start to see how our leaves are gonna layer over each other whenever we get to putting this all the way together. Okay, where's, where's my yarn end, guys? Guys, I've lost my yarn, lost my yarn. There it is, okay. So make a loop, like so. And like we did before, uh, pull a loop through this next stitch and chain three times one, two, three, and double crochet twice more in this same stitch. So anyway, y'all are going to get through finals. It's going to, y'all are going to do great. And then we all get to take a break. A much needed break. Um, I'm actually taking a couple of classes myself. And my last class of the semester, like everybody, was yesterday. And my professor at the end of the night told us, this has been a rough semester. Y'all have been fantastic in like fantastic at all times, but especially in this rough of a semester. And like her voice broke a little bit when she was saying it. And I was thinking, you, you cannot start crying. You can't because if you cry, I'm going to cry. And I have a feeling everybody else in this classroom is the same way. And if we all start crying, like that's that's not what we need tonight. But anyway, all that's to say, we have all done 
just the fact that we have gotten through this. We have all done a fabulous job. And I stand by that as the Kaylin stamp of approval because that matters so much to y'all. Anyway, okay, back to our ripple single crochet, single crochet, both in the front loop. Now three in the back loop. One, two, three. Two, three. Ooh, we're we're moving on to a, a purple now. I'm excited. It's the small things, the small things that bring joy. Now three. Two in the front, three in the back. And we're even turning a little pink. And two more here. Oh, nope, nope. Getting too excited. Too much yarning over. Snip that, tie it up. Now we're on our last leaf. See, we've still got our little, our little tail here. And I know it doesn't look like much, but it's exactly enough room for one more of these leaves. down a little. Pull it through here, like so. And again, chain three. So each of these leaves we've made exactly the same way. There we go. We're going to do that a couple more times, like we've done. Oh, see, getting too excited again. There we go. That's better. Last one. Oh, hold on. Did I count that right? Oh, nope, nope. Not enough. Not enough. We need one more in that last stitch. Double. There we go. That's better. Now, yeah. three here. One, two. I need more yarn. Free the yarn. Free the yarn. Okay. Let's see. That was just one there. We need two more. One. Double. Going over, going over. One, double. Okay. Now, for the last time, we're going to chain one, flip it over, and do the wave. Single, single in the front, three times in the back. One, two, Three and two here. And it looks like my time with you guys is going to work out perfectly. I was a little worried about it because, like I said, it's been a while since I've done this, and I was afraid that I wasn't going to be anywhere close to finished with it. And then y'all weren't gonna get to see the finished product at all, or that I was gonna get done way too early. And then just, well, actually I brought another one in case I got to, done too early, but this is gonna be perfect. Okay, gotta go 
back to the front. Two. Oh. Hold on, guys. Sorry. Oh, I sat on my foot when I sat down here and thoroughly asleep. I needed to move. Okay. One, two, three, back. Two, right here. Three. Three, just for fun, and this last stitch. I'm pretty sure I counted some wrong somewhere in there. And that's okay. Okay, last time, gonna cut and tie off. This one always entertains me a little bit because you tie off so many different and start over so many different times that it looks kind of like a monster, like a like a yarn monster. But okay, so this piece is our center. And whoa, hold on, no, I told you wrong. The first piece is our center. And what we just did is our outer layers. Do I have time? I think I do to clean this up a little bit. So what we do with all of our little ends here is that we weave them in a little bit and then cut them off. So I'm gonna take my yarn needle and thread it with the end and just pull the end back through a few different times here just to kind of neaten things up a little bit so that it doesn't look like quite so much of a creature from the depths of the ocean. Cut that. Here's our next one. Here it is. I mean, if you want yours to look like a creature from the depths of the ocean, who am I to tell you otherwise? It's just not really what I go for. But like I said before, as long as you like it, you get to do whatever you want. Okay. Cut you off. I don't know if y'all thought this earlier, but when Sarah was talking about her jar of thread scraps that she'll eventually use, if it were me, that jar would gather scraps forever. And I would never actually do anything with it. I would mean to, I would have really good intentions, but it would just never happen. And I would have a jar full of thread. And anytime somebody came to my house, they would ask, why do you have a jar full of thread? And I'd be like, because it's great decoration, obviously. If nothing else, it's a conversation piece. You asked about it, didn't you? And then they would think, I'm not sure I want to come back here. It's a lot of sass for a relatively simple question. That could be the new slogan for the UTC library. Lots of sass for simple questions. be our new thing. Okay, we actually, we need this end, so we don't wanna do anything with it, but I am gonna still do something with these. I think somebody's gonna be coming to take over for me in just a few minutes, but I'm gonna keep going for as long as I can because we're just, we're just making such good progress. Okay. Pull you through here, go through a little more. Oh, 
Voilà. One more, guys. Through here. Through more. Voila. Okay. I don't know what that's from. Oh, that's from earlier. Let's trim that a little shorter. Oh, like that little raggedy piece. Ah, goodbye. Not goodbye to you guys. Goodbye to my little raggy piece. Okay, see now you can, we can tell a lot more what this looks like now. So this is our outside. This guy. Oh, we've got one more piece we want to neaten up. Oh, I see Yuri's here. Yuri's going to be taking over for me in a minute, but we're going to take all the time that we can so that y'all can see what this looks like in the end. Not sure what Yuri's doing next. If I had, if I had our schedule up in front of me, I could tell you, but I have quite forgotten. Okay, so what we're gonna do is fold this guy in half, and then in half again, so that we have our nice little wavy center. Then we're going to wrap this around. You can start it wherever you want. We're just going to wrap it around. And around and around. And look at that. Look how beautiful it is. And so what we would do if we had time that we don't have is our very our long end that we left here we would actually use it to then sew everything together actually we do have a, another we can take enough time to at least get started so i'm gonna just stab through the whole thing. I know we've been so gentle with it so far, but we're gonna stab it. That's what we're doing now. Sometimes you just need to stab something and it's way better if it's an inanimate object, like a yarn thing, than a more living object. We don't stab living objects. It's another one of those safety tips from Kaylin. Wear sunscreen, don't drink and drive only stab inanimate objects. I don't know if you can tell that this is unscripted. This is unscripted. <laughs> this is not safety tips officially approved by the UTC library. These are Kaylin's special safety tips. So we're just keep on going like this at some different angles just to get it all nice and Nice and sewn together. Okay. And then I'm just gonna tie us a quick little knot right here. Great. Okay. And flip it back over and look at our beautiful crocheted succulent. Isn't it wonderful? I think it's wonderful. And we've already established that what I think is what matters the most about the things that I make. And it's the same for things that you make. That is the end of my time. I am going to gonna leave the document camera on so that Yuri has a good chance to get in here and get settled in. But thank you guys for your time. Good luck with the rest of finals. You're gonna do great. And come visit us at the library. Bye guys.
Hi, so I'm Yuri. Uh, earlier I was, I guess, working on um, crafting with thread, which was pretty much using enamel uh, pens with tassels at the bottom. So this time I'll be doing uh, origami cranes. And one reason why I decided to do cranes instead of anything else, um, when I was about four or five years old, my mom taught me how to fold paper cranes. And that's been ingrained into me ever since. So earlier, I don't know if you noticed, but I was having some difficulty trying to um, work on the tassels and talk at the same time. But with this, I could probably fold these with my eyes closed, though I'm not going to try that right now. All right, so if you've never worked with um, folding paper uh, or I guess origami in general, I'll go ahead and show you some of these steps. There's some super simple ones that you can do, such as creating uh, cat or dog faces. This one, the only challenging part might be when you have to open up uh, the triangle shapes. So I'll go ahead and start pressing these down. I also like pressing these down because it creates its own crease, which kind of helps you out in the long run. All right, so to fold this into a square, it's usually good to just press your thumb down in there and then start shaping that. So let me see if this looks okay without the light. Maybe it's okay, I don't know. All right, and now that that, is like that, you can start pressing that shape down. So now that also has a crease. I kind of like just jump straight into this. So hopefully <laughs> you'll enjoy this and the many cranes I may create during this last half hour. But yeah, um, my mom used to teach me a few different uh, shapes, I guess, or like different types of origami animals. She taught me how to make a frog, where if you press on the back of it, it actually hops. But I don't remember how to do that off the top of my head. And these, um, I used to fold whenever I got bored. If I had a pack of chewing gum, I would take the foil and just start folding away. This part, I always try to make sure I can get it right, because sometimes it doesn't exactly line up the way I want it to, but it looks like this will work out. And you can also kind of roll it if you realize that it's not exactly where it was supposed to line up. All right, now when you flip it over, you have to repeat that whole process all over again. So. A way that I don't know if I did on this side, I was just kind of zoned out, but you can like kind of pinch the corner and that can help as a guideline. So you can kind of see where you can easily just press in and there you go. So just make sure that the top part is going to properly fold down. All right, so now that we have our matching sides, if you ever fold these and you get lost on what to do next, the part that doesn't fold out like that will end up being the wings and this will end up being the neck and tail. When I was little, I used to like pulling um, the wing parts. I don't know if you can see, but it looks like a mouth that opens kind of, I don't know. I just thought that was cute when I was little. All right, so now that you know where the uh, neck and tail will be, you'll take one of these uh, like kind of centered corner ends and fold it inwards. Remember to press down on that too. And the same for the other side. And once that's ready, just flip and do it all over again. I don't know if this color shows up very well um, on camera, but it's a soft purple. And I like it. 
almost looks gray. All right. Then after that, you fold this out and then take your index fingers and bend it up. Close that and do the same on this side. Again, it's good to use your thumbs to help crease that. All right. So now this is the fun part where you take the wings and kind of gently just rotate that. You can also press down on the center if you want, and that can kind of help expand that. And now you just need to decide which side you want to be the tail and which to be the beak. And then you kind of take a thumb, press in. There you go. So there's number one. I'll just put that right over here. And let's go for a different color. There's a lot of different colors and some of them aren't so pretty, while others kind of hurt my eyes if I look at it for too long. So I'm not going to use that yellow. Oh, that looks so washed out on the camera. I wish it was in real life. All right, so let's see. I'll go with this right here. This is actually a bit more vibrant in person. Maybe you can see it with the light on. Maybe not. All right, well, I'll just leave it as is. And here's the next one. So I personally really like paper cranes because there's a story that goes with these. Um, Apparently, if you are able to fold a thousand paper cranes, you can get a wish granted. But it has to be within one year. And I don't remember all of the other rules and requirements for that. But I know I've seen a few people fold them and then create them into um, like not quite wind chimes, but they look really pretty when you hang them all together like that. I'd probably want to use a different type of paper though, something with really nice patterns on it. And then going to crease, kind of like the middle of the square. Do that again on this side. Press in. Sometimes it might not completely fold where you want it to go. So don't be afraid to kind of roll that paper into the right position that you need it to be in. I'm gonna move this little fella. I feel like it's been a really long time since I made these, but I'm glad that I still remember. The last time I actually got a book um, that focused on origami, it was for mythical creatures, but I don't remember if I actually <laughs> sat down and got to fold any of those. So I remember there was at least like a dragon and a unicorn and stuff like that. I know there's different ways that you can fold paper cranes as well. I just feel like this is the usual go-to uh, for that. Because I believe some of the other ones, you can pull on the wings and that'll make them move or something like that. These are very, um, I don't know, um, or, I don't want to say ornate, but it's more for decorative purposes. Not as interactive, I guess that's a better word. All right. This almost looks like post-it note type paper, which I kind of wish I did get the more pattern type. But this works and I have plenty of sheets if anyone ever decides to take up origami one day, you know, or to get your paper. I didn't mean to flick you. Sorry, little dude. 
Okay. So there's two. Let's go with a different color. Maybe something darker. All right. Hopefully everyone's having a really good end of semester. I'm glad things are kind of winding down. Oh, I used to remember how to make, I think they're called balloons, but they can't really float. It just looks like a really oddly shaped ball. I also don't think I want to make one right now because it requires you to blow air into it. And um, I want to keep my mask on. <laughs> All right. Then another kind of midpoint fold. Press in. Ooh, this one looks wonky, but we can fix that. I feel like this red shows up a bit better compared to the other two colors, but there's also a brown and a navy blue, which I wasn't really expecting to see for origami paper, but I can pick one of those next. And maybe I can find a use for these, like decorate something with them. I kind of wish I got some smaller paper because those would have taken less time and probably easier to uh, manage to make that into something cute. Right, so there's that. I feel like this part is the easiest. Just kind of fold in. All right, then almost done. Press that one a little more. Okay. So there's three. Oh yeah, brown. There we go. All right, so here's the first triangle all over again. Second, I feel like there's a similar process for making, um, I think you can make lilies like this too. And I remember a while back, I used to make chrysanthemums, but those are easier to make with um, like paper towels for some reason. And I think some people use them as like gift uh, or present. Uh, toppers, or instead of using a bow, you can use one of those too. I actually want this to be right on that point. Let's see if that fix that. All right, nice. And 
other color should I use next? Either that navy blue, or there's also a really nice light blue right here. I didn't find. Almost done with this side. And this. Oh, but other than folding a thousand to make a wish, cranes also represent different things, usually luck or health and well-being. I think sometimes they're also used for peace, but either way, I'm sure there's a list of things that they can represent. But I'm pretty sure there's also a children's book based off of that. It's a little sad from what I remember. I read that when I was like maybe 12 or 13, I think. All right. And this one's almost done. Just got to get that out of the way. There we go. That helped a lot more. Okay. Then get that beak. All right. So that's four. I feel like I'm going to forget that they're right there while I'm folding the next one and I'm going to accidentally backhand a bunch of them. All right. How many more can I fold in 10 minutes? I guess after this one, if I am done before, then I'm sure I'll be done before 10 minutes. Maybe go on with a pink one. There's also green. Choices, choices, I suppose. All right. I really would like to use these for something. I just don't know what yet after I'm done. And maybe if we ever do this again, I can make a bunch of frogs. I have a friend that does not like frogs. Um, I think it's based off of the Metal Gear Solid 3 game. I know that's a really weird reason not to like frogs, but I think there's a part in the game where you can either search for frogs or something like that. And I'm pretty sure he had some difficulty and now associates all frogs uh, with that game. I like they also incorporated um, Ape Escape into that game too. If not, um, please do not mind me rambling about the Metal Gear series. Oh, didn't realize I was so far out of that camera range. I think I'm trying not to hit any of those other cranes. I'm just trying to move further and further away from them. All right. So now with that side, I feel like this is a little too far out there. I'm gonna move that just a little. Now I'm just thinking about Metal Gear Solid. Um, the first game I played from that series was the second one. That was my first M for Mature game. Which looking back now, I guess it wasn't too, too bad. All right. 
So here is number five. Now I have a pile of them. Oh, get back in there. All right, what was next? Pink. I think I can either finish with this one or maybe one more. And then that will actually wrap up this live stream. Right. I'm trying to think of, sorry, I like keep <laughs> thinking about different video games, but I'm trying to consider some of the other ones that have cranes in them. So I'll stop talking about Metal Gear and frogs. Um, I guess Animal Crossing, because that has cranes. There's all sorts of different cranes in that. Although, okay, so in Animal Crossing, villagers are kind of also based off of like a model type, like other than personality, but the shape of a crane can also translate to a flamingo for some reason. And I think there's a flamingo maybe named Flora or something. But I thought that was interesting and a nice use of reusing the same model, just textured differently. And I know a lot has changed with that game since the last time I played it. This too. And then the other side. Yeah, this is a lot easier than trying to keep count of something while also talking. So maybe I should just always stick with origami. I can at least multitask with that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna press down a bit more to make sure everything is in place. All right, and now folding, let me try to get that back a little more in view. And then one more. Heads and tails. I say heads plural. Just one, not a hydra. All right, I'm going to just pop that right on top. And let's just go with navy to finish this out. So let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and then number seven. I'll try to make this fast because there's only three minutes left. So it might not be the prettiest one, but it will be complete. And let's go ahead and flatten that. That looks good. Get those midpoints one more time. I wonder if folded paper cranes sell on Etsy. Just saying that because some of the colors in here make me think of that site for some reason. Or at least I don't know if. I was able to show you all of the colors, but the ones that are staring back at me are like this orange. This is a bit more orange. All right. 
some of these down. The last little bit. But yeah, um, other than the relation of the color with Etsy, I also think of like wood grains um, and product photos also remind me of that as well. All right. Just a few more folds and then we are done. All right, that one was much easier to open up. Okay, so let's check out this family of cranes. So yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Hopefully you were able to relax during greeting day and enjoy the live stream as well. I'm sure everyone that participated or stuck around to view and chat had fun. It's always nice to see what other people do as far as like hobbies go or what their interests are in. But anyway, I'll go ahead and wind this down for the evening. Thank you so much for sticking around to watch. And I hope you have a great rest of your night.